The living room smelled like someone had drowned a skunk and left its corpse in a pile of gym socks. Inches from the ceiling, smoke lingered like a thick, white fog over everyone's heads. Floating in the shadows, the cloud appeared stationary and motionless. But as it passed through the purple beam of the black light mounted on the wall, it transformed, swirling and twirling into itself like a psychedelic tapestry of corkscrews and spirals. There was a horror movie called Murder Dome playing on the TV, but nobody was watching it. Instead, nearly every saggy, bloodshot eye in the room was trained on the trippy spectacle hovering in the air before them. Only Jerry's attention was elsewhere. He was kneeling at the dinged-up wooden coffee table in front of the couch, putting the finishing touches on the joint that he'd been rolling. Once it was packed tight enough, he sealed it shut, flipped the button to his mouth, and then swept the loose stems onto the floor. Anyone got a light? he asked. No one replied, and when he glanced up towards his friends, he realized just how baked everyone was. Anu, for instance, had become one with the couch. He had melted so far into its pillows that it was impossible to tell where human being ended and the sofa's cushions began. Liz, who'd been wearing the same ratty sweatsuit for the past three days, was curled up on the other side of the sofa. Her mind drifting aimlessly through a mythical world of rainbows, unicorns, and grinning kitty cats that spoke in rhymes and riddles. Jerry turned his attention to the hefty stoner that was stretched out on the recliner next. He had thought Spud was asleep, so it came as a surprise, but he managed to make eye contact with him. Before he was able to repeat the question, Spud lifted his arm a few millimeters off of his lap and extended a limp finger towards the cedar box on the table. Check the stash box, man. Jerry nodded in appreciation. He'd only been hanging out with these guys for a few weeks, but at the time he'd come to realize they were even bigger potheads than him. That was fine, though. he just moved into the city, and it was nice to make friends who shared his favorite hobby of getting really blitzed and passing out in front of the TV. He couldn't think of a more appropriate way to ring in his birthday. At midnight, he'd been entering his 28th year, and all he had to show for it was a low-level IT job working for a tech company that paid him just well enough to make rent on a crummy one-bedroom apartment. He had studied hard in school, gotten a degree, and yet when he looked himself in the mirror, all he saw was a failure, with no more prospects than the washouts he was currently hanging with. The American dream he had been promised was bullshit. The white picket fence, smiling wife, and beautiful children who looked like they were ripped straight out of a Hallmark card were lies. But Pot helped him forget all about that, which is why he spent as much time as he could baked off his ass. Jerry reached around a bong that hadn't been cleaned in weeks, grabbed the box with the words Not Weed scrawled across it in Sharpie, then rummaged around inside until he found what he was looking for. There was nothing special about the lighter at a glance. It was plastic and vaguely rectangular, with rounded edges and no distinct markings of any kind. He'd used lighters like it a million times before. They were sold at every gas station, liquor store, and supermarket checkout line in the United States. This one was white, which was a little less common than other colors, but it was still far from the first time he'd seen one in the wild. Nothing about it raised any sort of alarms, but when he gave the spark wheel a flick with his thumb... He drew in a sharp breath of disbelief. Perhaps the room's ultraviolet light was playing a trick on his eyes. Or maybe he was just really high, but for some strange reason he couldn't understand. The flame that had risen from the top of the lighter he was holding in his hand was an unfathomably deep black. There was something sinister about it. He was magnificent yet dreadful like staring into the vastness of the cosmos. And he found himself so mesmerized by it that it took a few moments to realize the flame was slowly roasting his thumb. When the pain signals finally did register in his brain, he slipped the joint between his lips and then raised the strange lighter towards his mouth. No! The shout had frozen him in his tracks. Jerry glanced towards the couch just in time to see Anush lunging across the table at him, teeth clenched and nostrils flaring. Anush slapped the lighter from his hand and tackled him to the floor, where the two wrestled, rolling over crumpled paper bags and plastic cups stamped with fast food logos, until Jerry was able to shake himself free. 
He checked the joint to see if it had been damaged in the scuffle, and let out a sigh of relief once he confirmed it was smokable, and then threw his hands in the air. What the hell, dude? But Anuj was too busy mumbling to himself while searching the floor to acknowledge Jerry's complaint. A few muffled curse words later, he let out a triumphant cry and snatched the lighter off the ground. Aha! Once he had what he was looking for, he stood up and glared at Spud. His eyes were as red as a baboon's ass. It could only open about halfway. But even so, Jerry could see a glint of panic in them. Did you put the lighter in the stash box? Anuj asked. No way, man, said Spud. I haven't seen that thing for a week. Last time I had it, I threw it over the fence in the backyard. You know what? You know that won't work, snapped Anuj. He spun around. What about you, Liz? Liz took the biggest rip from her dab ring that Jerry had ever seen, then blew a massive cloud towards the ceiling that merged like an amoeba with the one already in the air. Delicately, she placed her high-tech, battery-powered vaporizer on the floor, then turned a blank stare towards the others. I have tacos if you're picking up food, she said. Jerry placed the joint behind his ear, then to get everyone's attention, clapped his hands together as loud as he could. The, the sound caused Anush and Spud to jerk, as if a bolt of electricity had just coursed through them. Liz, on the other hand, only sunk deeper into the couch, a distant smile on her face. What the hell is the deal with the lighter? He demanded. And why did you tackle me to the ground? Jerry, tomorrow's your birthday, right? Asked Anish. How old are you turning? I'll be 28 at midnight. What the hell does that have to do with anything? There was a long moment of silence. After that, the only sound filtering into the room, coming from the movie and the television, which was playing a particularly violent scene where a man was being impaled by a cyborg with a bow tie. Finally, Spud spoke up. Holy oh, shit, he almost died, dude. You can't use a lighter, Anish said. It's cursed. Another hush now washed over the room as Jerry began to wonder just how much weed his friends had burned through before he had shown up that night. How high are you? he asked. Higher than an eagle's nutsack, said Anish. But that doesn't change the fact that this lighter is cursed. It's true, man, moaned Spud. He swiped at Anish with a lethargic wave of his hand. I should tell him if he's going to be coming over to smoke. I don't want Jerry to die. That granddaddy purple he brought with him had me seeing God. Jerry burst into a fit of laughter. The laughs were coming on so hard that his abdomen cramped up and he doubled over in pain. He grabbed his sides and rolled backward onto the rug while the others, even Liz, watched him whoop and howl on the floor. He couldn't help himself. The thought was too ridiculous. Plus, he was already stoned, so that wasn't helping the giggles pass either. After it felt like an eternity, the cramping started to subside, and once he was through the worst of it, he sat back up and wiped the tears from his eyes. You've got to be kidding me, he said. Nobody was laughing, though, and he noticed a particular aura had settled over the room ever since the lighter had made its appearance. Anuj flicked the lighter, groaned when he saw its jet-black flame emerge from the tip, then flopped himself back down to the couch. It's like this, he said to Jerry. We used to have another roommate at this house, Tommy. He was a great dude to know because he was always flush with weed. Plus, he didn't mind making food runs and people got the munchies. Is someone going to pick up tacos? Asked Liz. Tommy was good to us, said Spud, while throwing up the sign of the devil for no reason in particular. He was good to us, confirmed Anuj but not to his customers. See, he sold weed to college kids at the campus down the road. After a while, he began ripping them off. You know the game. Nug here, half gram there. At the end of the week, he'd pool it all together and have a fat smoke session in his customer's dime. Then, one day, he gets a call. Some chick who said she got his number from one of his regulars. She asked if she could buy some weed, so gives her our address, tells her to swing by. What's her name again? Asked Spud. Flamingo or chicken or something. It was Raven, you idiot. Close enough, said Spud. They had the bird thing right. Anyway, she was carrying some really bad vibes when she walks in. Everyone could feel it. Total buzzkill, you know what I mean? Jerry didn't know what Anuj meant, but he nodded his head anyway. So she wanted to smoke with us. But Tommy 
told her a little white lie, and said that we were all about to go grab some grub. Liz sat up in her chair, eyes sparkling. Is someone picking up tacos? Not now, Liz, said an Amish. Tommy handed her an eighth baggie. She kind of waited in her hands like this. He held up the lighter in front of him in his palm. She knew he was ripping her off, said Jerry. Anish shot a finger gun his way. Bingo. Got cocky. Tommy was skimping people too much. It was only a matter of time before he got called out. So what happened? He tried to apologize. Even offered her an extra gram on the house. But she wasn't having it. And that's when she got this wicked look in her eye. Threw her head back and started cackling. She pulled the lighter out of her purse. Now Anish was raising the lighter over his head as though it were a magic wand. She mumbled something in Latin, or Aramaic, I don't know, it could have been Klingon, I don't really know. Then she said, may the black flame snuff out your life. And that's when the fire started, said Spud. Fire? asked Jerry, finally intrigued. Like she unleashed demons and like hell spawns on you guys? Not quite like that, said Anish. It was more like she flicked the lighter on and kind of waved it at all of us for a few seconds. Oh said Jerry. And then she left, tossed the lighter to Tommy, walked out the door, didn't even take her weed, said Spud. But that's not the end of the story. Anish leaned forward in his chair to make sure Jerry was paying attention to this part. We all laughed her crazy ass off, but those bad vibes? Still there. You can feel them in your bones. A few minutes later, Tommy got a call from someone at the dorms looking to pick up a sack. Grabs his weed, snags a pre-roll for the road, pockets the lighter, bounces. He told us he'd be back in half an hour. We get a knock on the door late that night. When I open it up, there was a cop standing on the porch. I almost shit my pants because I hadn't ate the shrooms in my pocket. We just finished smoking a fat-ass blunt. Whoa, said Jerry. Did they arrest you? The cop wasn't there for us. He said he came to tell us Tommy had been killed in a car accident on his way to the dorms. Got T-boned at an intersection while he was lighting up. Didn't even survive the drive to the hospital. The cops gave me a garbage bag full of his stuff. There was like bloody clothes, busted CDs, a couple of magazines. They kept the weed, grumbled Spud. Fucking A they did. And last but not least, at the bottom of the bag was this white lighter. Same one that witch Raven cursed us with. He flicked it on again, and Jerry could see its black flame. Sorry your roommate died, said Jerry. That's really awful, but I don't understand why you think the lighter had anything to do with it. Have you ever heard of the 27 Club? Asked Anish. Jerry shook his head. There's a list of rock stars who all kicked the bucket at age 27, said Spud. Anish started counting names off on his fingers. Jimi Hendrix, Kurt Cobain, Amy Winehouse. Don Henley, said Spud. Don Henley's not dead, you idiot, grunted Anish. But here's the thing. All the celebrities of the 27 Club, they were reported to have used a white lighter shortly before their untimely demise. Tommy was 27, and so was everyone in this room. This raven chick heard the rumor, too, and decided to mess with you. <laughs> Left Jerry. That's what we thought, but check it out. Anna's reached for a High Times magazine, sitting on the table, and began flipping through the pages. Once he found what he was looking for, he folded the magazine back and pointed to a picture in an article about Jim Morrison. In the photo, Morrison was leaving a nightclub. On his arm was a pretty woman with black hair and a fair complexion. That's her, said Anna. That's Raven. That's the witch that cursed us. Jim Morrison died a few weeks after this picture was taken. There was a white lighter in the room with him when he passed. Guess how old he was. Jerry studied the picture. You're saying the woman who came to buy weed from you is really a... 70-year-old witch that killed Jim Morrison? She's easily over 100. The first member of the 27 Club was the blues musician Robert Johnson. He died in 1938. There aren't any photos of them together, but there are photos of her with other members. We googled all night, found her linked to a ton of people on that list. 
our guess is she's personally responsible for the deaths of every member of the 27 Club, and she used this white lighter to kill them. Why would a witch who kills celebrities waste her time on you guys? Because she's a bitch, shouted Anish. She probably curses anyone with that lighter who pisses her off. Who knows how many 27-year-olds have croaked after using it? We just hear about the famous ones. The weed's making you guys paranoid, said Jerry. Think about what you're saying. Your roommate dies. You fall down some conspiracy rabbit hole? Tommy wasn't the only one who died, said Spud. Anish smirked. Then he continued his story. About two weeks later, we're at the Get Rip Music Festival when we meet up with Spud's old college buddies from before he dropped out. These guys were absolutely tripping by the time he caught up with them. X, Coke, Ketamine, you name it. One of them, this guy named uh, Bruce, he pulls out a blunt, asks for a light, so Spud does what any self-respecting, courteous dude would do. Reaches into his fanny pack for some fire, lights that mother up. It was only after Bruce's blunt had a solid cherry going that any of us noticed Spud used the white lighter. In my defense, man, I had taken a ton of edibles, said Spud. Nobody else packed the lighter either. I know because I double-checked this fanny pack when we got to the festival. It wasn't in there. But somehow, Spud had let this dude swisher with it. So he's chiefing. We're all kind of just sitting around nervously waiting for something to happen. Thought he was going to get hit by a... I thought he was going to get hit by a car, said Spud. Anuj let out a disappointed sigh. We were at a music festival. How, how, how the hell was he going to get hit by a car? What actually happened is this. About halfway through his blunt, Bruce starts rubbing his temples and complaining about his vision going blurry, right? So it first seems like he's just having a bad trip, but then his face turns purple. We know something's wrong when he falls to the ground and starts foaming at the mouth. He was unconscious by the time the paramedic showed up. They spent a half hour trying to revive him, but eventually they just pronounced him dead. They said he had a seizure. At the ripe old age of 27. But there's no doubt. The lighter had killed him. Killed my high too, man, said Spud. Jerry shook his head. That guy was rolling on Molly and Coke and who knows what else. His body probably couldn't handle everything he was putting in it. But he only died after using the lighter, protested Anush. If it's so dangerous, why don't you just get rid of it? We tried, said Spud. But it keeps coming back. Think we'd just leave that thing in the stash box for you to find? It's true, said Anish. A few nights after the festival, we decided to drive up into the hills to scatter Tommy's ashes, get rid of the lighter. Uh, kill two birds with one stone kind of thing. There's this scenic overlook that we all used to smoke at. You know, should get high up there sometime. Majestic as fuck. Well, there's a cliff that drops straight down. You can see the whole valley from up there. Really makes you contemplate how insignificant we all are in the world. Does anyone want to go pick up tacos? Said Liz. When we got there, we emptied Tommy's urn over the ledge. Then I chucked the lighter as hard as I could. And that sucker must have sailed 200 feet before we lost track of it in the darkness. Afterwards, we got back to the car, decided to roll up. And guess what was waiting for us in the glove box? Jerry shrugged. Maybe it was a different white lighter. Or maybe it's cursed, man, said Spud. If you're so afraid of using it accidentally, then why don't you just pull down the fork until it runs out of fuel? You don't think we tried that too? Anish held up a bandaged thumb. It doesn't run out. Which would be hella convenient if it wasn't for the whole kill you if you use it thing, said Spud. And it will kill you, replied Anish. Remember what happened to Polly? Liz was with her at the vape shop when she used it. He turned to Liz, waiting for her to begin the story, but she was too enthralled with what was happening on the TV to notice. I want to pooch you, she said. You look so soft and snuggly. She took another rip from her dab ring and again blew out an impossibly big cloud, then sunk back into her chair and closed her eyes. Within seconds, she was snoring. Liz was getting off her shift at the vape shop when her co-worker Polly walked in with a gram of Northern Lights. 
said Anuj. Once it was clear, Liz wasn't waking up anytime soon. It's kind of slow, and she was trying to get lifted before work, but she didn't have anything to smoke it with. Luckily, Liz had her pipe with her. So she told Polly to snag it off the counter when she locked up and to meet her on the back. By the time she caught up with her, Polly was already puffing away. She passed it off to Liz to take a hit, and that's when she noticed Polly had been using the white lighter. When she asked where she'd gotten it, Polly told her it was next to the pipe. So what happened? Asked Jerry. Did she drop dead in the parking lot like that other guy? She got shot, man, said Spud. Yep, said Anish. It was a closing shift. Ten minutes before she was about to shut down, some crackhead came in for a smash and grab. But he was strapped. Plugged her four times before cleaning out the register. Poor girl was only 27 years old. Christ! Why? I don't know. Anu shrugged. Because he was a paranoid tweaker? Also because of the white lighter, said Spud. Oh yeah, because of that too. Hang on, said Jerry. It's a wild story, but it it's hardly evidence. Your roommate got into a car accident, which is pretty common. The dude at the festival had how many drugs in his system before his brain spazzed out? Six, said Spud. From my count, at least. And as far as Liz's co-worker goes, that's a really tragic, but sometimes stuff like that happens, especially when you work in seedy vape shops in the wrong side of town. Whatever, dude, grinned Anish. He slipped the lighter into his sweatpants. You don't have to believe us, but I did save your ass earlier. Jerry nodded his head. You know, there is one solution to your white lighter problem, he said. You guys could quit smoking. Fuck that, man, said Spud. I'd rather that witch set me on fire. Spud and I are going to pick up some food. You want to roll with us? Anish asked. Jerry checked his phone and saw it was already 11.55 p.m. No thanks. I think I'm going to smoke this joint and go home. I got work in the morning. I'll probably be gone by the time you guys get back. Anish and Spud lumbered out of their seats and made their way towards the door. Well, if I don't see you tomorrow, have a happy birthday, said Anish, and lock the door on your way out. Jerry got up off the floor and made himself comfortable on the couch. Hey, Liz, he said. Want to smoke? Her only reply was a snore. And when he looked over at her, he could see that she was still fast asleep. He rifled through the stash box again, searching for something to light his joint with, found a purple lighter with a dragon and a yin-yang on it, flicked the switch then grumbled when all that came out were sparks. Son of a bitch is dead. He searched the table next, fumbling with magazines, peeking in fast food bags, hoping to uncover a hidden matchbook, Zippo, anything to light his joint with. But he couldn't find a thing. There had to be another working lighter laying around the room somewhere. He checked the couch, sliding his hand between the pillows, blindly hunting for a lighter that might have gotten lost in the deep, dark void beneath the sofa cushions. Finally, his fingers brushed up against a familiar, rectangular shape, and he let out a celebratory fuck yeah. He pulled it free and chuckled once he realized what he was holding. In his hand was the white lighter. It must have slipped out of Anish's pocket when he got up to leave. Either that, or... No, said Jerry to himself. The stupid lighter isn't cursed. He checked his phone again and saw that it was already past midnight. Happy birthday to me, he thought. Even if the lighter was cursed, it wouldn't matter anyway. He'd been 28 for a whole three minutes. Jerry flicked it on and watched the pitch black spire rise once again from the top of it. He had to admit it was pretty cool. He thought it would make a great conversation piece if he pulled it out to use at a party. Maybe he would keep it. It's not like his friends wanted anything to do with it. They'd probably be happy if he took it off their hands. He brought the fire to the end of his joint, paused one last time to admire the mysterious flame, and then he lit it up. Smoke filled his lungs, followed soon after by a burn so intense his whole chest felt like it was on fire. A cough rose up from his throat, and then another, and within seconds he was hacking so hard his eyes had started to water. His body convulsed, his face twisted into a painful scowl. The granddaddy purple was some chronic stuff. But Jerry hadn't choked this hard on a joint since he was 15 years old. 
Once he was finally through the worst of it, he threw himself back in his seat and took in a few frenzied gasps for air. Jerry gazed up at the cloudy haze still hovering over the room and decided he was way too high to operate a vehicle anytime soon. The smoke wasn't just dancing in the black light. It appeared to be condensing, forming itself into a shape in the middle of the living room that was looking more and more like a figure of a human. This is weird, he groaned to himself. Moments later, that smoky figure resembled a fully formed woman. She looked like a ghost, her body and face was transparent, but Jerry could still make out enough details to realize she was staring at the woman from the magazine that Anush had shown him. She sneered at him with a venomous hatred in her eyes. You're not real, Jerry said. I'm just really stoned. His heart was beating like a drum and he could feel cold beads of sweat running down the back of his neck. In his hand, he was clutching the white lighter so tight his fingers were tingling. Jerry glanced over to Liz, hoping she'd woken up, but she was still snoring away. He turned back to the smoky apparition, praying that she'd be gone, only to let out a tiny yelp of panic. And he saw that not only was she still there, but she was gliding through the air towards him. In a desperate attempt to fight back, he cocked his arm and flung the lighter at the witch. It flew through the air, passing right through the woman's chest, then clinking against the TV screen and fell to the floor. The witch was right in front of him now, her sneer even more warped and twisted than before. She reached a hand towards his face. He swiped at it a couple of times in a last-ditch effort to protect himself, causing her arm to disperse in a tuft of smoke only for it to reform in short order an inch ever closer towards him. But it's my birthday, he squealed. I'm not 27 anymore. The witch pulled back. The hatred in her eyes replaced with a look of confusion. They stared at each other in awkward silence for a second before she opened her mouth to speak. The words rolled off her lips like a discordant melody plucked from the chords of a harp in the fiery pits of hell. Wait. You thought the curse only worked on 27-year-olds? What kind of stoner logic is that? It was in that moment Jerry realized that his friends were idiots. He tried to plead for mercy, but as soon as he opened his mouth, her smoky form rushed into it. She poured down his esophagus up through his nostrils, forcing him to gag and choke even worse than last time. His throat screamed with pain. It felt as if there were fingernails scratching at the inside of it. Once more, he found himself desperate to take in oxygen. Jerry writhed in his seat as the witch forced her entire essence inside of him. He punched and kicked in the air, doing everything he could to rid himself of the smoky woman. But the more he struggled, the heavier his limbs got, and the more his lungs felt like they were just going to explode into his chest. How long had it been since he had taken a breath? Seconds? Minutes? Each horrible, agonizing moment seemed to stretch on endlessly. Before long, his vision began to fade, and his thoughts started to turn from desperation to hopeless acceptance. He threw his head back in his chair and allowed the pain to take him, as his heart beat for the last time. Smoke trickled from the mouth and nose of Jerry's corpse and floated back up towards the ceiling of the living room. The house was silent again, save for the sounds of the movie still playing on the television. Liz's eyes fluttered open. She yawned as she stretched in her seat like a cat. The first thing she noticed was that Spud and Anuj were gone. The second thing she noticed was that there was something very wrong with Jerry. He wasn't moving despite his eyes being wide open, a panic-stricken look of terror frozen on his face. Jerry didn't react when she nudged him with her foot, so she kicked him harder, causing him to slump over onto the corner of the sofa. It didn't take long to realize what had happened once she spotted the half-smoked joint on the table and the white lighter on the ground in front of the television. Slowly, Liz reached for her phone, searched for Anuj and her contacts, then typed out a text, taking great care that he understood exactly what she was trying to tell him. Hey... If you're out, can you pick me up some tacos?
Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Kavi Pasta, and before we get started on tonight's video, I'm going to let you know about tonight's author. Dr. Plague, or Erucius, has a book available now on Amazon. This is actually the fifth compilation of short stories that they have available on Amazon, and I'll have a link to all five of them in the description down below. If you guys love horror stories, or if you've loved any of the stories you've heard from Erucius before, I strongly suggest you check these out. You don't want to miss out on any of the really good ones I haven't had the chance to put in here yet. And speaking of stories from Erucius, on to tonight's story. I heard he was mute, and the clapping is how he communicates. I heard he's a ghost. The clapping is how he gets your attention. I heard you were both big old babies who would believe in anything. Daryl and Gary looked up incredulously at me as I grinned back at them from across the lunch table. Oh yeah, well, he's been linked to the disappearance of like four kids now, so it sounds like a pretty good reason to be afraid of him, Daryl said, sounding mad. I just shrugged at him, clapping a french fry in my mouth and savoring the salt. There's no proof that this clapping man is responsible for a candy bar going missing at Dell's, let alone Mickey Frazier getting snatched. The clapping man story was something that had been circulating for a while. Three younger kids had gone missing first, all of them heading home from somewhere or another, and some of the witnesses had reported hearing a clapping sound before they had gone missing. One of them had even reported seeing a man-sized shape in the woods before hearing the clap. They didn't have any details about the guy, but they said that it looked like a person's shadow with long arms. Mickey had been the most recent disappearance, and the one that made the cops around Tiger the most nervous. The first three had been younger kids, elementary school kids, who hadn't looked like much, but Mickey had been a 17-year-old farm kid who was built like a linebacker. The story was that he was trying to find one of his dad's missing sheep around dusk, and he had just never come back. The stories were that he was near a Kindle-covered bridge, and that the sheep had been found dead underneath it the next day. There were the usual rumors that Mickey had run off or left to be with a girl, left to be with a boy for all they knew. But those of us who had known Mickey kind of doubted it. Mickey was slow. I mean, not like special ed slow, but he was slower than average. He loved his family. He loved working on his parents' farm. And the thought that he would just run off when he couldn't come back with his sheep was laughable. Mickey liked football, too, but if his dad had asked, he'd have given it up in a heartbeat. The cops knew this, too, and that's why they were so sure that Mickey had been taken by someone, and, and that someone had to be big. The bell rang, and we kept our seats as the good little sheep dispersed around us. We'd leave when the monitor finally told us that we had to, not a minute before. Gary still looked a little nervous as the cafeteria cleared out, but Daryl was pretty used to this. Daryl and me had been hellion since we were young. But it was a life that Gary was slowly getting used to. I'm not a bad kid. I mean, not really. I loved my mama. I respected my dad. I kept my truck well maintained, and I'm good to my girl when I have one. Now, that being said, I have no time for weakness or rules. The only rule I know is that the strong rule, and it's a rule that I learned from my dad. If I'm strong, and I am, I should be able to do what I want. If other kids don't understand that, well, that's their problem. Just like when I push them down and show them who's boss. Daryl, Gary, and me never really considered ourselves a gang or anything, but... We pal around because we all believe that when you're strong, you're right. Mrs. Gladdy looked our way, and I grinned at her as I waved. Mrs. Gladdy's cute, and she ain't strong. She teaches home ec, and she drives a spark. Nothing about that says strong. She'd come over before and tried to talk nice to us to get us back on the straight and narrow, but I mean, never did any good. Eventually, she stopped trying, and when she turned and called to Mr. Gersh, the shop teacher, we took our feet off the table and started heading to class. Now, Gersh was strong. An eight-year combat vet with scars to prove it. But he was not to be messed with. We were halfway to class when the bell rang from the start of fifth period, and I looked at the boys and told them I thought maybe we should take the rest of the day off. I gotta get to math, Gary said. If I don't keep at least a C, they'll kick me off the football team. Same, Daryl said with a sigh. If I don't pass that history test today, my mom says I can't run the roads this weekend. 
Come on, man. Just come to class with us. The beers will still be there after school. I blew a big old raspberry at them and told them if they wanted to be pansies, then I'd go drink it all up before they got there. They begged me not to go, but I was done for the day. School had never really held any appeal for me. I already figured I'd drop out at the end of the year, go into hauling lumber like my uncle, or into farming like my dad. I was too dumb for the army, too lazy for college, but at least I figured it out a year before anyone else did. Have fun with math class then, I said, waving as I walked to the parking lot to get to my truck. The little Ford Ranger that dad had given me wasn't much, but it was fine for now. I really wanted to get one of those big F-350s like my uncle had, but I'd either have to save up a bunch of money or steal one to have something that nice. The Ranger was fine for now, and I slunk out of the lot in low gear before turning and flying up the road for home. The dirt roads of Tiger were like a second home to me. I put the schoolhouse behind me. I thought again about just leaving in one of them for parts unknown. And what was there really here for me? A dead-end job and a nagging wife? Squalling kids and a mortgage I couldn't pay? A bottle of beer after work with the boys? A loveless marriage that would hang like a shackle around my neck? Maybe a trip to Stragview if I wasn't careful. Or a telephone pole in the night if I had one too many beers. I didn't like to think too much about the future then preferring to live in the moment. And this particular moment was about to contain a 12-pack of beer. I pulled in behind the barn so that Dad wouldn't see me if he came home early. Dad was at the farmer's market till around four selling his wares, and I figured he wouldn't be the wiser of me cutting school. I walked off into the field of peanuts, this year's crop, and into the woods beyond. I had been exploring the woods before I was potty trained. The spot I knew of was about a mile back in an old tangle of trees. Daryl and me had found it when we were still small enough to squeeze between the roots of the snacky trees and make a clubhouse down there. And it now served as a spot for us to drink and smoke and bring girls for a little privacy. The forest was familiar, an old friend that protected me sometimes when Dad had a little too much to drink. And before I knew it, I could see the old grove of trees in the distance. Most of the forest was thick old oaks and some scraggly little pup trees. But the grove was different. It was old. It felt ancient, somehow. And being there made me feel peaceful, like nothing could hurt me while I was there. I got to the snacky trees and took a seat on the comfy old roots that stuck above ground. Reaching into the gnarled old root system and pulling out the 12-pack of Budweiser, I cracked the first can and drank it quickly, smacking my lips as the crisp taste filled my stomach. This was the good life right here, but I knew it wouldn't last forever. I'd have to trade this kind of carefree time for adulthood soon enough, and the thought of saying goodbye to the snaky tree grove was a little sad. I opened the second one, drinking it slower this time, and the wind rustled the leaves around me. I felt a yawn creeping up my throat. Dad and me had been splitting wood before school today, and the early morning and the lukewarm beer was starting to make me groggy. As the second one disappeared and the third one popped open, I got comfy and watched the dragonflies and little forest animals frolic in the bow of the trees. I felt at ease, like you know, I was floating. When the beer can slipped out of my hand and fell into the nest of roots, I was snoring before it dumped its delicious contents on the ground. When I woke up, it was dark. The sound of birds and squirrels had been replaced with insects and scamper of bats. This didn't immediately put me off. I had been in the woods at night before. Daryl and me had camped out tons of times. I had even slept rough a time or two if Mom and Dad were fighting. I pulled myself out of the tangle of roots and wobbled a little before getting my bearings. I wasn't drunk, not by a long shot, or hungover. I had taken a long nap in the woods, and now it was time to get home and face the music. School would have called by now and told them I left early. Dad would be looking for me during evening chores, and not found me. These things would have culminated in him having a drink as he waited for me as I was likely in for a bad time. I walked out of the grove, watching my step as I went. And that was when I first heard it. A loud pop sound that made me freeze in place and listen like a spooked deer. 
I stopped for a count of five, waiting for it to come again so I could identify it, but all I heard was the quiet sounds of the evening woods. I started walking again, but after five more steps, I heard the loud pop again. I thought that it might be a tree branch cracking at first, but now it sounded more like... like something familiar. It wasn't a natural sound, not like a branch breaking or or rocks bumping as they fell. It was a sound I hadn't really heard out here before. Uh, A sound I was familiar with, but seemed alien out here. It sounded like... Like someone bringing their hands together for a single hard clap. I kept walking towards the house, thinking I was hearing things, but the longer I went, the more I heard the clapping sound. It was infrequent. Always that one loud pop, and when I looked, there was nothing I could find that would have made it. The longer I walked, the more freaked out I got at the popping. I found myself looking for a man's shape in the woods, thinking about what the kids had told the cops. It was big, like someone's shadow standing in the woods. Its arms were longer than usual, and they had heard a loud clapping sound before their friends had disappeared. I stopped again. It had been closer this time. It sounded like it was about 20 feet away, and the clap had had silenced a bunch of the forest creatures that had been buzzing placidly. I wanted to run, but I I made myself walk so I didn't trip in a hole or uh, knock myself unconscious on a low-hanging branch. There was also the fact that these were my woods. I mean, nothing bad could happen to me in my woods. No one could hurt me. No one would would dare to. Now it was closer. Ten feet or better. It was following me, and I was still a half mile from home. I wondered how far it would let me get before it snatched me. Would they find any evidence that I had been alive? Would they ever find anything? I quickened my pace. Holes be damned, I I needed to go. I needed to get out of here. I needed to be behind my door with a a lock thrown and the bolt pushed in. I'd hug my dad, I'd tell him I was sorry, I'd take whatever punishment came, but I needed to know that the monster or freak or whatever was outside and couldn't get me. I ducked a branch that I saw as a vague outline and I kept moving. The popping had stopped for now, but I knew that I wasn't safe. I had to get home. I had to get home. I had to get... I turned my head in the direction of the sound. And there he was. He was man-shaped, that was for sure. He looked like a bulky man, his arms and legs just thick outlines in the murk. I couldn't see his eyes, but I could feel them on me. He didn't make a sound, but the longer I stayed still... The more I began to hear a low murmur like a TV show trying to break through the static, I thought that he might be frozen by my stare, but but as I watched, he raised his hands slowly and brought them together with a single hard clap. I took off like a shot. I ran and I ran and I ran as the popping followed me. I expected that every step would be my last. A claw would come out or a set of teeth would clamp down on me and I'd be dragged away to whatever served as its den for digestion or or God knows what else. The popping started coming from directly behind me and I could almost feel the air off those massive hands. I could see lights coming up into view ahead and I I thought maybe I had gotten turned around and I'd I'd find a highway. I didn't care. I just wanted, wanted someone to help me escape this creature and I wasn't choosy as to about who. I broke through the tree line to discover that I'd come out on the edge of my parents' farm, and the lights were flashlights as people looked for me. They were calling my name as they got closer to the woods, and I tore off towards the fields in an attempt to stop them from entering. One of them could have just as easily been that thing's next meal, and I wasn't about to draw them to it. I found Dad first, and his beam turned to fix me, and he wrapped me in a hug as he recognized me. God damn, boy, I was so scared that he'd been took. He hugged me close. The first time I'd ever seen my dad show that kind of emotion. And when he called out to them, he he found me. I I saw them all start to head to his location. 
The police came. They, they talked to me. I don't know if they took me seriously or not, but told people to stay out of the woods for a while and to listen for clapping if they were alone. Nikki was the last kid to go missing in the tiger that year. And when the clapping had come back after that, he seemed better prepared for it. That experience changed me. And I'm glad to say it was for the better. I started taking my schooling a little more seriously. I stopped being so impetuous. I started helping people instead of taking. Changed my way of thinking a lot. I still believe that strong people are important, but now I believe that they have a responsibility to keep those who aren't strong safe. I started volunteering to go out on woodland rescues, searching for people who'd gotten lost or looking for remains. I got approached by the park service to see if I wanted to work with them. Now I help educate people so they don't get lost, and I help find those who go missing. In a way, I guess I owe the clapping man a debt. He saved me that night from becoming a monster, too. Although, I really doubt that was his intention. Step bro, can you help me? The words woke me from my nap like a slap to the face. I sat up in confusion, groggily wiping the sleep from my eyes as I looked around the dim room. The door to my bedroom was open and the portentous light of the hallway loomed in the distance. While my mind scattered to recollect what was going on, I felt on my phone in hope of clarity. The screen was blinding. No missed calls, no texts, nothing. Only a little caution sign in the upper right corner near the battery. No service. Hello? I called, swinging out of bed. I was shocked that I was hearing anything at all. I'm usually a really heavy sleeper. The house felt empty, Abandoned, even. A feeling I was still getting used to in the new house. My mother had recently remarried after over a decade of being single. The man had money, the kind where your house echoes because there's not enough furniture or bodies to fill the space. The only thing stranger than your mom shacking up with someone 15 years older than her is a house sitting their empty home on spring break. Lisa! I called once more and got nothing but silence. Lisa's my stepsister, whereas I had volunteered to sit out their ravishing vacation in exchange to catch up on Elden Ring and jerk off in peace, Lisa had skipped to go wild while Dad was away. Our dorms were closed for the holiday, making each other annoyed acquaintances for the week. We're both in our early twenties and single, and we don't care much for each other. I remembered laying down for a nap in preparation of pulling an all-nighter while Lisa waited for her ride, dressed in an outfit her father would shriek at. She said she'd be back late, and it was only 9 p.m. Hello? My voice echoed again. Standing in the doorway, the house was especially dark. Every light was off, the only residual glow coming from a single doorway downstairs. The laundry room. Step bro, can you help me? A voice beckoned from downstairs, making me jump. It was faint, but just loud enough to hear. It sounded like Lisa, but it sounded... muffled. I sighed, already irritated. Lisa, what are you doing? I thought you were out! I called, heading down the hall. I flipped every switch as I went, trying to bring in as much light as I could. The place was creepy in the dark. I came home to change, she slurred like she'd been drinking, and I got stuck. Down the stairs past the framed doctorates and awards. Stuck in what? I asked on the stairs, awaiting the reply. There was a moan of silence, like she was thinking about it. The wash... washing machine. Can you help me? She answered pitifully. She had to be fucking with me. Are you fucking with me? I asked, scoffing. The implication of the situation was not lost on me. No, I'm not. Look, I got sick and threw up, step bro. Like a lot. I couldn't keep enough down. I tried to get some clothes out of the change and I got stuck, all right? Now will you help me out or not, please? I looked at the bright doorway of the laundry room. The tiles, stark white and pristine. Something felt wrong, like, 
I was being set up. I thought maybe it was some kind of prank, like a TikTok trend, you know? I considered just leaving her there. I mean, she was a bit of a brat, and she'd been nothing but unpleasant since the recent marriage. Just about to turn and go back to my room when she started to scream, Step bro, help me out of this fucking thing, or I'll call the police and my father, and then you'll- All right, all right, jeez. I'm coming. Settle down, will you? Stop calling me that. I sighed and hurried down the stairs, shuffling to the laundry room. Lisa cleared her throat like she was choking back vomit before muttering a muffled apology. Thank you. The voice was deeper and cracking towards the end. God, how much did you drink? It's still early. I muttered, stopping when I rounded the corner to the laundry room. The sight before me was... Ridiculous. The laundry room was so bright it was blinding. Overhead, fluorescence beaming above the clean floor and matching set of machines. The dryer and washer were next to each other, with a linen closet on the other end. Hanging out of the expensive front-load washing machine was Lisa, only her lower half visual. It was like she had tried to climb in and fallen asleep. Not only was she not stuck, she wasn't moving at all. Lisa? I asked, looking at her. The room was so quiet, it was unsettling. I expected vomit, spilled purse, something, but it was just Lisa in the washer, her hands tucked inside like she was using them as a pillow. She was wearing the same outfit she had gone out in, a striped bodycon dress so tight you could see her panty lines and platform heels. One of the heels was missing, leaving a single set of painted toes laying against the tile. L Lisa, are you all right? I asked from the doorway, not wanting to go in. Help me, step bro, I'm stuck, she said, her voice whinier than usual. B Bullshit, you're not stuck, you're just laying in there. What is this, a, a joke? I asked, looking around the room for her phone, for the setup. But there was nothing but white, no cameras, no one hiding around the corner recording. No, please, I really need help, I swear. Lisa started to sob, her voice breaking to the point of babbling. Help me, step bro, please. Except she wasn't moving. Not even a little it didn't even look like she was breathing. But the inside of the washing machine was dark, and I could only see the faint outlines of the back of her head. Her bob, haircut, tossed and completely still. What's happening? It was all I could ask. The hair stood on the back of my neck. My palms sweating. The way she just hunched in there, not even kicking her feet. The same recited lines repeated again. Help me, step bro. Even as she laid face down, she looked pale, sickly, and, and the harder I looked, the more it looked like her face was submersed up to her ears and what looked like, help me, blood. It felt like I wanted to puke. I reached to my pocket for my phone, a cold sweat beating on my forehead as I cleared my throat. Lisa? Yes. What's my name? I pulled up my phone and unlocked it, bringing up the keypad. W what? What do you mean, step? She started, her voice starting to break character. No service. I wouldn't do that if I were you. Lisa's voice was deep and struggling, like she had a wet rag over her mouth. Her skinny arms reached to the mouth of the washer and started to pull herself out, and I could hear a trickling of liquid from the matted strands of her hair. She pulled her head from the washer, and with it a splash of deep red that washed over the tile. Her face was gone. Oh, God. Lisa's devastated cavity of a face coughed, a sputter of blood painting the wall next to her. She reached for me with mangled hands, each digit broken in different directions. She tried to stand with her bare foot and slipped. I left her there. I left her there. I ran as fast as I could, bounding up the steps to the sounds of her trying to get up on the slippery tile. A guttural moan echoed after me, an angry call that chilled my bones. The lights flickered at the sound, blinking erratically until the noise 
stopped. Back down the hall and into my bedroom, I slammed the door behind me and locked it, frantically looking around somewhere to hide. I could hear them coming. One bare foot, followed by the heel. It was clumsy, but it was gaining fast. I considered hiding under the bed, but it was too low to the ground. I didn't know if I'd fit. I didn't want to get stuck myself. Lisa slammed into the door, and the hinges rattled. It wasn't going to hold for long. I, I didn't have enough time. The closet was my only chance. I opened the door as quickly as I could and ducked into the clothes, pulling it behind me before huddling under them in a ball. As soon as I sat on the carpet, I heard a squelch, like I had sat in something. As a cold, wet substance soaked into the seat of my pants, the door to my bedroom exploded. Wood splintered inward, and I, I watched through the slats of the closet door as Lisa slithered in. She wormed her way through the hole in the door, the bleeding crater in her face reverberating angrily as her head whipped around. She flopped on the bed first, and when she couldn't find me, she slithered underneath it. I watched in horror as she would temporarily pause after every movement to sniff the air, her head twitching as she knocked things over in my room in the process. Step, bro. The monster gurgled slowly, moving impossibly as it blindly scoured the room. It twisted so far I heard ribs break, and when it propped itself up with its hands, the flesh would tear, exposing bones. Wrists cracked, knees twisted, and tendons tore. With an angry shriek, the monster slithered out of my room. I heard it rampaging through the house and into my mom's room, and then into Lisa's when it couldn't find me. And when it had no luck, I heard it moving downstairs, and I listened to its path of destruction as it tried to find me. When it got quiet for a while, I chanced to look at my phone to see what I was sitting in. As soon as the light went on, I had to resist the urge to scream, holding my breath and nearly pissing myself when I finally saw it was soaking into my clothes. The carpet was caked in blood. A splotch of heavy crimson that had sprayed outward and onto my clothes. Inches away from where I sat was a single high-heeled shoe. A blood-stained phone. Lisa's. I wiped the blood from her phone and unlocked it to see the same sickening icon of no service. I tried calling 911 with both her phone and mine. The call just wouldn't go through, even when you hit emergency service. I tried to check her recents, see if I could find any answers to what was going on. Her call logs showed several incomplete calls. Five to the police, four to her father, seven to me. None of them were able to connect. I checked her texts. The last one that went through was outgoing. A response to contact labeled only as him. It said, still picking you up? I want to get up in some guts. To which she replied with a thumbs up emoji. I don't know who him is, but it's not the part that unsettles me the most. It's the nine failed texts that she sent to me that never made it through while I was five feet away sleeping. Kyle, wake up. My Tinder date followed me home. I'm hiding in your closet. Kyle, what the fuck? He's in here. I don't have service. I tried to wake you up. I think he can hear me. I don't want him to find me. Kyle, wake the fuck up! Kyle! I've been in here for a while now. My phone's about to die. I don't know what it is, but it's still down there. I would have tried to sneak past it, but it hears everything. I even had to mute my keyboard on my phone so I could type this out. I, I tried calling my mom, the police, my stepdad. Nothing will go through. It just says that I don't have signal. I thought of jumping out the window, but I think it'll get me before I can get out. It's gotten faster the more of Lisa it leaves behind. Last I heard, it was moving things around and stacking them like it's, like it's trying to keep me from getting out. I'm going to try to post this somewhere and see if I can get enough signal for it to go through. If you get this, please, send help. And if you get in here, do not help her 
out of the washing machine. Lisa, I'm sorry. I think I might try the window after all. Hey there, kids. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I'm coming in to check in on you. It's the middle of the Halloween Horror Countdown, and I hope all of you are doing well. I hope all of you are enjoying your time here on the channel or on the podcast. I still have many more days of the countdown before we get to the big night of Halloween, and I hope you all enjoy what I have in store. I want to give you guys a few reminders. There's always HorrorCon that's happening October 28th and 29th. And of course, on this channel, we have big stuff planned for you on Halloween night. So just because the countdown ends does not mean that Halloween activities come to a pause. Also, before we get started on tonight's story, I'm going to let you know about tonight's sponsor. That's right, the sponsor for the Halloween Horror Countdown this year is, once again, everyone's favorite mobile game. Hey, let's do a little word association. I say the word mobile, and what's the first thing that comes to your head? Interesting, interesting. And how about RPG? Okay, not what I'd have gone with, but sure. Here's a tough one, though. Raid? Did you say Shadow Legends? Well, so did I. Great minds think alike. Seeing as you've got it on your mind already, let's talk a little bit about Raid Shadow Legends, the amazing mobile collection RPG. So one of the toughest new bosses in Raid is a Hydra, which I don't know if you guys are aware, but my cats are actually named after, like, Hercules and Hylas, so seeing a Hydra in a video game, oh, sells it to me. This Hydra, of course, has multiple different heads, and each one is a complete boss battle all on its own. Sounds crazy, so let's see what we're up against. There's the Head of Blight. The Head of Blight's a nasty one. It loves poison. It poisons your team, it leeches your team, it protects its own. The Head of Blight can create a poison cloud, which makes it hard for your team to land their attacks against the Hydra entirely, and this can absolutely ruin your fight. Rather than landing big, meaty attacks, you'll be landing weak hits and missing your debuffs. You'll want to take this guy out before he shuts down your entire team, but luckily, he's super weak to fire, so bring this head with an HP burn champion. This October, be prepared for a scare with Raid. There'll be treats and tricks this Halloween for those who brave the Raveyard. Simply download Raid Shadow Legends using the links below, copy your in-game player ID, and then venture over to raidyard.plarium.com for October 15th to November 10th. Enter your player ID, gather your courage, then venture into the haunted graveyard. Grab a shovel, pick a grave, start digging, as you'll be in with a chance to dig up some amazing in-game items and even real-life prizes, ranging from epic and legendary Halloween-themed raid champions to Amazon gift cards with a total value of $20,000. If you're an existing raid player, you can still get involved in this Halloween spooktacular. Head to raidyard.polarium.com and you'll find a special promo code that everyone can use to earn a small gift in-game. Consider it our Halloween treat to you. But hey, that's okay. With all this exciting stuff, there's more coming to raid. And if you haven't started playing yet, then what are you waiting for? Use my link in the description or you can scan the QR code that you see here on the screen to get insane bonuses to help with that Hydra. We're talking about an epic champion, Drake from the Lizardman faction, and other useful things such as energy refills, skill tomes, XP boosters. And once you're in and crushing your enemies, come find me. I'm Mr. Creepypasta. And if you're fast enough, you can even join my clan, the Mr. Creepypasta Boys. So, hit up my link in the description, and I'll see you guys on the battlefield. Amir sat and stared ahead, comprehension and the dread that came with it, washing away the thin film of alcohol that had been clinging to his senses. He'd just gotten home a day ago, and the cold that had stolen in while he'd been gone seemed to linger, no matter what he did. He just wanted to escape. To remember what he'd had and maybe take a moment to forget that his life was falling apart around him. It had been two weeks of endless prodding and interrogations by the people who called themselves fans of her work, of offensive clickbait articles and outright lies that he'd jumped on with particular viciousness. There was nothing else to be said despite what they thought. Out of all of them, the Washington Post's articles said it as best as he could expect anyone any outsider to do. Beloved author, officially declared missing. The article had, in spite of the paper that went with it, gone into as much detail as he'd known and wanted to discuss. 
Alma had gone to Vermont to a little town called Loxley to investigate a potential case that had vanished after an hour at her client's house, leaving her equipment, purse, and phone behind. She hadn't told him much in the way of details. His father had passed, and he needed time to deal with it, but he'd known this particular case had bothered her, that she'd run her evidence by some of her acquaintances and received very mixed results, and that it apparently involved children in some way. And now, she was gone, leaving him in a house that felt too big for him now, with only his thoughts and memories to keep him company. The cold had started to creep in around the first week, but the loneliness had settled in much earlier. He wanted her, but she was gone, and so he'd settled for looking through her notes and emails. Alma's detractors had always said that she came across as aloof, overly academic, snobby, and uncaring. But they didn't know her like he did. Here in her notebook, her sketchbook, and hard drives was a world only he could fully appreciate. Vibrant with her little eccentricities, her dry humor, and the in-jokes that only they would get. But even as he read and let himself imagine their better days, curiosity crept in and brought worry and obsession with it. Sooner rather than later, he had caved, pulled up his wife's emails, and started drinking to lessen the pain. And now he was staring at the first of the last seven emails his wife would receive, her last case. He saw the words and understood them, even though he wished that he couldn't and he felt his stomach writhe as he realized that he hadn't drunk nearly enough to lessen the impact. Dear Mrs. Crookshank, My name is Abby, and I wanted to know if a house could be haunted before it's even finished. Amir stood up, feeling the world tilt for one nauseating moment before he staggered out to the bathroom. Between the first rush of vomit and the second, he had gone from telling himself that he wouldn't read the rest, that he'd let go and not pry, to accepting, with no small amount of anger, that he couldn't. When he finished cleaning himself up and he was sure that his stomach had settled, he shambled back to bed and opened up the laptop again. The first had been sent on August 19th of that year, and the last had been on December 4th. I know it's probably a really dumb question, it continued, but I'm really curious. My parents don't know that I'm doing this. They're kind of strict and not big fans of ghost hunting stuff, but I am. And I'm really, really sure that the house we're building is haunted. We're making it for my brother Theo. He's in college and he's been having a really hard time of it. He's been working really hard, but dad and mom think he's not going to be able to keep going there. So to make him feel better and so he doesn't take up any more space, we're building him this house. Mom and Dad thought that it was going to be really hard because it took forever to get our fence together, but it turns out to actually be really easy. Mom got some lumber people who gave them a discount. The concrete for the foundation set way faster than we were expecting, and we didn't even need to level them off much. Things only started getting weird when we actually started building the house. Nobody had any real accidents, and we got the floor and the first four supports up pretty well, but then... Well... Then Dad and Mom started acting weird. They'd keep starting to do things and then stopping. Mom kept checking and rechecking her notes and the checklist to see what we'd gotten done, and she and Dad would spend a long time remeasuring things and arguing. By the end of the day, they were really tired, even if they didn't get much done, and they'd look sick and go to bed early. Dad actually thought he was having a heart attack last week, he had to go to the hospital. It, it turned out to be nothing, just a panic attack, but it really scared me. I did some snooping around the site, even though Mom warned me not to. There's, there's nothing really obvious going on, at least not like in symptoms of haunted ground, but I know that something's up. The grass around the place is all weird now. It gets all pale and greasy. I put my hand in a patch, and it felt like touching food at the bottom of the sink. It took me forever to wash the slime off. The ground's really soft in some spots. I nearly lost a sneaker in one patch. It's like quicksand. I pretended I noticed it the next day while we were working, and, and Dad said that he'd get someone on it, but 
he's still kind of distracted. The last thing is the actual house. Me and Andy, my little brother, went in to test the f- and while we were, I got this feeling like someone was watching me from behind one of the posts. But those things are way too thin for someone to hide behind. Our dog, Heidi, also won't go near the spot, and we keep finding her standing at the back window and growling, and Heidi never growls, not even when we have to take her to the vet. It's been a long day. I have a cold, and my math teacher wouldn't let me go until I'd finished the homework I didn't do, even though I told her that I'd do it when I got home. Anyway, I've linked a picture of the house here, and I can get more pictures if you want them. Thank you for your time. Abby Faulkner. His wife had understandably replied in short but not terse form a day later. Alma got dozens of requests and propositions a day, and the words of a probably sheltered preteen who read her book could not have been high on her priorities. Hello, Abby. I can't say for certain whether or not a house can be haunted before it's been finished. I'm certainly not the one to say that it's impossible, though. However, I mean this kindly. I very much doubt that your house, such as it is, is haunted. A lot of what you've told me has a perfectly rational explanation. For instance, your parents' need to measure and remeasure and their tiredness. If they're novices at building, then they're most likely stressed out about the process. All the mathematics and geometry that goes into making a sturdy house would explain both of those things. As for the grass changing, it's more likely that... All the leveling and upending has taken away some of its nutrients. Or maybe your parents are using pesticides to clear things up. As for what you felt while you and your brother were playing, there's nothing wrong with that, by the way. I'm fairly confident that you're just as stressed as your parents. It's a heck of a thing to do, building a house. And as far as being watched goes, maybe you were, but it was probably a deer or a fox. They can get curious, too. This must have upset the wildlife a bit. So all in all, I think you're just stressed. And you should take measures to calm yourself down. Maybe read something other than my books. Something fun. An adventure or a romance. Take a nap while you can, and if you feel it getting really bad, there's no harm in asking your parents if you can opt out and take a rest. I hope you aren't offended by what I've said, and I hope you feel better soon. Sincerely, Alma Cruikshank. There had been no response for four weeks after that. His wife had probably forgotten all about it. And then... I'm not making things up. We have most of the outer walls, the roof, and the windows done, and things are still bad. The grass is all gray-blue now, and it smells weird. I went inside while it was daylight and looked around. There's nothing wrong that you can see, but you can feel it. I sort of measured it by myself. The first time it was 31 heel-to-toe steps from the front door to the back window, and it was the same thing the second time. But the third time it was only 30. Then it was 28. And when I was turning around, I saw out the back window, and I swear it was sunset out there, when it was like 2 in the afternoon here. I know your rules for before you can start an investigation. I have an old camera that I got for Christmas a few years ago. I'm selling a few of my things so I can buy some recording software and and maybe a GoPro. If I get proof, will you come? Abby. The response from his wife was much quicker this time around. And when he tried, he could vaguely recall a day in June when his wife had sat, staring at an email with serious frown and furrowed brow, though she hadn't said anything about it then and he had given her space. Dear Abby, I'm so sorry that you're going through this, and yes, if you give me sufficient evidence, I will try my best to come over and see what I can do. I don't want to seem mean or like I'm dismissing you, but have you talked to your parents or another adult you can trust? I've met people in the past who were overtired and overstressed, that they started seeing things and getting physically sick. You should talk to someone, regardless of whether or not there are any supernatural activity. Best regards, Alma Cruikshank. The reply came only two days later. Mom and Dad are still really tired, and because they're tired, they're getting stressed a lot. 
And because they're stressed, they're getting mad easier. I heard mom with dad a few nights ago because she kept seeing something out of the corner of her eye. And he doesn't really care because he found a hole in the floor and he thinks there's gophers or something. They woke Andy up with how loud they were yelling and Andy sleeps like a rock. If I tell them what I think's happening and that I've been talking to you, they'll get mad and yell at me and they'll make me feel small and they might take my laptop and I really want my distraction right now. I can't stop thinking about the house. It's always out there, wherever I look. I, I ordered a GoPro and some audio stuff. I hope this isn't a case where the supernatural stuff messes up the electrical stuff. I'll try to get back to you soon. I promise. The kid had not been able to keep that promise. It had been nearly a month before she reached out to Alma again. And that had been the period in which she'd been up in Canada, investigating the Haynes Axe murderer house. The one that had left her pretty drained, and she'd taken a week to rest up. In that time, she got two emails from Abby, one text, and one that was a video link. I've been having bad dreams, too. I have them every night. Sometimes I'm walking through the forest out back. I'm holding Heidi's collar and calling for her, but I know that she's gone. I go deeper and deeper, way past where the road should be, and then I hear something bark. But it's not her. It's more like a person doing an impression. I turn to run, and the trees have all died, and there are white things coming out of all the knot holes and the places under the roots where the other animals lived. I, I run, but I'm slow, and the ground is getting all doughy, and I know there are things coming up, chewing their way up to get me. I've woken up and had to throw up a couple of times now. My mom took me to the doctors, but he didn't find anything. I'm really tired. Last night was even worse than usual because I got woken up from a dream where I was in mom and dad's bed and I knew that the house was coming across the backyard for me. And that inside, there were knot holes full of mouths and teeth, all biting and chewing at the air. Mom and dad found Andy sleepwalking to the patio door. He'd never done that before. I got up and heard them trying to wake him up and when he did... He started crying because he thought that Theo was out there and he wanted to go see him. Dad made a phone call and Theo is still in Arkansas and he, he's not really the kind of person to surprise people like that anyway. They made a doctor's appointment for him. I don't think he was feeling all this too. What if he'd actually gone out there? I feel like a terrible sister. I, I should call grandma and try to get her to ask if he can spend a while down there. She's, and she likes him best. And you said that places like this aren't able to hurt people or mess with them outside of their area. I'm going to get footage tomorrow. Mom and Dad are going to be out with Andy, so I'll be good to go. I have wards with me, the kind you talked about. I hope it's enough. With that finished, and the dread curdling in his gut, he checked the video. Amir had used to suffer from motion sickness. He still did. But 13 years spent as husband to a professional ghost hunter and paranormal expert had, he'd like to think, helped him build up a decent tolerance, giving him some calluses on his cerebellum. That being said, Abby's skill with a handheld camera was way below what he was used to. Still, the picture quality was good, and she at least knew how to walk slowly. The footage showed her walking down a dirt path past a small garden and several berry bushes whose greenery glowed in the morning sun up to a little incline and then down the other side to the house. It was just as she said, closer to actually being a proper house. The roof had been completed and most of the siding was on, and the narrow porch now had proper stairs and a little rocking chair, though it still didn't have windows, a door, or anything on the inside. Amir paused the video. She wasn't really focusing on it, but he could still see a blotchy ring of tall, bluish-white grass around the house. It looked almost like a rash, like Lyme disease or a nasty spider bite. 
It was like the ground was infected. Frowning, he unpaused the video and watched as Abby walked to the porch, hesitated a moment, and then walked in. It shouldn't have struck him as hard as it did. The alienness of the place. He was just the inside of an unfinished house. His mother was a carpenter, so he was more familiar with them. Maybe he was just buying into the hype that Abby had built up, but he couldn't deny it himself that the atmosphere was noticeably different from the outside. It was in the way that all ambient sound, with the exception of the kid's slow, unsteady breaths, fell away when she'd crossed the threshold. It was also in the light that came through the back and side windows. A cold-looking light that he could swear had an amber cast to it. It drove the shadows upward so they filled the whole top of the house, making it seem like it could have had thirty stories rather than one and a half. Abby let the camera linger on the full view before she started to move again, skirting around little towers of boxes and coils of insulated wire, all frosted with sawdust. At some point it had rained and now the walls were staying dark in some spots, and three times she stopped and zoomed in on a ragged, splintery hole in the unfinished floor that he heard her say hadn't been there before. The camera shook a little as Abby fumbled with something and then brought it up to the lens. It took him a second to recognize it. A digital measuring tape. I'm going to try to show you that it changes size, she said slowly. Her voice was higher pitched than he'd expected, though he didn't know why he thought that. He watched as she crept back to the front door, trained the little red dot right at the threshold, then walked quickly all the way to the back right under the windowsill. There was a moment of silence and then a beep, and finally the hand came back into view. The little screen read 30.28. Amir paused the video as she started to turn back. For a split second, he had a clear view of the space where the back window was going to be, and there was something there that immediately had his hackles up. It took some finagling. The motion blurred a lot of it into color soup, but after a minute, he had as good a picture as he was going to get, and it confirmed his worries. The view from outside the house was different, not so much as to be totally noticeable, but not too little for him to chalk it up as a bad vibe or an off feeling. The light that streamed through the bare branches was amber-tinted, and if he looked closely, he could see what shreds of the sky that were visible through the trees was reddening as the sun set. Squinting, Amir rewound the video until Abby was just going over the crest. The sky was blue, and the sun was yellow. Was it a joke? Some clever editing for a film project or something like that? If his wife hadn't gone missing, then he would have certainly thought so, but... Since she had... He wasn't totally sure how much he'd ever believed in the supernatural. His parents had dabbled in spiritualism, but that had always seemed like something they did out of curiosity or to try and seem like there was more to them as people than there really was. He'd never had a close friend who was a believer. He'd only been to a church a handful of times, the last being for their wedding. His wife had a lot of admirers, fellow ghost hunters, occultists, and passive believers. He'd met some of them, and now with the nameless heavy something that hung over his head, he could admit to sneering at most of them behind closed lips. More often than not, they were an unhealthy mix of tinfoil hats who thought that whichever president was currently in office was the Antichrist, the people who thought that wearing tweed and consulting a thesaurus once in a while kept them from sounding like lunatics or man-children in crowley shirts and lipstick, the people who showed off their handcrafted talismans like they were trying to impress the mother who'd never hugged them. But he'd never thought less of her. Maybe he believed in Alma's passion more than anything, and now he wasn't sure what to think. He had to make sure. He dragged the marker back to his first timestamp and stared. He saw something else that gave him pause. 
The trees were different, too. The ones he'd seen on the way in looked like pines and maple trees, but the ones he saw from the back window were thin and dark and tipped by long, squiggly, knotted branches that reminded him of a diagram he'd seen of arteries and nerves. A closer look also revealed that the trees nearest to the window was riddled with knot holes, darker than the bark around them, which was flaky and peely in a way that made him vaguely queasy. Eventually, he let the video resume. Abby turned and started to head back, only to stop as abruptly as she started. He heard a stifled gasp, and then the video panned down to another hole in the floor. The motion blur once again worked against his senses, but all the same, he was sure that he'd seen something pale and white drop out of sight into the deeper darkness. Before he could even process what he thought he'd seen, a high grating sound came through his speakers, like wood scraping against wood. Abby turned around and screamed. Was it his imagination, or was the tree that had been right outside the window a second ago now a few feet farther back? He wasn't sure. Abby ran, the camera bouncing and jostling until she reached her own back door and gone in, locking it behind her. There was a long beat of silence, but all he could see was one jean-clad leg, and then the camera dropped to the floor with a clatter as Abby sank to the ground. He heard her hyperventilation turn into full-blown, breathless sobbing, even as the camera was picked up and a shaking, pale hand held out a digital measuring tape that now read 28.4. And Amir knew that it was time to focus on other things. Alma's response came a few days later. I gave this to a friend of mine, and she wasn't sure what to make of this. Neither can I, to be honest. If this is real then it's some of the most explicit evidence of the supernatural that I have ever seen. I need you to answer a few questions for me if you can. During the first few weeks of construction, did you or anyone else find anything in the soil? Odd stones, old tools, bits of wood, or anything like that? Where did your mother get the lumber from exactly? Do you remember the name of the company, or can you ask her? Do you know who owned the house, the, the one you're living in right now, before you? Have any of you ever been supernaturally afflicted in the past? Does anyone in your family have a history of mental illness? Have you seen anything inside your house as of now? Please be safe. You shouldn't go back in there anymore. Regards, Alma. After that, there are only three more emails. Two from Abby, one from Alma. All we found were some old white rocks in the soil, but I've read wards, boundaries, and ruins, and I can't see anything wrong with them. I think we threw them into the woods. Maybe they're still there? My mom says the people she got the wood from are called Masterton and Scarfy, I think. I didn't write it down because I didn't want mom to get suspicious, and she's been on edge lately. All I know about the people who owned the house before us was that they were old and one of them was in a wheelchair, but that's all I remember of them. My great-aunt had schizophrenia, but other than that, I think we're okay. We've never seen a ghost or felt any presence or anything. Do you count the feeling sick and bad dreams? Because if you do, then yes, but nothing else shown up since then. I really hope you come. I read that there's some kids who die from heart attacks. I feel like I'll be one of them if I keep having dreams this bad. I'm going to ask mom and dad if I can go see grandma. I'm too tired to care if they get mad at me. A day later came Abby's final email. Andy's gone. I woke up and Heidi was barking and mom and dad were outside shouting for him. They looked in the house, but I guess they didn't find him and they couldn't find him anywhere else. The police came earlier, but they can't do anything until some stupid time limit's up. Mom and Dad have been crying, and Heidi's just been sitting and looking out at the house. I managed to get another video. And I think I see what she's seeing. Here. Please, please, please come quick. 
I'm not making this up. I never was. You're the best for this. Please try and find him. I can pay you. I've saved up. I, I can sell more of my stuff. Anything to get him back. Please come. Please. I'm going to Grandma's tomorrow. Mom and Dad want me safe, but I think they think it's a person when it's not. But they don't believe me. I don't care if they're angry. I don't. Just come over, please. His wife, God bless her, had responded not even five minutes later with, I'll come. Don't worry, it's going to be okay, I promise. Stay at your grandmother's if you can and try to be calm. If you start getting the dreams there too, then follow the instructions in my warning book or get a pastor. I'm so sorry this has been happening to you, but I believe you and I'm going to try to help. Alma. Amir closed his eyes and imagined shutting the laptop and leaving the room. Of going downstairs, getting in his car, and leaving the overwhelming memory tidal pool that she left behind for some little hotel, or getting a room with a big king bed, lying down and letting the overwhelming liminality of his surroundings maybe something a bit more illicit carry him away from everything, even if it was just for a little while. But he knew that he wouldn't. I needed to see this to the very end. He knew that. After he'd seen the video, whatever it was, he was going to go through the rest of her inbox and her notes, too, until he'd pieced together something close to a complete narrative. This last video was 20 seconds long. It was a mostly static shot of the doorway to see the house, which looked as unfinished as it had before. He was snowing lightly, and he could see Heidi and Abby's vague silhouettes in the glass. Once it had ended, Amir rewound and watched it again. He hadn't seen anything, though it might have just been a case of too much to take in in too short an amount of time. It took him a few tries, but eventually he became aware of something. A stealthy movement out there, in the open doorway. He slowed the clip down to a crawl and zoomed in as best as Alma's computer would allow. There were things on the doorframe. A cluster of seven very long, very thin things, so pale and still, he didn't even notice them until they retreated into the darkness with a horrible, spidery grace. The motion led his line of sight to a spot in the corner of the door jamb. At what he thought had been a ray of sunlight. It moved, too, shifted and closed tight and retreated, and then he realized that he'd just seen a set of fingers and the face of their owner moved back into the shadows. No one had fingers like that, and no one had a mouth or teeth or eyes like that either. It was a ghost. He'd just seen a ghost. His wife had been right. She'd always been right. He felt like he'd just been given a cancer diagnosis, like the ground had dropped from under him, like the world had flown apart into little pieces. He found himself replaying the video over and over and over again, just like he'd had with the last one, only this time he couldn't deny what he'd seen. Over and over he watched as the too wide, too toothy mouth, which had been smiling the whole time up until the 19th second mark, closed and left the lower half of the face looking like a cut that was only just starting to heal. Then the quick disappearance of the face followed by the fingers. Were there others just behind the first one? If he squinted hard enough, he thought he could make out other shapes, but he didn't know if he was imagining things, adding extra horrors to whatever he was seeing, when what he was seeing was more than enough. He realized that he was cold, and that his legs were asleep. A quick glance at his phone revealed that it was four in the morning. The first traces of blue were beginning to brighten the night sky, and he realized that he was exhausted his eyes itching to close and his bones leaden. I'll have nightmares if I sleep now, he thought, frustrated and anxious. He imagined himself mustering up the will to keep searching or to pull up something wholesome to drive away at least some of the darkness that the past hours had left him mired in. But even as he did, he was closing the laptop and leaning back down, letting the cold fabric of the pillow soothe him even further. The last sparks of resistance went out and he was asleep before he realized it. 
In his dream, he was in a crowded, tangled forest of black, flaky trees with trunks full of holes and the tops crowned with branches like arteries. It was quiet, save for the whistling of the chill wind through the branches. There was a strange layered element to it that made him uneasy, and the ground beneath him was blue-white with snow. He moved between the trees, walking fast and slowly building up into a tireless run, his feet pacing forward even though he knew there was something terrible waiting for him wherever he ended up. Time blurred into a long, winding path through a darkness laced with cobwebs of pink fiberglass, foam, and hail strips of something that might have been waterproofing plastic. And then he was in a little clearing. The snow here had been pushed away from the ground in places, but instead of hard, icy earth, he saw gray floorboards riddled with ragged holes whose edges bent outwards like spiky, flowery petals. Here and there, the tree trunks were spotted with what looked from a distance like clusters of yellow fungus, but when he looked closer, he realized were actually patches of hardened gap filler. The wind was starting to pick up, too, that eerie, unknown quality that it had become more and more prevalent by the second, and then all at once he became aware of the wall peering through the trees on the direct opposite side of where he was standing, a wall with an empty window overlooking an unfinished room. Alma had a friend, he couldn't remember her name, who was a self-affirmed, preterdimensional scholar. She liked to come around, always unannounced, every few months to talk to his wife about something or other, and one of the few times he'd actually paid attention, she'd spoken about demimons, places half in and half out of conventional reality. Was this a place like that? Something creaked behind him like a palm on a loose board. The sound made him gasp, and he wanted to look back despite himself, but his body still wouldn't obey him, so he watched because he knew that was what he was meant to do. It was afternoon over there. He could just make out the big house at the top of the hill and the edge of the garden to his left. He could also see the young girl coming his way, her steps hesitant but unceasing. She had a phone in her hand. More sounds behind him, worse ones. The boards were groaning, and so were the trees. He could hear things in the woods now, soft things, wet things, things that groped around with long fingers and moaned, hopeless and hungry. Abby was inside now. She looked about like he expected her to. Blonde hair and a ponytail, a thin face descending worryingly into haggardness, a pointed chin, big eyes behind bigger glasses. If he and Alma had ever had a daughter, She'd probably have looked at least a little bit like that. Can she see me if she really looks? He wondered, through the haze of dread clouding his mind. Now the activity behind him was reaching a fever pitch. He heard wood splintering and the slick sound of flesh tugging against, and then through some barrier. And now the wind's cadence had changed as well. That uncanny quality, which had been building and building with the frenzy of the ghosts, had resolved into a legion of human voices, men and women of all ages crying out into the wind. Or maybe they were the wind. He picked out his wife's voice almost immediately. Her words were mostly lost amidst the rest, but he knew what he heard. Get back. And Abby, run! Were the voices real? Were his wife and Andy Faulkner ghosts? And if that was the case, then what were the things behind him? He could feel them at his back, the weight of their collective presence and their attention. He couldn't turn around even if he wanted to. Something pale poked its way out of a knothole in the tree, just to Abby's left. The girl didn't see. She was staring right at him like she could see him, though her gaze was unfocused. Not knowing what else to do, he began pointing and shouting, parroting what the voices in the wind were telling him. Abby just stood there, her brow furrowed, her phone dangling limply from her fingers as not a foot from her. Something awful was emerging from the knothole teeth first. 
It was like watching an octopus squeeze through a gap in a ship's hull, rows of teeth set in anemic gums, squirming through a space far too small for them, followed by wet, white skin that, now that he was closer, didn't seem wholly there. Something that was close to being tangible, but not quite. The horror spurred him on, body before mind, and he reached through the window and tore a line through the young girl's right cheek with his fingernails. Abby screamed. To her, it must have been soul-renderingly terrifying, and there was nothing he could do for that. Her screams only grew when she turned to flee and saw the thing that she actually had to be afraid of, which was even now pawing at her with long fingers and a doughy, unfinished face, straight out of a Francis Bacon nightmare drooling and leering at her. She was out before he could blink, tearing through the snow on her way back up to the house. The thing from the knothole was standing now, bow-legged and tilted like it was about to fall down. It stared at him, then turned and shuffled out the door, arms raised outward like its hands were as hungry as its mouth. Something groaned right behind him, wafting cold, clinging mist across the back of his neck. It was a desolate, angry sound that made his stomach churn. I want to wake up now, he told himself registering the feeling of a high whimper. He shut his eyes and wished desperately for it all to be over, to know that it was a dream, that it was the culmination of all that he'd read and seen that day, and all the stress and dread wearing him down, opening him up, making him vulnerable, but the teeth that came to rest ticklishly against his soft skin of the nape were all too real, and they were still real when they began to dig in. Amir woke up screaming, his mind in tatters. He screamed because of the overwhelming panic. Then he screamed when the pain hit. And when he reached a hand behind his neck and felt a warm, wet cavity just below his hairline. And when staggering in blind terror, he stepped on a cold floorboard and felt a puff of colder air on the sole of his foot. He didn't stop screaming until the police came and only because his voice had given out. They left the house with him shaking and moaning on a stretcher. He'd been taken to the hospital where the bite marks on his nape would be treated and frowned at by perplexed doctors. He'd be questioned, but his answers wouldn't satisfy anyone, though it would stir something cold in the hearts of the men and women who'd been in that house. If any of them had the awful feeling that there was something moving beneath the floors... Something much too big to be a rat. Only a few brought it up. And only then, in the darkness of their bedrooms with their spouses or in the crowded safety of their favorite bars. Amir would try to go back to the house, though he was still reeling from what had happened. His shaky fingers caressing the little bottle of Zoloft in his pocket like a talisman. He'd go in and find that things had changed while he'd been gone. The air would be colder, the lights not as bright, the shadows just a shade deeper and a touch wider than they should be. He'd go to their bedroom and feel like he had when they'd first taken the tour, back when it was just a house and not a home. Their photo album would be on the bed. He'd remember putting it under there the last time he'd checked, He'd take it, clutch it close to his chest, bend down to see if the power cord for her laptop was still there. And that's when he'd see the big, ragged hole in the floor right between the bed and the nightstand. Then he would feel a puff of cold, damp air on his ankle, and his world would blur as he ran, leaving the house to its new owners. Back in the safety of his hotel room, he'd curl up onto the too soft bed and let himself fall apart, clutching the only thing of theirs he'd been able to salvage as he felt the phantoms of dry, flat teeth on his nape. The house would sit there, gathering silence and stillness like a brewing storm while its progenitor a thousand miles away in rural Vermont did the same. Adults would talk and their children too. Alma's fans, mourners, friends, and rivals would add fuel to the fire, and both houses would become founts of urban myth. On Halloween night, people would creep through the overgrown lawn, up and down the little hill, to peer into the black entrance, 
to the little unfinished house or stand on the sidewalk and dare their friends to go up and knock on the door of the old Crockshank place. Occasionally, they went even further. Most of the time, the windows and doors would be locked tight and the security system running properly and nothing would come of it. Sometimes, a little group would venture into the unfinished house and take pictures of videos, and they'd rarely experience more than a faint heaviness in the atmosphere. But sometimes, someone would find the basement window unlocked for them, and they'd slip in unnoticed. Sometimes, people would get phone calls in the middle of the night, their friends or children sobbing, telling them how sorry and scared they were, that they were in the woods and they couldn't get out. Little communities would spring up, grieving parents and kids. Normal people confronted the same truth that Alma had known and that her husband still knew, a truth that would remain even after the two houses had been torn down past their foundations. That there was a place under the skin of reality. A dark, lonely place that drew in the living and where the dead were, were something else waited with hungry mouths everybody has that story to tell the memory hangs out in the back seat of your mind waiting for the right moment to chip in the group and share your childhood fear the first time you were scared, the first time you felt real fear, by the time you tell a story, you almost forgot it had ever happened. Maybe it was just a fever dream you had as a child. Maybe the circumstances were fabricated by your adolescent imagination. Even though you doubt it ever happened, the memory still lingers, held dearer than what should have been your cherished moments when you were younger. When you think back, you don't remember the first time you tied your shoes or the first basketball hoop you made. You think of that story. It's there, waiting. Almost as if it has unfinished business with you, like you're not allowed to move on from it yet. And you tell the story with a big smile on your face. The ones around you laughing so hard they ugly cry because your experience was so real and relatable. It could have happened to them just as easily as it happened to you. Once you shared it, you feel better. And the memory retreats back to its den, hibernating until the stars align and it can torment you once more. I was at work when the opportunity presented itself. The night shift was over, and we were all in the locker room exchanging thick uniforms and heavy boots for Crocs and basketball shorts. Terry was telling a story about his fear of rats, his face a half grin as he struggled to get through it without laughing. I was on the bench, unlacing my boots. Dude, I've been looking for this fucking rat for a week. I would always see it out of the corner of my eye, the little bastard scurrying around while I was trying to sleep. Turns out it had made a nest in the box spring. I've been sleeping on it, dude, Terry says, shivering as he thought back. The other guys laughed, a cackling chorus of grown men amused by someone else's demise. I laughed as well. Terry was well known for his fear of rodents and was heckled about it constantly. They went back and forth over the details as I kicked off my boots. How do they deal with it? Do they burn the mattress? Did he let it sleep there forever? As the laughter dies down, I think of my story and wonder if I should tell it. At first I shiver at the thought, but before I know it, I'm grinning myself and dying to let it out. The old memory resurfaces like a shark from the deep. A story that happened 23 years ago. A story about a beaver. Alright, I got one. Terry, you'll especially like this. I say, standing up. The guys listen, still wiping the tears from the rat in Terry's mattress. It's been so long since I've thought of the beaver, and the details flood in as I picture it in my head. Alright, so this was a really long time ago when I was a kid. 
I think I was five or six. Anyway, I used to live in this trailer park over on Rainbow Road. That one over there by the highway? I vaguely point north as I close my locker. There's a few interjections before the story continues. Wait, Rainbow Road? Yeah, I know that place. My aunt used to live there. Used to live in the Cans, Jay? Over by 94? Yeah, a long time ago. Then ages, I say. And resume the story. Anyway, it was in the summer back in the 90s. And we were all playing outside. Not shit to do. There was nothing but trailers and a long line of mailboxes. We were all poor and there was no playground to play at. So most of the time, all the kids would just group up and we would walk around and play with rocks and shit. We'd walk around all day, and our parents didn't care as long as we didn't go by the highway. They were always worried about a car hitting us, I say, and in my mind I can hear the sounds of cars passing by. So there's like five of us playing by this trailer that didn't have anyone living in it, and all of a sudden one of the kids just freezes and says, uh, what's that? So we all look, and sitting on the porch of the trailer is this big fucking beaver, just staring at us, I say. The beaver's black eyes and teeth clear in my mind. I shudder at the thought of it. The guys laugh and Terry visibly cringes. So we're all frozen there, all of us, too scared to move. We'd never seen one before. We're all terrified at this beaver. And it's just staring us down. We're just waiting for it to rush us, like it was going to eat our bones or something. Really scary shit. Anyway, so there's this girl standing next to me. I think her name was Kirsten. Uh, she whispers to me and says, go get your mom, we'll stay here. My house was the closest, only two trailers away. So I run home, thinking this beaver is going to chase me, like it's some kind of horror movie or something. And I run and I tell my mom and she starts yelling about us playing by the highway. And the whole time I'm just scared shitless this beaver is going to eat my friends by the time we go back. No shit. What happened? Did it attack you guys? One of the guys says, and I laugh. No, my mom grabbed the broom, we went back, and she pretty much just shoot it off, but I still can't shake the look that Beaver gave us. We we really thought it was going to eat us. Like, fucking hate beavers, dude. I finished the story, and they all laughed. All except Terry, who looks like he found something new to add to his list of rodent fears. I chuckled to myself at the thought of the memory, feeling a bit of the weight lift from my mind, like a shred of the trauma is healed. After some brief shit-talking, we all punch out and leave the building, everyone walking to their cars with their heads held high. Now that the day's work is done, I wave goodbye and get in my car. As I watch the other guys pull away and drive off, I find myself sitting there in silence, pondering the story I told. I think of the beaver story with its nasty buck teeth and black eyes. I think of how funny it is looking back and... I hear the laughter of the guys in my head. The longer I think about it, the more the laughter fades away and the more I hear screams instead. I think of the story, suddenly feeling guilty, wondering why I said it in the first place. Maybe after all this time, I'm just trying to make myself feel better. In my head, the memory unravels. I think of the story and how it's a lie. There's no beaver. There never was. I leaned my head on the steering wheel. I hadn't thought of it in so long, I was sure that I could leave it in the past. I hear the screams. My own screams and those of the other children. I think of the unexplainable memory pushed so far back in my mind. Kirsten was my first crush. I remember her freckled face and short hair and a little red ball cap she would always wear. Everyone thought she looked like a boy, but I thought she was pretty, even though I really didn't know the meaning of the word. She lived across the park in a yellow trailer and would always come over to play when all the kids got together. There were five of us and only a few of us had bikes, so if we all wanted to play together, we would usually walk around and play with sticks and stuff like that. Sometimes we'd play tag or red rover, but that day we found ourselves just walking around bored. The trailer park was an oval formation, the mobile homes placed in a loop with a circular road in the middle. 
He was surrounded by trees, except for the side I lived on that was tucked into a hill that the highway was built on. It was nice outside that day, and our parents booted all of us out of the house so we would enjoy the nice weather, and so they could have some peace and quiet. They only had two rules. Don't talk to strangers, and don't go near the highway. The park wasn't fenced off or anything, and you could hear cars and trucks flying past all day long. We were walking the road in a little group and doing laps without any real plan. We continued like this for a while, every time passing each other's houses and telling jokes, sometimes nagging our parents if we could come in yet. Two trailers down from mine was the only vacant lot in the park. Nobody lived there as far as we knew. The driveway was always empty, with a concrete slab in place of a trailer. The backyard consisted of an uphill climb through the trees that led straight to the highway. It was silly, but between the emptiness of the vacant trailer and the sounds of the highway, it felt like that specific lot was separate from the rest of the park. I don't know if it was the shade from the overgrown trees, the layer of old pine needles on the ground, or the dead sticks scattered about the unkempt yard. There was always something about it. Like it was in its own little bubble. And that was when the dares started. On that particular boring day, one of the kids had the idea that for every lap we took around the park, one of us would have to step foot on the lot. The mini barren zone always gave us the willies, and the thought of pushing the boundaries of the scary property gave us all a shot of rebellious adrenaline. At first I thought it was scary, and I was worried about getting in trouble. But when I saw Kirsten perk up giddily, I decided to play along so I could impress her. Whatever I could do to seem cool and make her smile. It felt like we were doing something bad, and the excitement of who would go the furthest would hurry us along as we walked each lap around the park. We would take turns. Each lap, one of us would walk into the driveway. The next would go up and touch one of the sticks, etc., etc. I remember on one of my turns, I crept into the yard behind the little driveway and sprinted back, comically yelling like something was chasing me all the way back to the road. Looking back, it was immature but it felt like the unexplainable gloom was always trying to nip at your heels. Hours passed as we repeated the cycle. A lap around the park, then one of us running in. There towards the end, we were jogging around the park, all of us excited to take our next turn. As time went on, kids would get called to come back home, and the group began to dwindle. We started to push faster, each of us paranoid to be the next kid to be walking away from the fun with our head hung low as the others laughed. Before we knew it, almost everyone had gone home. Everyone except Kirsten and I. I remember it being my turn next, and the both of us running back to do one more stunt. The sun was starting to set, and we knew any minute our parents would call us. I remember running alongside her, sweating and gasping for breath as the laps tired our legs. Kirsten huffed and laughed as she ran, holding the bill of her ball cap so it wouldn't fly off. This one would be the craziest, I thought. It was my chance to really impress her. I would go into the woods this time, maybe even close to the highway. When we came to the driveway, however, we both stopped. Our smiles faded, and the sun seemed to fizzle away in an instant. There was an old rundown trailer on the vacant lot like it had appeared out of thin air. The dingy green paint was peeling, and the porch looked like it was about to collapse. The drapes in the windows were nicotine-stained and ratty, barely concealing the complete darkness within. As I watched, the front door creaked open slightly. From the darkness within, a groaning whisper escaped. No lights on inside, no car in the driveway. What the? I looked at Kirsten for validation, but she wasn't even looking at the trailer. She was looking at a woman in the yard. It was then I noticed her, off towards the trees. She was standing with her back turned, and even though we couldn't see her face, we knew something was horribly wrong. Once white clothes were heavily stained and ripped up, fitting awkwardly on her frame. One of her legs was bent backwards, and one of her arms was missing, a heavy drizzle of blood oozing from the stump. Despite how mangled she was, she stood perfectly still. 
We just stood there for a time, both of us silently gawking at her. The air was chilly, like a temperature drop before a bad storm. Kirsten looked at me, the color drained from her face. Without a word, both of us looked in the direction of our homes to see which one was closest to run to. When we looked back in the direction of the woman, we noticed she had silently moved closer. Her back was still turned, but we could see the damage clearer. Horribly road-rashed muscle, black streaks on her clothing from the combination of tires and asphalt. What do we do? Kirsten whispered, her voice a whimper. I... I don't know, I managed, my bladder suddenly feeling like it was going to burst. I remember my legs shaking. Maybe we could... Ahead of us, the woman turned. Not in a normal sense, but like she blinked to facing a different direction, like someone had flipped the paper over while our eyes were closed. The sight of her face provoked a gasp from both of us. I was crying now, filled with the confused fear you have when you wake up from a terrible nightmare. The woman was missing her bottom jaw, and with it, half of her upper face. The only identifiable thing left of her top jaw was a hanging bloody tongue and her two front teeth. A single eye looked at me angrily, the pupil surrounded by the black splotching of burst blood vessels. No sound emitted from the woman, but seeing the way she stood there, frozen in place, I couldn't explain it. Something was just wrong. Horribly wrong. Your house is closer. Run, get your mom, Kirsten whispered, her voice trembling. Her breath came out as fog. The mangled woman remained in place, but her single eye was locked on Kirsten now. Before our eyes, she blinked forward, three feet closer in Kirsten's direction. I wanted to reach for her hand, but it seemed so far away. I looked at her freckled face, tears streaming down them as she stood as still as possible. But, but, I whimpered, and the mangled woman blinked again, a few more feet, facing my direction. Without a single sound, the eye glared angrily at me. I sobbed as she grew closer once more, her eye dilated in response to my noise, and at her side, her only remaining hand twitched. Just go! Kirsten's shout echoed across the park, rustling birds from the trees. I turned and ran. My shoes skipping down the sidewalk. I couldn't breathe. I looked over my shoulder at the terrified look on Kirsten's face and the woman shifting closer, burning itself into my memory. Even as she drew closer to her, Kirsten kept her eyes on me, weeping silently as she watched me go, as she made sure I could get away. My house was only a few trailers away, but I felt like I was running across town. My legs were weak, my thoughts raced. The further I got from the yard, the warmer it seemed to get. The sun began to feel hot, but my blood was still cold. I tried to focus on the patio door to my home where my mom would be inside, where I could get her to save us. The adrenaline crawled across me like ice, and I thought just for a moment that everything was going to be okay. It was all just a nightmare. My mom would show up and fix things just like she did all the other times I had a problem. By the time I made it to my yard, Kirsten screamed. The shrill cry of terror and pain made me stumble, and I fell to the ground. I looked behind me frantically, but Kirsten and the woman were gone. All I could see was an empty yard, and I started shaking. I looked to my front door, then back to where I left Kirsten. I didn't know what to do. I thought it would take too much time to get my mom. I shook and sobbed on the ground as my adolescent brain tried to compute the right thing to do. I just wanted to help. I wanted her to be okay. In my fear, I wet myself. Behind me, Kirsten screamed again. She was getting further away. I got back on my feet and I ran back to the phantom trailer, cursing myself for leaving her alone. We should have just ran together. Why didn't we just run together? No, 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 I sobbed, my stomach desperately wanting to purge its contents. My legs begged me to stop, but I pushed them forward. My sneakers scuffed the sidewalk as the hot trail of urine ran down my leg. I ran past the neighbor's lot and around the corner of the trailer that shouldn't exist. When I got to the yard, I couldn't see either of them. The same awful chill returned, and a mist was working its way across the yard. My eyes followed the source. 
a ghostly fog that was cascading down the porch steps. It was spilling from the trailer. The tiny crack of the door and the darkness inside, the doorway groaned as the fog billowed out, widening slightly with a creak. The window started to bleed and the shutters shriveled like burning plastic. The worst thing of all was what I saw in the trees. The woman was dragging Kirsten by her arm, painfully whipping her around each time she blinked up the tree, dragging her towards the highway. I screamed for her to stop. The mangled woman paused only for a moment, her destroyed mouth reverberating with what I could only describe as a snarl. Kirsten howled in pain as she clawed at the woman, the bruising grip worsening as her helpless hands passed through a seemingly ethereal body. Unnatural and horrible, the mangled woman ascended the hill, each freeze-frame blink bringing them closer to the roaring traffic. I ran after them. I made it halfway across the yard before my foot caught something, sending me face-first into the foggy ground. My palm slapped the ground, softening the fall on something rough and sharp. I tried to get up, but something grabbed my ankle, winding tight like rope as I tried to shake it free. Kirsten's screams got weaker the further she got from me. The fog dispersed as I thrashed to be free, and though I saw no grass at all, the canvas of pine needles and leaves was replaced by hundreds, thousands of dead birds. I looked behind me and shouted for help, hoping to see my mom or one of the neighbors rushing to help. I saw nothing but an empty street and twisting vines wrapping around my ankles. When I turned back to the hill, Kirsten was holding onto a tree, trying to resist the mangled woman's grip. Her fingers clung to the bark and her sneakers formed jagged ruts in the earth. This slowed the woman for a moment, but she retaliated by breaking Kirsten's wrist. The wet snap followed by the worst sound I'd ever heard. I wanted to say I broke free. Sometimes when I dream, I break free from the vines. And I make it through the fog. Other times, grown-ups show up and everything's okay. Sometimes Kirsten has the strength to free herself. and We get away together and sometimes there's no mangled woman at all. It's only a beaver. In reality, the true ending can never be denied. The version where my scream only joins hers. Scream as I reach helplessly and the mangled woman makes it to the road. I watch as the truck takes them. An impact so forceful and sudden, they simply blink away, leaving nothing but streaks on the highway and a hat in the wind that matched the color. The fog recedes into the trailer like a movie being rewound. The blood seeps back into the glass, and the curtains unshrivel. The warmth returns, and the parents flock outside, mortified and speechless as they press me for answers. In time, my screaming fades, replaced by the howling of sirens in the distance. I look up from the steering wheel and dry my tears. The parking lot is empty and everyone else has left for work except me. I think of the images in my head. The weeping eyes I can't unsee. Cries I can't seem to forget. When I start my car and shift out of park, I think about the years that have passed by. I think of how I never really spoke to my friends again after that day and how Everyone seemed to chalk it up to two kids who were never supposed to play by the highway. The park seemed to fall apart after that. Kirsten's parents moving first with my family to follow. I heard some sort of mass exodus followed. A tiny little poor park reduced to nothing but a memory to the nearby bars of traveling truckers. Another traffic accident. Another poor child lost. Tonight, instead of taking my usual route, I took a detour. I take the expressway until I see a road. One so ignored and unkempt you wouldn't know it was there if it wasn't for the reflecting green sign. 
a sign faded and almost illegible with age, a sign that reads, Rainbow Road. I turn onto the winding path, one that feels more like the entrance to a cemetery than a back road. My car rolls over broken pavement and traverses potholes until I see something in the distance, the only landmark in the otherwise empty place that's been consumed by weeds and hoover growth. As I approach the line of old, rusted mailboxes, I slow down. Ahead is the concrete circle. But there's no homes. Only a loop that's been slowly swallowed by the forest surrounding it. My headlights cut through the unnatural dark, the special kind that engulfs in the middle of nowhere. I think of a hot summer's day, and a bunch of bored kids with nothing to do. Letting my car idly crawl, I pull into the loop and survey my surroundings. On Rainbow Road, there are no mobile units to be seen. Each passing slab of the empty lot looks like a gravestone, a gritty reminder of young little lives that will be forever changed. I pass by Kirsten's old lot, think of her freckled face, the way she laughed, and the way she would roll her eyes when I made stupid jokes. I passed by the old lots of my friends' houses and wondered where they're at in the world. I passed by the lot where my home used to be and I think of my mother. A time before the therapy I went through. A time before she started talking less and less. Driving past the old vacant lot, I see no mangled woman and no green trailer. Only the light of cars flying by the highway on the hill beyond. I look at this one longer, expecting to see something more, something of meaning. I look over the weathered surface of its foundation, years of rain slowly chipping away at the concrete. The grass that's overtaken the driveway, the thin layer of gravel reclaimed by earth. I stare into the trees, I look at every wicked branch in the night, I search for those twisted limbs and malformed face and wonder if it's hiding somewhere in there. I listen for the screams and find cicadas instead. Nothing but empty lots, overgrown grass, and fleeting rodents. When I reach the end of the circle, I see the exit and stop. I see the winding road and how it's been so long since I've been here. How I'll have no reason to come back. I let off the brake and I keep turning left, going over the same vacant spaces again. But this time, I think of the good times. I think of every dare that didn't end in tragedy. I think of every boring summer day where we climbed trees or played tag. I think of every smile Kirsten made and how, how it would give me butterflies in my stomach. When I reach the end of the circle, I decide to go again. My head filled with laughter and smiles. The kind no longer thought by a late 20s man. And that one's through it leads to another. And another. Each passing tree and remembered backyard spawning memories long buried under the surface and lost long gone. Memories deserving remembrance. I kept on the loop for a while, holding the same angle on the wheel as I drove in a circle into the late hours of the night. I thought of many memories, reliving them like they were yesterday. until something changed. A flashing strobe was blinding and unexpected, and part of me wondered how I didn't even see it coming in the first place. The squad car may have followed me with its lights off for a while, and I was none the wiser. I pulled my car over right in front of where my old house used to be. Putting it in park, I sighed as he ran my plates. The cop took their time, both of our engines running idly in the middle of nowhere. When they finally emerged from their car, I had my license and registration ready, I rolled down the window in time to see an old officer, headlights illuminating a mustached face, white with age. When I offered my paperwork, he waved it off with a question. What are you doing out here this time of night, kid? Getting high, getting drunk? He asked impatiently as he looked inside my car. No, just um, visiting an old friend, I guess, I said. And he blinked at me. Very funny. You know how many times I get called out here? Look, you kids come out here screwing around, shooting up, causing trouble. There's no reason for it. I thought maybe after they set fire to the last trailer out of here, we leveled it with the bulldozer. And that'd be the end of it. 
Now you're here driving circles until dispatch picks it up. There ain't nothing out here, kid. Either you're lying or you got the wrong address, he said sternly, his frown curving his mustache. She passed away a long time ago. She was, um, she was hit by a truck on the highway, I said. And there was an immediate sadness in his eyes. Mm, sorry to hear that, he said, and collected himself. That was a long time ago, but I remember it clearly. I was first on the scene. Terrible, terrible thing. My family bought flowers out of here for years. After everyone moved away, they were the last people who came by and they weren't trying to cause trouble. After a while, they stopped coming. Now this place is just an overgrown hole. I thought of the family visiting each year. I thought of long-wilted flowers deeply saddening me. I looked around the park as the officer collected himself, looking over empty lots until my eyes rested on that particular one two doors down from mine. I felt the icy chill crawl over me again, but the officer's voice pulled me away. You, you're that boy. Never thought I'd see you again, let alone recognize you. Yeah, I haven't been here since it happened. I felt like I'd stopped by, I said, peering through the light at him. Oh, I'm sorry I gave you such a rough time. I'm sorry about your friend. People like to come out here and cause trouble. Park's never the same after that. And once everyone moved out, a lot, it's been a hot spot for squatters and the like for a while. It's private property. The owner calls and raises hell every time he sees people out here. I understand you're paying your respects, but I don't have to ask you to leave. I'll follow you out, he said, starting to leave. Without much to say, I just nodded and rolled up my window. The officer started walking away, and I watched his silhouette shrink in the side mirror as he made his way to his car. When he reached the door, he stopped, his hand pausing as he reached for the handle. After a moment, he turned around and he started walking back. I waited for the mustached face to come into view and rolled the window down again. Hey, kid, he asked, his brow furring a little. Yeah, I said the air feeling chillier, a light fog rolling over the road. The sight of it made me sick to my stomach. But back then, when the accident happened and I arrived on the scene, you kept saying the same things over and over. Green trailer, lady in the woods, he said, leaning on the door. I remember, I said, but I'm not looking at him anymore. My eyes are held ahead. You sure that's what you saw? Are you sure that's what happened? He asked. I could feel him study my face. I'm positive. I, no doubt in my mind. Why? I asked, looking to the side of the road, to the darkness beyond the headlights. Oh, when we arrived, there was no trailer. There was no woman in the woods, either. I asked every resident in the park. Nobody saw anything. We searched for miles, thinking maybe you were right. Someone had fled the scene. Even got a helicopter. Did you find anyone? I said, gripping the steering wheel. Nobody. Ah. In the dark, I traced the faint outline of something ahead. Rectangular in shape. Yeah, but here's the thing. After talking to all the neighbors, we spoke to the landlord. When we mentioned what you said you saw, he turned white. Almost fainted. That it was impossible. Said he been running the park for over 20 years and all that time there only been one green trailer in the 80s he said and paused to chew his lip young couple used to live there pretty young woman drunk for a husband whenever he wasn't sunk in a bottle he was getting the drugs anyway always late with rent always yelling and screaming at each other he said sometimes when they fought he'd beat her up pretty bad She'd walk around the loop waiting for her husband to calm down or fall asleep. He said she'd ask for help from the neighbors knocking on doors as she went. They helped at first, but it happened a lot, he said. She would always go back home. They'd make up. Things would be quiet for a while. They'd always get bad again. You know, back then it was a different time. The police didn't do much to help her, I'm afraid. After a while, they stopped taking her calls. Not long after that, the neighbor stopped helping altogether. Just a thing that happened. The fog started to get thicker. 
but the officer didn't seem to notice. One night, after an especially bad fight, he beat her up real bad and they left. Took the car, left her there. Landlord said she came out eventually, limping, her face all swollen, mumbling his name as she walked the loop in the middle of the night, waiting for him to come back, I guess, but never did. She kept walking, even after everyone put their lights out for the night. When the morning came, she was gone. Through the fog, I could see the outline of windows in the rectangular shape and the dark structure of a porch. The police found her on the highway, hit and run. Nobody knows if it was grief taking hold or if she was just trying to catch a ride in a town. Anyway, pulled the trailer from the lot and never put another one on it. Never allowed another green one, either. I thought of Kirsten's scream and the floating baseball cap. Oh, look, kid. I don't know what you saw that day, but I'm sorry. About the whole thing. I'm sorry you lost your friend. The officer said. Patted his hand on the hood awkwardly. Do you see it now? I asked, pointing forward. The officer raised his eyebrows and looked into the distance. I watched as his face softened with worry and his eyes narrowed on what lay ahead. Without a word, he grabbed his flashlight and aimed it in the yard. With a faint click, the beam cut through the dark and he panned it slowly around the property. I watched it shine over the fog and watched it shine on a familiar dingy green paint. Ratty stained drapes and a mangled figure at the end of the yard. I don't see anything, kid, he said, and shut off his flashlight. I looked into the darkness, transfixed on what I knew was still standing there. Me neither. Sorry for causing trouble. You have a good night, officer, I said, and started rolling up my window. He looked like he wanted to stop me, but in the end he stood there and let me go. I drove past the empty lot and rusting mailboxes, keeping my eyes forward until I was through the winding road that led out the park. I didn't realize I was holding my breath until I was turning back onto the main road. Once I was out, the icy feeling withered away and I was welcomed back by the comfort of green traffic lights. As I left the park behind me, I released my grip on the wheel and I felt the tension in my shoulders melt away. I sighed exhaustedly, keeping my foot on the gas until I made it to the clover leaf that led me here. I took the ramp quickly, knowing the highway would overlook the park and ultimately take me home. I didn't know why I took that way, whether it was just me being defiant, or maybe I just felt like I had to, or, or maybe inside the safety of my car I thought I'd be all right. Merging onto the highway, I sped onto the overlook and could see the empty park in its wooded sanctuary. Below, I could see the slow-moving headlights of the officer leaving. The fog and the trailer were gone, and with it, the mangled woman. I returned my eyes to the road, just in time to see a hitchhiker walking on the shoulder. They walked slowly, leisurely, kicking rocks as they went. As I approached, they stopped and looked at me, slowly waving as I rapidly approached. It was a little girl with a freckled face and a red ball cap. When I checked the rearview mirror, she was gone. It was supposed to be just another ordinary, boring summer job. I needed a way to save money for the upcoming school year, so my geology professor offered to put me in touch with a local caving group. From June to August, the group hosted camps for children ages 12 to 14. Over the course of each four-day, three-night session, campers would hike along limestone rivers, learn about underground ecology, receive guided tours, three different caves, and even spend the night in one. And along the way, of course, they would be treated to the usual cringy team-building activities, cold, bug-infested showers, and barely edible food familiar to summer camp attendees everywhere. My task on paper was a simple one. I was to guide the campers through the caves in a group of about 20, keep an eye on them while they stayed overnight, and we worked in pairs, which was one guide at the front and another at the rear to make sure that no one got lost. 
We carried helmets, three sources of light, walkie-talkies, first aid kits, and extra rope. Even though the caves that we worked with were well-mapped and well-trafficked, no one expected anything to go wrong. Well, almost no one. Scoutmaster Dan got his nickname from his khaki short shorts with too many pockets, his knowledge of knots, and his obsession with being prepared. In over 40 years, as organizer Dan Raffled had never lost a camper, and, as he was fond of telling us, he planned to keep it that way. We were expected to find our way through each cave at least five times before we even began escorting campers through them, and every guide lived in constant fear that the scoutmaster would suddenly turn up to inspect their gear equipment or quiz them on first aid procedures. As a college boy from the city with no experience, I had expected Dan to be especially hard on me. But he held us all to the same stern standard. No more, no less. The excitement in the air during those first green, cool weeks of summer was infectious. By the time we had mowed the green lawns of the main campground, cleaned the facility, and learned the layout of each cave, I was surprised by how eager I was for the campers to arrive. Unfortunately, I had forgotten what preteens could be like. The body odor. The bullying. The constant boundary pushing. It was tough enough just to get them quiet and moving in the same direction, let alone to make them understand the importance of safety underground. There were times when I almost wanted one of them to wander off, just so that they'd finally learn their lesson, but... Then I thought about what it would be like to be alone in the dark, so far underground, feeling the cold, damp air on your skin and knowing that it was just a matter of time until your light ran out. As a new guide, I spent the first three weeks at the back of the group, keeping a head count and radioing the leader, Miriam, about our issues. Now, Miriam was a lanky, sunburned redhead who'd worked as a guide for five summers now. She had a sheepdog attitude towards the campers. As long as they were all present for each count, she couldn't have cared less about their eye-rolling complaints and snide comments about her height or her freckles. What really mattered to Miriam, the reason that she kept coming back, were the caves themselves. The fast-flowing underground streams, the beautiful alien rock formations that could be found nowhere else, the unique wildlife that had never seen the sun. For her, our work was more like a stroll through a beloved park, with the minor inconvenience of hurting the group of accident-prone campers. Thanks to her enthusiasm, I also began to enjoy my time spent in the caves, except for one of them. It was just my luck, it was that cave where I was told to lead my first tour. Now in theory, Silverload Cave was the easiest option for a first-time guide. The other two caves, Pine Knot and Church Falls, each had their own drawbacks. Pine Knot Cave was like a maze with so many levels and passages that sometimes even experienced guides lose their way. Church Falls Cave was small, but th there were a few tight squeezes where one or two campers inevitably discovered their own claustrophobia and needed to be helped through. Silverload Cave, however, featured large and well-explored passages with few pits or other dangers at least on the main road. Even so, the place gave me a bad feeling. Maybe it was the sheer size of its high-ceiling galleries. No matter where you directed the beam of your headlamp, there was still a lot of darkness left over. It was also the fact that Silverload was one of the most well-known caves in the area, which meant you might find yourself suddenly face-to-face -face with other cavers or drunk local teenagers. Miriam and I had never had any problems, but still, there was something unsettling about running into strangers in the lightless subterranean world. I think what bothered me most about Silverload Cave was the graffiti. It was usually graffiti in the more popular caves, but the images in Silverload just felt wrong. Worm-like black squiggles. Faces not quite animal, not quite human. Spray-painted on the stone and lurid colors of lime green and purple. My heart raced whenever I rounded a corner and caught one of them in the beam of my headlight, sneering at me like it knew some awful secret that I didn't. But then, of course, there was the history of the place. According to Scoutmaster Dan, Native Americans had mined precious metals in Silverload Cave for centuries until they suddenly and inexplicably stopped over a millennia ago. 
Later, during the Civil War, Silverload Cave had been a hideout for Confederate guerrilla fighters. Imagining some illiterate farm boy getting his leg sawed off by lantern light while listening to the echo of his own screams was enough to make the cave feel hostile, if not downright menacing. Miriam didn't seem to mind or even notice. But she wasn't leading the campers that day. I was. To make matters worse, it was the group's final cave tour, which meant that we'd been spending the night in the cave. I had done overnights before, but only in Pine Knot or Church Falls, never in Silverload. So far, the worst things to happen were a twisted ankle and a camper who woke up screaming because a cave cricket crawled into her sleeping bag. Between the cool air, the coziness, and the, the complete darkness, I'd actually found caves to be a pleasant place to sleep. So far. As many times as I had been through Silverload Cave with Miriam, however, I had never spent the night there and I wasn't looking forward to the prospect. I knew right away there were three boys in the back of my group that day who would be trouble. Alex hid Kyle's lamplight in his bulky pockets. Kyle dumped Sean's water on his head during the safety meeting, and Sean tried to push Alex into the creek on the hike to Silverload Cave. The trio talked over us constantly, their preteen voices cracking in their humid summer air. When we reached the mouth of the cave, Miriam and I gave them an ultimatum, either behave or go home. It worked for about an hour. With a kind of low churning, they knew that once we were deep into the cave, we wouldn't risk splitting the group unless it was an emergency. Unfortunately, they were right. From my place at the head of the 20 campers, I could hear them laughing and throwing rocks into the darkness. Even Miriam, who almost never lost her cool, wound up shouting her words reverberating eerily through the tunnels so that I could hear her anger, but not what she'd said. In fact, there were times I'd wondered whether the voice I was hearing was even Miriam at all. The constant tension grated on my nerves and kept me from paying attention to the things I'm sure that I would have noticed, things like the shadowy figure that seemed to be following our group. The first time I saw it, I thought it was just another caver backlit by one of their companions as headlamps. When it appeared again, however, I wasn't so sure. Maybe it was just a shadow that happened to look sort of human. But if it was, then what was casting it? And why did it seem to be moving closer each time? I warned myself to cut it out. There was clearly no one else in the cave with us. We would have heard them. And besides, it was impossible to navigate through the jagged rocks with no illumination. I considered radioing Miriam about it, but I didn't want to risk the campers overhearing and getting scared, or making myself look like an idiot. As it turned out, I didn't have to. We were about 15 minutes from the breakpoint spot when my walkie-talkie started to go off. At first, it was just a rushing sound like the wind or the creek that flowed through the cavern. But then it changed. Gibbering, scratching, a, a voice whispering my name. Since Miriam's talk button was pressed down, there was no way I could respond to ask her what was going on. I called a halt to the group. Moments later, there was a loud crack, and the noises stopped. We had paused on a low plateau where dripping stalactites hung from the ceiling. It wasn't so low that we had to crawl, but standing up wasn't exactly comfortable either. I was grateful for my knee pads. The 20 campers had packed into a circle, swigging Kool-Aid from plastic bottles and wondering what was going on. Miriam scrambled over to me, her face a mask of pale anger. I think one of those kids pinched my walkie-talkie. Whoever it was, they must have freaked out when you called a halt and dropped it. I heard something rattle when she shook the plastic device. Well, either way, I found it, and it's completely dead. I groaned. It had barely been an hour, and already something had gone wrong. Miriam must have seen the look on my face because she gave my shoulder a reassuring squeeze. You're doing fine. Let's just keep the group close enough to see each other, okay? She bit her lip. There was something she wasn't telling me. Hey, have you noticed that- Ow! Let go, you asshole! Alex, or maybe Sean, or Kyle suddenly started shouting. There was a small rock slide. I'll handle this, Miriam hissed and disappeared. And for a while, it seemed like she did. Since Miriam and I couldn't contact each other by radio, she turned on the infrared setting on her spare headlamp and hung it around her neck where it bobbed in the gloom like a glowing red light. 
That way I could be sure that I wasn't getting too far ahead. Except, as we moved through the cave, I could have sworn I saw other red lights moving in the darkness. Some from the back, some closer up. I told myself that it was probably just Miriam's secondary headlamp reflecting in dripping water and mineral veins in the walls. But I knew that didn't make any sense. There were too many of them. They, they were moving with a will of their own. I tried to distract myself by throwing myself wholeheartedly into the explanation of Silverlode's cave history and the geology. But every time I looked up, the danger in the dark felt closer. Two hours later, we'd reached the large chamber that would serve as our campsite. It was a wide, flat area, formed naturally by a curve in the subterranean stream. It was only about 8 p.m. that I knew from experience that getting 20 campers fed and bedded down would take at least two more hours. I kept an eye out for the shadowy figure or the phantom red lights, but there was no sign of anything strange while we all unpacked. When the campers had finished eating and we were getting ready for lights out, Miriam approached me. I wanted to ask you earlier, have you noticed another caver around? My blood ran cold. Miriam went on without waiting for a response. It's just strange that someone would be in here this late. Someone other than a few loud local teenagers, I mean. And whoever they are, why wouldn't they be using any light? T to be honest... I hesitated. I got a bad feeling about this. Should we, I don't know, call it off? I silently prayed that she'd say yes. I mean, everything about this trip was wrong. Wrong like those eerie graffiti faces spray-painted on the walls. Wrong like the rusted Civil War-era bone saw we'd passed near the entrance. Wrong like the abandoned veins of precious metal that led downward into the dark. Miriam shook her head. Do you want to explain to Scoutmaster Dan and 20-odd parents why they have to come pick up their kids at 1 a.m. on a weeknight? Because that's what will happen. Assuming I get them all out of here on no sleep, it was just one working radio. She had a point. Whoever, or whatever, was out there. It hadn't made any hostile signs towards us so far, so ignoring it and hoping it would go away wasn't the best option. It reeked of a helplessness and desperation, but... I couldn't think of anything else to do. The campers, muffled laughter and whispered conversation suddenly sounded sinister. As I performed the final bed check, I kept expecting to find one camper's sleeping bag ripped to shreds or squirming as some monstrous, unnameable thing with too many legs came bursting out. Despite my fears, all twenty campers were present and accounted for. After a long day of caving, even Alex, Kyle, and Sean were already fast asleep. Unlike them, I couldn't bring myself to crawl into my sleeping bag or close my eyes. I was too afraid that I'd wake up and find myself being dragged off into the dark. There was no dawn underground, but Miriam and I had our alarms synchronized for 6 a.m. That would give the campers a total of six hours to pack up, eat, trek out of the cave, and get cleaned up before their parents arrived to pick them up. The early wake-up met with groans and complaints, but we were used to that. The important thing was to get them moving. I mean, after a breakfast of granola bars and sports drinks, we rounded everyone up for the morning head count. 18, 19, 20... 20 21. That was impossible. I thought for sure I had miscounted, but Miriam's count returned the same result. As I scanned the group for an unfamiliar face, I told Miriam to dig the roster out of her rucksack. She returned moments later angry, confused, and scared. The roster's gone. So are my spare headlamps and the extra food. It's like a bear went through my pack. I checked my own pack and found it too had been ransacked sometime during the night. Shivered. Whatever had done it would have been just inches from my head, and I hadn't even noticed it. Time was of the essence. We couldn't count on our spare lights any longer. Miriam nodded to the assembled group of 21 campers and whispered, Are there any faces you don't recognize? Anyone who stands out? It could have been the pale kid standing at the edge of the group with a blank expression on his face. His shirt buttoned up wrong, his boots unlaced. It could have been the black-haired boy with glasses who'd somehow gotten his arms and legs covered in gray-green cave mud 
could have been the skinny one with a blonde bowl cut who was chomping on his sixth granola bar like a wolf gnawing on a bone. It, it could have been any of them. In the past weeks, all those preteen faces had started to blend together. I had been so distracted by everything that had gone wrong that I was no longer sure exactly who I had come into the cave with. Campers, too, didn't seem to notice anything that was amiss, and some instinct screamed at me to keep it that way. We needed to get out of Silverload Cave, and fast. Ironically, Alex, Kyle, and Sean were the only ones I felt sure of, so I put them right behind me in the line. I knew they wouldn't like that one bit, but I figured they'd do or say something stupid to alert me if some horrible imposter came crawling across the ceiling to slit my throat. The campers were always quiet on their first morning in the cave. Usually it was just the uncanny feeling of waking up in the absolute darkness that did it. But there was something more at work this time. Even the densest of them had seen the fear and confusion on my face. They knew that something was off, and they seemed to realize for the first time that they were dependent on us to get out of there. The goofing off that we had had to deal with on the trek to Silverload Cave had been replaced by nervous jitters and whispering. I took a deep breath, forcing myself to turn back to the campers and began to let us out of Silverload Cave. One of the first things that Scottmaster Dan taught us about caving was the importance of pausing occasionally to note the landmarks behind you. Unlike the terrain above ground, a cave can seem completely different when observed from the opposite direction. Even long-time guides like Miriam sometimes experience the gut-plunging feeling of looking around at the twisting passages and realizing that nothing at all looked familiar. It hadn't happened to me, not until we began our journey back that day. As we left the main chamber behind, we reached the first sink, a bend in the creek where the water disappeared, only to reappear further along in the cave. The path should have been to the right, but... wasn't. There was only the creek, disappearing between yet another jagged stone wall. The way to the exit had disappeared. I wanted to believe that I'd just made a mistake, that, that what I was seeing was just the result of my own slowly building panic, but Miriam had noticed it too. She kept mumbling under her breath, rummaging in her rucksack for the plastic-coated map that had disappeared along with the rest of her gear. As an experienced guide, she was taking the impossible change a lot harder than I was. She knew it was wrong, and I had a nasty feeling that if she stayed in the chamber much longer, she'd shut down completely. Most caves have more than one way in or out, and Silverload was no exception. We normally led the campers via the easiest route, the one that followed the stream, but that was apparently no longer an option. The lower passage tended to flood, and even when the water subsided, it left snarls of dead leaves, wood, trash, muck that fed some of the largest insects and spiders I'd ever seen. I didn't like the odds of getting the campers through the mess, so I opted for the alternative route, through the upper galleries. I tried to swallow, but my throat was dry with cave dust. All right, campers, I grimaced. We're going to take a little detour. It was tougher than I remembered. The tunnel grew so narrow that the stone walls scraped against my shoulders. The rough ceiling so low that I occasionally felt the long, alien legs of a cave cricket as it skittered through my hair. These upper passages had a nasty slope. While crawling along them, you were constantly sliding down to the right towards a jagged black crevice that, to the best of my knowledge, had never been explored. It wasn't wide enough to fall into. Not even for the skinniest of campers, but it was unsettling. I couldn't shake the fear that it, it might suddenly begin to expand like a grinning, toothless mouth that swallows whole, or that some unspeakable horror might come slithering out of its lightless depths. I looked back at the campers, their faces flushed with effort, sweaty hair plastered to their foreheads beneath their cheap plastic helmets, and reminded myself that the unspeakable horror was already here among us. But as to what it was or what it wanted, I had no idea. Just an hour left, I reminded myself. An hour and we'd come crawling out into the sunlight, where surely everything would make more sense. It would turn out to be a misunderstanding, a joke, a, a trick of the mind, born of dark places underground. 
I was so lost in thought that it took me a moment to realize that we'd reached a dead end. Miriam and the rest of the campers piled in around me, confused by the stone bottleneck that I'd just led us into. This couldn't be happening. I I'd been here before. There was a way out. I, I would have bet my life on it. And maybe I had. One of the most nauseating feelings in caving is the flickering just before a headlamp goes out. I still had some spare batteries in my pocket, but the sudden blackness in front of me was a grim reminder that our time was limited. The campers were getting restless behind me. Some of them were cursing and warning us their parents would sue. Others were whimpering, practically begging me to tell them that things were going to be okay. I, I wish that I could, but if this didn't work, we, we wouldn't have the light or the strength to find another way out. Suddenly, Miriam sprang forward and began digging at the rock with her bare hands. As loose stones fell away around her fingers, I realized what must have happened. A rock slide had blocked the narrow passage ahead. A largish boulder had plunged into the tunnel, making it seem to have vanished completely. It took me, Miriam, and three of our strongest campers to finally pry the boulder loose. Even after the passage was cleared, the whole thing left me sick to my stomach. It was like something, and maybe even the cave itself had blocked the tunnel on purpose. I would have sworn that the final tunnel was a tighter squeeze than I remembered. Silverload Cave seemed reluctant to let us go, dragging myself through with one arm, my helmet off to ensure that my head could fit. I had the awful feeling the cave was a living thing with a will of its own, and that it had decided to crush us to death slowly. Something brushed against my face, a root. Up ahead, pale moths fluttered in the beam of my headlight. I'd been too tense to notice it, but the cave had been getting warmer. I saw it. Sunlight. We were almost free, but all I felt was worry. Why were we being allowed to leave? One by one, we clambered out into the woods. Even the campers were too tired to complain, and in the sun that filtered through the leaves, I could see the tear streaks on their cheeks. Just like Miriam and I, they were filthy, exhausted, and grateful to be alive. I nodded to Miriam as she heaved herself out behind the last camper. It was time to start counting heads again. 18, 19, 20. Miriam's eyes went wide. She shrugged and shook her head, sure that she hadn't missed anyone. Either the mystery camper had disappeared or one of the others had been replaced. It would have been so easy. All it would have taken is for the headlamps of the nearby campers to look away for a moment. Then there would have been the clatter of falling stones, a sudden movement in the dark, and then when they looked again, nothing would appear to be different. But what would have happened to the camper who'd been taken? Were they simply murdered and buried beneath the rocks, devoured by whatever monstrous thing had replaced them, or had they slipped through the wall somehow and found themselves alone in another layer of the cave, lost, hungry, and scared, their headlamp batteries running out. We were four hours late to the drop-off point. The parents and Scoutmaster Dan were fuming, but I barely registered their anger. I was too busy searching the crowd, waiting to see whether there was one camper who wouldn't be picked up or one parent searching obsessively for a child whose face they didn't see. But everyone out of our campers went home that day. After the disaster of my first cave tour, I wasn't invited back the next summer session. But I still wonder about what I experienced in Silverload Cave. Scoutmaster Dan had told us that he'd never lost a camper. But how could he be so sure? With some parents out there who had noticed a subtle and inexplicable change in their child after they returned from caving camp. The kind of change that they only dared to talk to their partner about late at night. After a few drinks, their child was hopefully asleep. He never was quite the same after he spent the night in that cave, was he? Thomas Jones was enjoying his second cup of coffee that morning 
when the door to the work cabin was suddenly flung open and a fat, florid man by the name of Pendleton marched into the room. What in all the blue blazes is going on here? he said, casting a baleful eye at Thomas and the rest of his crew. We're nearly a week over schedule. You bunch of happy assholes are sitting on your butts drinking coffee. Now wait a damn minute, Thomas said, climbing to his feet. Thomas was a big man and loomed over Pendleton. Still, he felt small at the look of the righteous anger on the other man's face. Maybe we could talk about this outside, he said, glancing around the room. It was obvious the other man was going to tear a strip out of him, but he'd rather not have it done in front of his crew. Pendleton smirked. Sure, let's talk, he said, turning his back on him and strutting arrogantly from the room. Asshole, someone muttered under their breath, but Thomas ignored them and followed after the other man, closing the door gently behind him. As soon as the door swung shut, he turned on him. You want to tell me what the hell's going on here, Jones? This demolition job was supposed to be finished last week. Then I had a call from head office telling me to get my ass down to Cornwall. No explanation, just that things had come to a screeching halt with the job barely even started. Thomas took umbrage of that. Who the hell did this guy think he was, anyway, with his ill-fitting suit and superior attitude, coming down here and embarrassing Thomas in front of his crew? Does it look like it's hardly begun? He growled to the other man, widening his arms as if to encompass the entire street with its now empty plots. We'd been busy busting our asses to hit your outrageous deadline, and everything was going according to plan until we came to that monstrosity, he said, pointing to the end of the street, at the old manor house that stood grimly overlooking the sea. Pendleton followed his gaze. I don't see a problem, he smirked. That place looks like a harsh wind could blow it down. Thomas sighed and rubbed his head, beginning to feel the first pulses of a migraine. Look, it's hard to explain, so... I'll just have to show you, okay? Pendleton shrugged, uncertain now, and not sure what the other man was getting at. Thomas took his silence for consent and walked a little ways down the street before jumping into a nearby dumpster and firing up the engine in a cloud of black diesel-smelling fumes. Watch this, Thomas yelled over the roar of the engines, driving slowly towards the old waiting mansion. Pendleton followed on foot, careful not to get any of the black smoke on his shiny suit. When Thomas came to the mansion, he did a skillful turn, so he was now facing the grounds. The hanging gates thrown open as if in some kind of dreadful welcome. You ready? he said, looking down at the other man. What is this, show and tell? Pendleton yelled back at him. Just get the hell on with it, Jones. Time is money. Thomas nodded and drove slowly forward. As soon as the front tires hit the property boundary line, the dumpster's engine suddenly cut out. Thomas knew it was no good, turned the key, cranked the engine, but nothing. The big yellow dumpster ignition had just cranked over, but never catching until at last, gave up, throwing up his hands in frustration. You see what I mean now? He said, glaring down at Pendleton. You just flooded the goddamn engine is all. Get down from there, let me try it. I was driving these things when you were still playing with your Tonka trucks. Be my guest, Thomas said, jumping down and smirking as the fat man struggled to climb into the torn leather seat. Okay, baby... Pendleton muttered, give it up for daddy. He slowly pumped the gas before turning the key, but no matter how he cursed and cudgeled, the engine simply wouldn't catch. Now put the gear shift into reverse, Thomas called up to him. Try her again. You lost your fucking mind, Pendleton snapped. The engine's dead, faulty equipment, that's all. Humor me, Thomas smiled up at him. Muttering, the other man did as he was bid grinding the gears into reverse before turning the key. Immediately, the engine roared into life and Pendleton let out a cry as he was flung backwards before slamming on the brakes. What the hell? Pendleton cursed angrily, slamming the gear forward. The big machine approached the house again in angry jerks, but as soon as the front wheels hit the threshold, the engine immediately cut out. Furious now, he grabbed for the gear stick again, but Thomas jumped aboard and covered the other man's hand with his own. It won't work, Pendleton, no matter how hard you try. Pendleton angrily shook free. 
Go get that JCB from across the street, he pointed. But Thomas shook his head wearily. We've already tried. We've tried with every machine we have. The result is always the same. Bullshit, Pendleton snapped. You're playing some kind of prank or silly game up here. Are you shitting me? Thomas snapped back, his own anger growing. You think I would risk the jobs of my men, hell, even my own job, by playing some stupid prank on a, on a suit from corporate? You watch your tone with me, Jones, the fat man said, pushing him aside and laboriously climbing back down onto the street. Thomas followed, landing nimbly beside him. Fine, I won't waste my time trying to convince you then. The keys to everything we have are hanging up in the cabin. You go to town and report back when you're finished, Thomas said, strolling angrily away. This time, it was Pendleton's time to follow. You're serious, aren't you? He said, laying a sweaty hand on Thomas's shoulder and gently turning him back around to face him. I ain't fucking with you, if that's what you're saying. No, nothing. I mean, nothing works. I have had every machine we have examined, checked for faults. They all run fine until we try to... Well, you know, he said, looking towards the slumped house solemnly. How could that be? Pendleton replied, some of the anger fading as he followed the other man's gaze. Some say the old place is haunted, Thomas chuckled nervously. But Pendleton waved that away. Yeah, 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 we all heard those old wives' tales about Lucas Van Draven and the missing people, blah, 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 bullshit. And how do you account for all this? Thomas said, his headache worsening. I don't know, Pendleton said, rubbing his chin thoughtfully. Some kind of uh, magnetic pulse, or maybe ley lines, or some kind of other crap, but I don't know. I do know one thing. Certainly eight ghosts. In fact, he said, slowly walking away, I'm going to go take a look inside, see if I can't figure this thing out. You coming? You are the foreman, after all. Thomas didn't really want to go. If he was being honest, he didn't like that old house. It had a feeling about it, like something was trying to weasel its way into your mind, stand in its shadow. It was akin to being buried alive. Still, he heard the challenge in the other man's voice. He didn't believe in ghosts and ghouls and wasn't about to let this corporate asshole show him up. Fine. Go take a look if that's what you really want. Together, the two men headed back down the street their shadows growing long behind them. The Van Draven house stood as it had for almost 200 years, overlooking the dark waters of the Atlantic Ocean. It was a lonely place, abandoned and spurned by the locals of the village and surrounding areas who had grown up listening to the ghastly tales of Lucas Van Draven, who had murdered his wife and servants. But dark rituals and things left best unspoken, found in the spider-infested bowels of that old house. Not to mention the people from outside who had tried to renovate the old place. Many had gone missing or turned up dead. Madness, murder, and suicide had soaked into the very fabric of the Van Draven house, its dark legacy haunting the area with an unimaginable dread. So, what do you think? Thomas said, as they stood on the threshold. Looks like a real shithole, Pendleton replied, taking in the overground gardens and peeling paint. As lions, he said, heading towards the entrance of the house before squatting down and tearing away the crawling ivy from the two statues. That's some kind of coat of arms? Thomas asked, almost going to his haunches, interested now despite his initial fear. Looks like it, Pendleton replied, running his blunt fingers over the engraving, which was faint but still clearly showing a clipper ship riding atop a huge wave, some kind of bird soaring overhead, a struggling fish caught up in its great talons. Chiseled underneath, in stark relief, was one word. Van Draven. Charming, Pendleton muttered, standing and wiping the mud and leaves from his trouser leg. All right, let's take a look inside. I already tried that. The old place is locked. Unless you want to crawl through that, he said, 
pointing to one of the many shattered windows where jagged glass shined wickedly in the fading light. No need, Pendleton replied loftily. I just so happen to have the key, he said, reaching into his jacket pocket and pulling out a large bunch of keys attached to a metal ring. How the hell did you get those? When one buys a property, or in this case a whole street, one gets everything that comes with it, including the keys, not that they come cheap. The parish council asked an absurd amount for a place already half abandoned and falling into disrepair. The entire street was almost completely empty, and those who remained were easily bought off. Apparently they weren't fond of living too close to this old relic, he said, slapping one of the faded pillars. Thomas winced at that. Pendleton laughed at the look on his face. Don't worry, Jones, it won't bite you, he said, slapping one meaty hand against the old house again, but suddenly he hissed in pain, the palm of his hand bleeding. God damn it, he said, picking a piece of masonry from his hand. Fucking place should have been condemned years ago. Here, Thomas said, handing him a grease-stained bandana from his coverall pocket. Thanks, the other man replied, looking for a clean spot before quickly wrapping up the still bleeding wound. Look, maybe you should go clean that up. We, we can always come back tomorrow, and didn't I tell you? Time is money, Jones, he said, selecting a large black pitted key and ramming it home into the lock. Now let's go take a look before it gets too dark. I doubt very much the electricity is still on in this place. Fine. Lead the way. Not sure what you're hoping to find, but it's your party. Pendleton ignored that, and together... The two men stepped inside. The Van Draven house had once been a magnificent mansion built for his new bride. Lucas Van Draven had spared no expense. The once varnished floorboards had gleamed underfoot, illuminated by crystal chandeliers imported from Paris, France. The sturdy walls had been covered in fine, velvet-like wallpaper, and the house had been filled with all manner of antiques and wonders from Lucas's many travels abroad. But that had been many years ago. Now those same floorboards were warped and covered in grit and dust from the crumbling walls. The once massive chandelier that warmly illuminated the main entrance lay dark and broken. The many cracked crystals hanging like the fallen tears of those who had succumbed to the madness within. Jesus, Pendleton said, wrinkling his nose. Damn place stinks. The hell is that smell? Mold, damp, decay, Thomas replied. We're probably taking years off our lives by breathing the damn place in. Still, he wasn't convinced. There was another smell that seemed to lay just beneath. A dark, rotting smell that seemed to stick to the inside of your nose and slime the back of your throat. I can see why the locals think this place is haunted, Pendleton said, scraping his shiny shoe tip through the broken plaster and small pieces of splintered wood. Look there, Thomas said, heading through a nearby hanging door into what looked like it must have been a study or a small library. Look at this. Damn thing must be over a hundred years old, maybe more, he said running his hand over the desk's varnished sides. Probably older, Pendleton said. Surprised it hasn't been removed. Not in bad condition. Well, not compared to the rest of the house. You think it belonged to him? This, um, Lucas Van Draven fella? Pendleton shrugged. Who cares? Come on, let's take a look around. Suddenly, there was a crash from upstairs, and a door slammed somewhere in the back of the house. Both men stared at each other. The air around them suddenly plummeted, becoming frigid, and Thomas was sure he could see Pendleton's breath just before the other man bolted, heading straight for the front door. Thomas hot on his heels. For a moment, Thomas was sure they would find the door shut and locked tight against them, but it was just as they left it, and both men bolted through, not stopping or slowing down until they reached the other side of the street. Both doubled over, breathing heavily. Oh, holy shit, what was that? Thomas gasped. Probably just the wind. Pendleton said. Either way, it scared the living hell out of me. You and me both. Thomas chuckled, feeling like a fool. Okay, okay. Pendleton straightened. I don't give a shit. 
if that place is haunted or not. It's coming down one way or another. I'm heading back to Manchester now tonight. I'll send you a crane with a wrecking ball attached. The damn thing won't even have a chance to get close to the property. We just extend the crane arms, swing away, and down that happy asshole comes. With the paperwork and everything, it should be with you in a few days at the most. All right, Thomas agreed. Sounds like a plan. Sure, the boys would like a few days off to go check out the local girls. Sleeping in a metal cabin on a cot bed and working around the clock has made them a bit testy. A few drinks and a lark will do some good. Pendleton waved that away. Whatever, Jones, just make sure the equipment arrives and you and your boys are ready to go. I want this shit taken care of ASAP. Remember, time is money, Thomas cut in. Yeah, I, I got it. Then there should be no problems then, should there? Pendleton called over his shoulder as he walked away. Thomas said nothing. His eyes had returned to the Van Draven house as he realized once again he had been swallowed by its shadow. Thomas had left the rest of his crew to their debauchery and walked through the night-shrouded village. It was winter in Mavagesi, and the summer people had once again left the denizens of the village to their own devices. Turning his collar against the cold and damp, he noticed a flickering through a nearby pub window and smiled, peering through the window at the roaring fire inside, his frigid breath pluming against the glass. The place looked quiet and cozy. He looked up at the creaking sign that gently blew in the night breeze. The sign read, The Lantern. Okay, he said. Just one more for the road than off the bed. That said, he stepped inside, happy for the warmth and the fire's comforting glow before sauntering over to the bar and ordering a pint and a whiskey chaser. Taking his drinks, he sat by the fire, wishing for the good old days when you could still smoke inside instead of having to freeze your butt off in the middle of the street like some fucking pariah. He had just taken the foam off his drink when a small pudgy man with round John Lennon glasses appeared out of nowhere. He had a drink in one hand and what looked like a file stuffed with papers tucked firmly under the other. Funny enough, the owlish looking man seemed somewhat familiar to Thomas, but couldn't quite place him. When the man didn't speak, Thomas sighed, frustrated by the interruption. Can I help you with something? He said, trying to hide the annoyance from his voice. As a matter of fact, you can, the man smiled, taking Thomas's words as an invitation to sit. You're working up on Beach Road, I believe, clearing out those old houses up there. When Thomas didn't reply, he carried on excitedly. Yes, you've torn them all down, but not the Van Draven house, he said, his voice dropping to a conspirator's whisper. Seems like you're having some problems with that machinery of yours. Suddenly, Thomas could place the man. You've been hanging around by the coastal path, haven't you, up by that old house? The other man shrugged. The public footpath, I'm not trespassing, he added quickly. That's right, you ain't trespassing, Thomas repeated. But spying on our progress, perhaps? The other man laughed, <laughs> more like taking a vested interest. Look, he said, suddenly growing somber. My name's Harry Unsworth, from the University of Falmouth. Let me buy you another drink. We can talk. Hell, I may even be able to help you figure out what's going on up there. I have become something of an expert on the Van Draven house over the years. Maybe give you a little history on the old place. It's cold outside. We have a nice roaring fire. One hell of a night for a ghost story. No man likes to drink alone. Thomas smiled at this. Interested now, in spite of himself... Besides, the man had a certain open charm, and a free drink was a free drink after all. Okay, he said, smiling. Mine's a whiskey. A double, actually. A few moments later, Harry returned with the drinks, took off his jacket, and seated himself more comfortably across from Thomas, his coffee-stained file between them. This, he said, tapping the file, is years of research and history on the incidents and the happenings that have taken place inside that house the last case being less than five years ago. And a bunch of bloggers went up there and tried to stay the night. They had a YouTube channel, all ghost seekers. Two of them were found dead inside. The other one burned up on the front lawn. 
Now, the local police called it a murder-suicide. Slam the case closed, just like they do every time the Van Draven house takes another victim. Thomas took a long drink, then nervously wiped at his mouth. Talk like the damn place is alive or something. Unsworth shrugged. Maybe it is. What is it you said you do again at the university of yours? Thomas said, not liking the other man's reply. Unsworth laughed. I'm a history teacher. You could say uh, parapsychology is a sideline of mine. No, I'm not crazy. That house has a checkered past. Here, he said, not waiting for a reply, but opening his file. The house was first built by Lucas Van Draven in 1836 on the hilltop overlooking the village. There was some controversy over the location as a certain set of stone rings going all the way back into antiquity had been uprooted and the stone used in the very foundation of the house. Then there were the two men killed whilst the house was under construction. One fell from scaffolding, another crushed by falling masonry. Lucas paid off the grieving widows, moved right in with his wife, Elizabeth, her maid, Matilda, and Lucas's manservant, Stevens. By November of the next year, all were found dead, except Lucas, who threw himself from the cliffside. <laughs> Rumor has it, he was found with some abomination still clung to him, even in death. There was also talk of dark rituals, obscene rites that were held to some infernal god in the dark bowels of that place. Jesus, Thomas replied, taking a long hard pull from his pint and wishing desperately for a cigarette. Ah, oh, that's only the tip of the iceberg. Unsworth continued eagerly. The house lay abandoned for nearly 70 years until a retired shipbuilder from Manchester moved in with his dreams of renovations. <laughs> he was found some time later, hanging from the rafters of what had once been Lucas Van Draven's study. Now it was the turn of the Jonas family who went missing, their belongings still inside, but the family itself gone, just like that. He snapped his fingers for emphasis. Thirty years later... The Dorchesters, found in the basement, their bodies found torn, twisted, as if by some terrible force. And for a time, the house lay empty, holding its dark secrets until 2010, when the Maloneys moved in. A husband, a wife, two little girls. A father was found in the basement, his family chopped to little pieces, scattered around him. The local constable that went to investigate was later found hanging from the ceiling beams in an upstairs bedroom. Then, there was the two town drunks who tried to break into Lucas Van Draven's tomb. <laughs> Perhaps was looking for treasure. One was never seen again. The other, the raving lunatic. <laughs> I could go on. Please don't, Thomas said, holding up a restraining hand, which seemed to tremble ever so slightly. I get the point. I could see why many believe the place is cursed or haunted. But I'm a practical kind of guy, and I just don't believe in ghosts and ghoulies. What? The other man asked, incredulously. How do you explain all the mysterious deaths and your machines? The hell do you think's going on in there? Thomas shrugged, throwing tired of the whole thing. I have no idea. But I doubt very much the ghost of Lucas Van Draven is fucking with me and my fuel lines. Unsworth didn't reply, but finished up his drink before leaning against the table towards the other man. In a way, it's good you don't believe. I have to admit, I didn't run into you tonight by chance. I have, shall we say, a proposition for you. Sorry? Thomas smirked. <laughs> but, uh, you're not my type. Unsworth ignored that. I want to go into that house. I have certain equipment with me. I, I want to go inside only briefly, you understand? Just to take a few readings and perhaps do a little recording. Thomas's eyes narrowed. So, that's it. You want me to get you inside, and why would you want to go in there? You so obviously believe the place is cursed or haunted or whatever the hell it is. You believe. So why? You know, why would you want to go in there? <laughs> because, Unsworth replied, just happy that Thomas hadn't walked out on him yet. Because if, if I can prove it, if I can get a good reading or catch something on camera, I can finally get the university to take me seriously. Maybe even give me funding to study the paranormal right there on campus. Well, I hate to rain on your parade, Thomas said, 
starting to stand. But I ain't going to be helping you break into that old house. It's more than my job is worth. A thousand pound cash, Hemsworth said, slapping a stuffed envelope onto the table between them. A thousand pounds right now, just for ten minutes, to just take a walk around and take a couple of reading. Thomas slowly sat back down. You're crazy, he said, eyeing the stuffed envelope. Look, Unsworth said, your crew are all down here pissing it up, chasing the village girls, and locals don't go anywhere near the place. Nobody will see us, and you're up a grand, tax-free, for ten minutes of your time. Seeing Thomas needed a little more convincing, he reached into his pocket again and slapped another stuffed envelope on the table. It's another thousand. I don't ask for more. I'm tapped out. Jesus, you're crazy, Thomas said. Still, he reached across the table and stuffed both envelopes quickly into his jacket pocket. Ten minutes, he said as both men climbed to their feet. You have ten minutes, and you're done. Sure. Sure, Unsworth said, scrambling into his jacket. And don't worry, what could possibly go wrong? It had taken Unsworth ten minutes to nip back into his B&B &B and gather up his equipment. After that, both men had headed up the hill, neither talking much, Thomas smoking one cigarette after another. He knew he was doing a stupid thing, but two grand was two grand, and the chances of being caught inside was little to none. Still, he didn't cherish the thought of going back into that old place, especially after the horror story he had been subjected to. Even if you didn't believe in all that supernatural crap, it was enough to give you the goddamn heebie-jeebies. However, it wasn't every day you got to earn two grand for ten minutes. He was dragged out of his own pondering by an excited squeal from Unsworth, and looked up surprised to see that they had already arrived. Okay, okay, Hemsworth said, quickly crossing the road and unzipping his jacket, revealing an expensive-looking camera that hung around his neck. Just a quick snap from the outside, and we can head on in. Thomas looked nervously about as the camera's flash cut through the surrounding darkness. Hurry the hell up, will ya? he hissed. Okay, okay, let's go, Unsworth said, trotting back against the street, his camera banging hollowly against his chest. The hell am I doing? Thomas muttered under his breath as he led the way, pushing past the rust covered gates into the Van Draven grounds. The smaller man hot on his heels. Suddenly, he was blinded by another flash as Unsworth snapped another photo of the crumbling lions that proudly held the coat of arms of Van Draven. Cut that shit out! He angrily rounded on the other man. You take one more fucking picture before we can get inside, and the whole goddamn thing is off. Sure, sure thing, Unsworth said, quickly stuffing his camera away. Still, he buzzed with an excited energy that set Thomas's teeth on edge. Okay, Thomas said, we're going in through the back door. The thing is all rotted out. It should only take a quick shove and we're in. After that, you got ten minutes, not a second longer. Understood? The other man nodded eagerly. Let's go. The back of the Van Draven house was much like the front, overgrown with clingy ivy. The once marvel flagstaffs covered with centuries of fallen leaves. The wind whistled through the rotting eaves, and long-dead trees creaked and groaned in the stark winter winds, as if horrified to be trapped in such a hellish landscape. From behind them came a sudden loud boom, and both men spun around, their hearts beating hard in their chests, but it was only the lid of an old coal bin banging up and down in the growing wind. <laughs> Jesus, Ensworth laughed nervously. This place is one crazy creep show. He could say that again, Thomas replied, his wet tongue sliding over his dry lips. You sure you want to go in there? Yes, Unsworth replied. You're goddamn right I do. I've been waiting for something like this all my life. I wouldn't be stopped now just because of a stiff breeze. The little man's courage bolstered some of Thomas's own. All right, then. Let's get it done, he said, approaching the sagging back door and laying his shoulder against it gently before pushing hard with his legs. Immediately, the rotting door gave way. Thomas let out a cry of alarm. Unsworth's quick reaction stopped him from taking a nasty fall as the other man grabbed a handful of his jacket. Thanks, Thomas said. That was easier than expected. I guess the house wants us to come in. The comment was supposed to be a throwaway remark. 
Yet it hung heavily between the two men until Unsworth took a flashlight from the inside of his jacket and gently pushed past, illuminating the interior within. They were standing in a large kitchen, or what was left of one at least. In the middle of the room sat a large wooden chopping block, splintered and gouged. Attached to a nearby wall was a large rusting sink from which fat droplets of filth-colored water dripped onto its chipped, sagging surface. Broken tiles crunched beneath their feet, and shelves with old, bulging, rusty tins cast deranged shadows across the peeling walls. Thomas swallowed hard and glanced at his watch. Ten minutes. Ten minutes, and we're out of here. Unsworth didn't answer, but moved more fully into the room, snapping the occasional picture, his flashlight illuminating the decay and stark relief. When he was done, he pushed through the sagging door and into a long hallway. Thomas stayed close behind him. It's cold, Unsworth muttered. You feel that? He sat over his shoulder. Yeah, Thomas replied. What do you expect? It's the middle of winter. Unsworth didn't reply, but took a thermometer from a small bag he was carrying and quickly recorded the temperature. We need to go that way, he said, pointing to the end of the hall. That's Lucas Van Draven's study. If anything's going to happen, it will be in there. I doubt it, Thomas sighed. Still, he was eager to leave the place. There was something in the air, a kind of watchfulness. He quickly glanced at his watch. Eight minutes. Unsworth turned and continued down the hall, his flashlight cutting through the waiting darkness until at last they reached the study room. With its ornate desk and rotting books that perfumed the air with the smell of rot and mildew, Unsworth stepped inside. Thomas was about to follow when a sudden hiss came from behind. With a cry, he swung around, flashlight trembling. Just then, the door between the men slammed shut. On the other side came a cry of alarm as Unsworth pounded on the door, frantically trying to get out. Thomas stood there frozen as a naked woman stepped out of the darkness. Two knitting needles sticking obscenely from her throat, blood oozing down her body. In her outstretched arms, she carried some kind of obscene creature that mewled and thrashed as if in terrible pain, its own rancid blood running down her arms. Through bloody teeth, she grinned at him. Oh, Lucas, she crooned. Oh, Lucas, what have you done? What have you done to our son? With an angry hiss, she flung the abomination at him, and with a cry, he threw up his arms, staggering backwards, landing heavily against the front door with a screech of fear. He tried to beat the creature away, but there was nothing there. The woman had completely vanished, and the house was deathly silent. Quickly, he scrambled to his feet. Remembering Unsworth, he grabbed for the study door, which opened easily to his touch. What he saw there almost broke his mind, and he took a step away, whimpering. Unsworth lay across the large, ornate desk. Two old-fashioned quill pens had been driven into his eyes, and his throat was a bloody ruin. From beside his body, a little girl's face suddenly appeared. She grinned at him slyly from her bloody mouth. Hey, mister, she giggled. You see my sissy? She's around here someplace. A cold hand suddenly fell against his shoulder, and with a scream he turned and looked into the rotting face of Lucas Van Draven. In his terror, he forgot the little girl and staggered back into the room. You should not have come. Lucas groaned, maggots squirming in his hair. This place is damned. We are damned. We're trapped here. This place feeds upon our souls. It will feed upon you, too. You will spend an eternity of torment trapped in this place. No! Lucas cried, swinging his arms at the rotting corpse. But his hand passed through the thin air, and he ran, heading for the front door. But of course, finding it locked. This way, lover. A voice called from down the hall. A pale, bloody arm broke through the darkness, beckoning to him. The nails cracked and bloody. 
With a cry, he headed up the old winding staircase, desperate to escape the madness below. His mind started to fracture as the house came alive all around him. He could hear screams and gibbering. Faces appeared out of the darkness, their faces infused with torment and terror. With a cry, he flung himself into the first room he came to and slammed the door closed behind him. Inside, there was nothing but an old rusting cot and a large ornate wardrobe that now creaked open. It won't do any good to run away. A child's voice seeped from within. I hid right here. Right here, and Daddy found me. Always. The door slowly creaked open, and a dead boy staggered out. His eyes rolled white, his skin slate gray. A large carving knife jutted from his chest. His bloody Thomas the Tank Engine pajamas clung to his wasted body as he slouched his way towards Thomas. You should stay a while, <laughs> he giggled. It's so beautifully dark here. The door he had escaped through was shaking now, and he could hear screams of anguish as dark, rotting blood seeped towards him. With a scream of madness, he flung himself against the room and hit the boarded-up window, which instantly gave under his weight, and blessingly, he was falling. Splinters of wood and shards of glass all about him. As he turned and twisted in midair, he didn't see the rusting fence spikes that burst through his back and chest, impaling him like a bug on a needle. The last thing Thomas Jones saw... As the light faded from his eyes, it was a multitude of faces. The windows of the house were filled with them, their hungry, grasping hands beckoning him to join them. Inside the Van Draven house, time did not stand still. It twisted and undulated. Heavy footsteps echoed down the hallways, a scream of despair, followed by breaking glass drifted from the kitchen. Somewhere in the bowels of the house, a child cried out in fear, and a woman's moans and sighs drifted down the peeling halls. In the parlor, a grandfather clock chimed softly, as it had done for many years, and would continue to do so for many more. And for now, the evil inside slept, and the house waited and waited and waited. Hey there, kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and before we get started on tonight's story, I'm going to let you know about Cabinet of Fever Dreams. Cabinet of Fever Dreams is a podcast on Spotify. Mike, I think, has some of the more creative stories, and especially some really, really outlandish ones. I hope all of you guys can check out the podcast, give it a quick subscribe, you know, along with any of your other favorite podcasts that you might have here, you know what I'm saying? All these great places for horror. Link to the podcast will be in the description down below. And now, on to tonight's story. Please excuse me if I misspeak anything, okay? Because even as I write these words, I'm, I'm waving to the man who sits among the stars. A new moon will come soon, and I gotta get my waving in. Be impolite not to. For those of you that don't know of me, I work in an observatory specializing in comprehensive galactic surveys by night and... By day, I inform the lovely, faceless chorus on the internet about various celestial phenomena. Planetary transits, meteor showers, eclipses, it's been an absolute pleasure to share and discuss these beautiful sights with you all. Tonight, however, I... I have something to show you that will make all of our previous talks seem quaint. Tonight I want to show you the friendly man on the moon. I discovered the man about a month ago. At the time, I was involved in some extensive survey work on the Andromeda Galaxy, but by accident, or perhaps by boredom, the telescope ended up pointing towards the moon. Being the only one on the premises and not feeling particularly productive, I took a break from work. Now, the moon at Gibeus is beautiful that night for a 
For a while, I just enjoyed the visage of the celestial body and let my mind drift to thoughts of how humankind thought of it a thousand years prior. But then... But then, a particular sight struck my attention. Even though the equipment was at its maximum capacity, the moon was growing closer. At first, the magnification was negligible. I ascribed it to eye strain, perhaps exhaustion from the long hours. The magnification, however, did not cease. On the contrary, it, it sped up. With worrying quickness, I found myself gazing upon individual craters and rock formations. At first, I feared a psychotic breakdown or a poisoning of my coffee, but before panic could truly reach my heart, I was calmed. See, on, on the moon, I saw a human silhouette. He was sitting in a chair, dressed all in white, with a charming little bowler cap on. With my sight enhanced, I could see his bushy mustache pleasant smile. He was looking at me. He was waving at me. Under normal circumstances, I would have been terrified of the situation. It, it, it defied all logic. But that smile calmed me, so... At first, I was so entranced by the man on the moon that I lost all awareness of my body. It was, it was only after, perhaps, the half an hour that I realized my hand was raised. I found myself waving back to the man on the moon. At the realization of the movement of my hand, another great wave of comfort washed through me. Something about waving to the man on the moon felt inherently blissful as if my body was finally serving a purpose for which it had been designed. For the whole night, I waved at the man on the moon and, and eschewed all work. For the whole night, my soul was drenched in bliss, and, and when the sun rose and the moon faded from sight, my heart flooded with a profound sadness. On the drive back home, I nearly hit a cyclist, for I was so distraught. My soul ached to wave to the man on the moon once more. Sleep came with great difficulty that day. When my eyes did finally close, I dreamt dreams of an empty sky. When I awoke, I was even more distressed. My longing to wave at the man on the moon had passed somewhat. But sobered by sleep, I found myself petrified by his very existence. Every explanation for the previous night's events was more worrying than the last. I, I once again considered a psychotic break, or drugs, or some terrible fever dream as being responsible for my visions. The thought of a man dressed in white sitting on a wooden chair on the surface of the moon? That was, that was the hardest thought to consider, yet... When I came back to work the following night, I, I, I wasted no time looking for him. Quickly, I found him. Quickly, I could see his pleasant smile. My heart filled with joy once more. Whatever worries I had about my sanity or the possibility of survival on the moon, it, it faded away with the mental fog. Seeing the man on the moon and knowing that I was seeing myself filled me with a sort of zeal that I, I had never felt before. That night, many nights after, I waved at the man on the moon for as long as the sun would allow. When the moon faded from the sky, I was once again distraught. It was deeply unpleasant to have to part with the man on the moon, yet I found myself steadier than the morning prior. The promise of being seen by him again, it all kept me sane. When I woke, much like the evening prior, I found myself with concerns. 
troubling thoughts about my sanity and the existence of the sharply dressed man on the moon gave me pause. Yet the closer I got to the observation, the calmer I got. By the time I was handed the telescope, all my worries seemed wholly abstract. All my questions were silenced by the sublime sight. Night after night, the man on the moon greeted me. Night after night, I greeted him back. As the moon waned, the friendly man traveled along its surface, always positioning himself to be at the center of the light. Always positioning himself to be easily seen, to be easily found. There were nights when I was not alone in the observatory, yet I was always the most senior member of staff. If anyone had asked, questioned, about why I was waving at the moon instead of tending to my usual survey duties, I simply told them to mind their own business. My position at the observatory kept the outside world from seeping into my newfound friendship. Yet when the moon went dark, my fortunes changed. I had felt somewhat nervous the night prior when I, only a sliver of the crescent was visible. The thought of the man on the moon being lost in the shadows, swallowed up by the darkness, invisible to me, it, it made my skin crawl with discomfort. The moment my sight was pulled towards the small sliver of light, towards him and his little wooden chair, all those worries would always dissipate. I convinced myself that the man would still be there, even in the new moon. I convinced myself that I would never go a night without seeing him. I was wrong. When I arrived at the observatory the following day, I was not alone, and my outburst didn't go unnoticed. When I found the moon extinguished and the telescope not working beyond the laws of physics, I fell into a deep panic. I'm not ashamed to say that I... I wept. I'm only ashamed that I was unable to keep the man on the moon a secret from my co-workers. Upon the urging of my colleagues, I explained to them my predicament. Not a single sympathetic soul arose from the group. Instead of, of support, I was recommended a visit to the hospital, and when I rejected and insisted the telescope stay pointed at the moon, my superior was contacted. Unceremoniously, I was sent home. I didn't argue with my colleagues, not for an extended period of time at any rate. I quickly drove home and dug out my private telescope out of storage. Before, I was a professional. I was a hobbyist. See, the telescope I had nurtured my passion for the skies on was definitely weaker than the one at the observatory. But I hoped that perhaps I could catch the airs of that unnatural magnification the man on the moon regularly provided. With the skies dark, they, they were clearer the perfect night for stargazing, yet it was a more terrible night for me. I waved at the dark sky, but saw no bliss. Frustrated and angry, and with my eyes red with sorrow, I exiled myself to my bed, and I slept. For three days, I existed on little food or water. To pass the moonless nights, I slept. I slept and I, I dreamt of dark skies with all the stars extinguished. The vapors of my mind brought forth visions of a cold, desolate cosmos barren of any friendly strangers. I tried to wholeheartedly reject such a reality, but each time I woke in a cold sweat, I found myself less certain of the future. On one of those dark days, my superior contacted me and suggested that we meet. I was in no state to speak about my work. I was in no state to meet anyone. There was only one person which I longed to see. On the fourth night of my torment, my wish was granted. In that sliver of light, I found him once more. Though my hobbyist telescope possessed a fraction of the magnification of the observatory, the man on the moon twisted the laws of physics as he always did. The thin slice of the moon swiftly consumed all of my viewfinder. Within minutes, I could see the man on the moon. He was, he was waving at me again. 
This time with both hands. He was jumping with joy. Such was the friendly man's joy that he nearly lost his bowler hat floating in the light gravity of his home. It was only once his feet were back on the moon rock that he tempered his emotions to his usual polite wave. I wept. I wept with utter bliss at the sight of the man on the moon. My, my viewfinder filled with happy tears, yet my view never got obscured. Beyond the tears, beyond the telescope itself, my eyes were capable seeing that which God ordained. I spent the whole first night with my eyes bulged into the viewfinder. Much of the second night was spent in a similar joy, yet when I found myself lightheaded with thirst and decided to take a quick break for water, I... I made a peculiar discovery. On my way back from the kitchen, as I, as I spared a glance to the moon, it grew closer. That night I was far too eager to return to the telescope, but as the days passed and the home of the friendly man grew fuller with light, my discovery started to seem more certain. I no longer needed a telescope. My naked eyes, with enough focus, could see the man just fine. Staring at the moon caused me great strain, and the slow shifting in my sight felt deeply unnatural. Yet when I, when I saw the man on the moon with my naked eyes, my soul rose to such heights of satisfaction that all the pain seemed irrelevant. Ever since the full moon, I've been waving to the man without the aid of a telescope. We spent night after night waving at each other, and I... I've never felt more alive. To blink in his presence is to suffer in longing. To witness the sunrise is to die, only to be reborn in the light of the new moon. Discovering the man on the moon is the single greatest thing I have ever witnessed in the sky. And now, with the new moon approaching, I'd like to share this discovery with you. Tonight, I want you to adjust your telescopes, the glowing moon. I, I want you to see him, too. I want you to, I want you to wave to him, too. I, I want you to experience the sheer joy of being seen by him. I want you to wave to the friendly man and experience his love. And then, then when the new moon rises and we all are left in the dark, we can, we can talk about how much we miss him in this faceless corner of the internet. We can all can all grieve together until we're delivered from suffering in his return. August 4th, 2022. Today I woke up to the news that an old childhood friend of mine had suddenly passed away. I can't believe it. We were so close when we were younger, and I feel like a part of my life is now missing. I feel so helpless, like I can't do anything to bring him back. I feel so sad, and it feels like my heart's heavy. I can't help but think about all the fun times we had together growing up. All of our adventures, our secrets, even our arguments. I miss him so much, and I can't believe he's gone. I'm struggling to cope with the news, and it's hard to stay focused on anything else. I hope that writing in this journal will help me process my emotions and come to terms with what's happened. I know that my friend will want me to remember the good times and continue to live life to the fullest. August 16th, 2022. I attended the funeral of my childhood friend, and I was overwhelmed with grief. As I looked around at everyone else in the room, I could feel the sadness in the air. The service was beautiful. The pastor said some kind words about my friend that made me feel better. After the service, I went back to my friend's parents' house and spent some time with them. I was reminded of all the fun times we had together growing up never imagined that I'd be saying goodbye to my friends so soon. As I sat with my friend's parents, we reminisced about all the memories we shared. 
At the end of the visit, his parents gave me some old personal items that belonged to my friend. I was surprised to find a stack of old discs containing some Doom file backups. It was an emotional moment, but I'm grateful to have these items to remember my friend by. When I get home, I'll go through some of his old artwork and see what I can recover from the discs. August 18th, 2022. I spent some time looking through my friend's sketchbook, just in case there was something important in there. I had no idea what to expect, but I was definitely not prepared for the strange artwork that I found inside. The sketches were mostly abstract and dark, lots of imagery depicting death, sadness, despair. As I flipped through the pages, the artwork seemed to get increasingly darker, and I began to feel a sense of dread. I decided that I had seen enough and closed the book, feeling a little bit shaken. After that, I decided to try and take my mind off things and do some Amazon shopping. I need a USB 3.5 inch floppy drive if I'm going to try and recover some of these old files. Lord knows whether anything can be retrieved from these discs. They're nearly 20 years old. Fingers crossed. August 20th, 2022. My package finally arrived in the mail, so I spent the day going through the old floppy disks. I plugged it in and started to play around with it. I was surprised to find that I could actually recover data from old floppy disks. I found some old files from my high school days that I thought were long gone, but here they were. My friend and I used to make Doom maps in high school. I was, I was excited to find them again. But then I stumbled across a map I had never seen before. It was a map of my friend's house. I was so surprised to learn that he had been working on this map in secret. Playing this map made me realize that the best way to honor our friendship is to clean up his work and release it to the public. We never made any of our Doom stuff available to the others. I guess we were just young, we were intimidated by the great work being produced by the community, but I'm impressed with the quality of what's currently here in his map. I think it's you know, a fitting tribute to clean it up for others to enjoy. August 25th, 2022. I spent this morning doing something I haven't done in years. Browse Doom World for the most recent Doom editing tools. And I was surprised how easy and accessible the new tools were compared to what I had used back in the mid 2000s. I ended up downloading Ultimate Doom Builder and Slade, both of which proved to be incredibly useful. Ultimate Doom Builder made mapping incredibly easy and straightforward. I was able to quickly create a basic map without much trouble. And I'm excited to see what I can achieve with a bit more practice. Slade was also much better at managing resources than trying to use WinText, which I remember using back in the day. I feel pretty comfortable now that I can finish my friend's map, maybe add some new features to spruce it up as well. August 29th, 2022. I had the strangest dream last night about my childhood friend who recently passed away. We were playing Legos in his basement like we used to do as kids. And when I turned around, he was gone. The house was empty and silent. Everything was so quiet and still. I started to smell smoke and hear screams from upstairs. I ran upstairs, and when I got there, the house was just a burned frame. Smoke was getting thicker and thicker, and I could barely see or breathe. I searched for my friend, but I couldn't find him anywhere. I couldn't see anything. I started to panic, and then I found myself in the fog. I was alone, but I could hear low growls in the distance. When I woke up, I wished so badly that it was all just a dream, but I knew deep down... It was real. I just miss my friend so much, and it's hard to think that he's gone. There's nothing worse than letting your mind dwell on something. After a while, it starts to consume you. Just now, I decided to order a replacement set of smoke detectors with CO2 sensors, you know. September 2nd, 2022. 
Today I made a post on Doom World showing off my friend's map. There's more to do on the map, but hopefully this is the encouragement that I need to finish the map and push it out for release. I thought it would be a simple project, but the more I learn about the new UDMF features, the more things that I've added to make it, you know, more interesting. I want the project to maintain the original aesthetic my friend was going for, but I'm trying to find the fine line between the original vanilla map and a cleaned up release that feels a little less 90s. October 3rd, 2022. October already. I'm super busy with work, so I haven't had time to work on the map. I did, however, go back and look through the sketchbook again and started scanning some of them into the computer for posterity. As I scrolled through the drawings, I could see that my friend had taken a dark turn. Each sketch seemed more unhinged and disturbing than the last. I felt a chill of worry run down my spine as I realized my friend's mental health might have been in a very fragile state. October 8th, 2022. Today was a long day at work, but I was really looking forward to coming home and getting some mapping in. I decided to order a pizza first, so I called up my favorite pizza place and placed my order. It felt so good to be able to relax and enjoy some good food. Once the pizza arrived, I set it aside and got to work on my Doom map. I've been working on it for a while now, and I'm making good progress. I'm determined to make my friend proud. I spent the next few hours tweaking and refining the map, and it felt really good to mess with some of the UDMF features. It's fun to align floors without having to draw new textures. Eventually, after a few hours, I decided to take a break, have some of that pizza I ordered earlier. After dinner, I went back to work on my map, making some more tweaks and finishing up some of the details. I can't wait to release it. I think people are going to love all the Doom cute elements in the map. October 13th, 2022. I know that sharing is a big part of the Doom community, but... A small part of me doesn't want people to make modifications of this map, mostly because I feel like this is a tribute and just a, a vessel for my feelings and emotions. You know, some, someone else making changes would feel inappropriate. But more importantly, I feel like something wants me to be the one to work on it. I can't explain it, but when I reached out to ZDoom Discord members for help, it seemed like something didn't want me to upload it for others to work on. I mean, it sounds stupid, because I ended up uploading a copy, but for a moment, I felt compelled to keep it for myself. Fortunately, my post on Doomworld is received well, and it, it seems most people aren't bothered by the idea that an author doesn't want to make their map available for modifications. November 4th, 2022. I had an incredibly vivid dream last night. This has been happening for several weeks now, so I feel like I should start documenting them. I'll do my best to recall the events of my dream. I awoke in a cold sweat, my heart was pounding in my ears, I felt a chill run down my spine, and I knew something was wrong. I lay in bed too afraid to move, when I heard a faint, ghostly cry coming from the attic. I heard the sound before, but this time it was louder and more insistent. I tried to ignore it, telling myself it was just my imagination, but the more I tried to push it away, the louder it became. I had no choice but to investigate. I got out of bed and slowly crept up the stairs to the attic, my heart pounding so hard I thought that it would burst. As I entered the attic, I noticed a trail of children's toys leading out the window. I followed the trail, feeling a strange compulsion to do so. The trail led me to an abandoned daycare center near the edge of town. I stayed back, afraid to enter, but I couldn't help but feel drawn to the place. I knew something was waiting for me inside, something dark and dangerous. I took a deep breath and stepped inside. The place was dark and silent, but as I walked around, I noticed the walls were covered in eerie drawings of children, babies. Then I heard the sound of a baby crying again, coming from the back of the room. I followed the sound, and when I reached the back of the room, I saw a crib with a stillborn baby inside. I felt a chill run down my spine as I realized what was haunting me. The stillborn baby was the one in the attic. I backed away slowly, my heart pounding in my ears. 
I knew I had to leave this place, and I quickly ran out the door, never looking back. November 13th, 2022. It's been a long day, and I'm exhausted. I had every intention of getting some rest earlier today, but here I am, still wide awake and struggling to keep my eyes open. I can't help but feel like I'm forgetting something, but I can't put my finger on it. I had so much planned for today. Did I? I'm trying to remember what I did yesterday, but it's all a blur. Was I working on the Doom map? I feel like I must have been, but I can't remember adding any new geometry or details. And all the new scripts seem completely foreign to me. I don't remember writing them. So frustrated. I'm starting to get really worried that maybe this insomnia is making me crazy. It's late now, and I'm determined to get some proper sleep tonight. Hopefully I can make some sense of all this in the morning. November 23, 2022. I was actually able to get some sleep last night. However, I continue having these vivid, cryptic dreams. And they keep feeling more personal and unsettling. I'm starting to prefer the tiresome days to my dreams. I was dreaming about taking a nice hot bath. I felt myself sinking deeper and deeper into the warm water until I couldn't breathe. I tried to scream, but no sounds escaped my lips. I was drowning in my own bathtub. And suddenly, I felt a jolt, as if I had been pulled out of the water, and when I opened my eyes, I found myself in a subterranean cave, illuminated by a faint, eerie blue light. I could feel a chill in the air, and I could hear the echoing of demons in the distance. I tried to scream, but my voice was muffled by the darkness of the cave. I felt a chill run down my spine as I realized... I was being hunted by something unseen. I heard the scraping of claws on the rocks, felt the ground shaking beneath me. I, I was terrified. I started to run. I ran and ran until I found a small crevice in the wall of the cave. I squeezed through it and hid in the darkness, hoping the demons wouldn't find me. Eventually I woke in my own bed. Safe and sound. But I couldn't help but feel a lingering fear that the demons... They were still out there. Watching. And waiting. December 7th, 2022. It's 4.30am and I'm still up working on this map for Doom. I can't believe I've been up this late. Must be exhausted. I'm not sure why, but I'm having trouble sleeping lately. I just can't seem to shut my mind off. I'm really starting to feel the effects of it, too. I've been more irritable than usual. My coworkers said they've noticed a change in my behavior. I'm also a lot more on edge, jumpier than I used to be. I'm playing back the map to check my work, and I'm finding all these new additions I don't remember adding. It looks like the map has had a mind of its own, but I mean, that's impossible, right? Maybe I'm just exhausted, not thinking straight. I guess I should take it as a sign that I need to get some rest. December 16th, 2022. Today I decided to take a day off work. I'm so tired. can't focus anymore. I've been having trouble sleeping for weeks now. I just needed the rest. I'm glad Christmas is coming soon so I can spend time with my family. I'm looking forward to it, and I don't really feel like being around people. It's nice to have some time away from the school and just relax. Sure, there'll be a lot of fun, and there'll be plenty of laughter and good times. Here's hoping that I'll be well rested and ready to face the world again soon. December 17th, 2022. Don't attempt to type while well, sleepy. December 1, 8, 2022. I was in the bathroom, standing in front of the mirror, shaving. As I looked at my reflection, I noticed it winked at me. It was so strange and unexpected that I threw my razor at the mirror... I was so scared that I expected the mirror to shatter, but instead it stayed intact. I was even more surprised when I put my hand through the mirror and I could feel the glass. I kept 
going and I was able to climb all the way into the mirror. It was like a tunnel. When I looked back, I saw myself in the mirror and this time I winked back. It was so surreal, but I felt like I belonged there. There was something comforting about being in the mirror, like it was my home. I woke up feeling so confused and shocked. Uh, I still can't believe it was just a dream. January 4th, 2023. Today was supposed to be my first day back at work after the holiday break, but I decided to take one more day off to work on myhouse.wad. I've been spending hours every day mapping out and organizing the project, but I'm starting to feel like it's taking on a life of its own. Despite being unable to remember making many of the changes, I keep finding new things appearing in the project. I'm starting to feel a little paranoid, like someone or something is watching me and controlling the direction of the project. It's a strange feeling. I'm not sure how to explain it, but I just feel like I'm not in control anymore. It's a little unnerving, but I'm determined to finish this. January 7th, 2023. I was driving along a road in the woods. Well, all of a sudden, my car veered off the road and crashed into a tree. I woke up to find myself in the driver's seat with an uninjured and bleeding leg. My head was spinning. I felt disoriented. I dragged myself out of the car and hobbled my way through the woods in hopes of finding help. My leg was in agony, and I felt like I was going to faint. Through the trees, I saw the lights from a lonely gas station. I was relieved to find it open, but then I realized that there was nobody there. I had no idea where everybody had gone. As I was standing there, I heard some strange noises coming from the woods around me. I was too scared to investigate, so I just stood there feeling scared and alone. And suddenly, I heard a car in the distance, and I limped towards it. Thank goodness, it was a taxi driver who was able to take me to the hospital. I eventually woke up in a cold sweat. Not sure if I was relieved or disappointed. But it was just a dream. January 13th, 2023. I have an extended weekend because of MLK Day, so I thought I'd try to wrap things up before March. I had trouble opening the map. Doom Builder and Slade both reported being unable to locate the file. Apparently during a previous editing session, I compiled the map as a PK3 file, and both editors were looking for a previous copy in a .wad format. I've been reading tutorials on how to convert WAD files to PK3, and I, I must have thrown everything into a new file at some point in an exhausted stupor because I don't remember actually converting the project into a different format. January 14th, 2023. Last night I had a nightmare that felt so real I can still feel the fear and terror coursing through me as I write this. I was on an airplane. I was the only passenger. I looked out the window to see the ground below and noticed that the terrain was unfamiliar. I had no idea where I was or where I was going. Suddenly the plane started to shake violently and I heard a loud noise coming from the engine. In the distance I could see a huge storm cloud coming towards me. I tried to communicate with the pilot, but I couldn't hear him over the sound of the engine. The plane began to dive. and. Suddenly, I felt a huge jolt. I looked out the window again and saw that the plane was heading for some kind of structure. I closed my eyes. I felt the plane crash. I felt the impact. I heard the screams and the cries and the people around me. I then woke up. My heart pounding and my body drenched in sweat. January 21st, 2023. I don't know if it's the memories of my friend that keep flooding back while working on this map, but I need to take a break. This project, which began as a simple cleanup and release as a, as a memorial, it's consumed all of my free times, hours, the past. Uh, I'm not aware of the time when we're familiar with the work added to the map. I'm, I'm going to stop mapping for a while. Come back later when I'm in a better place. 
January 22nd, 2023. I mapped again last night. January 23rd, 2023. And tonight. January 31st, 2023. I'll take a break for real this time. I hope it'll let me. February 14th, 2023. Happy Valentine's Day to the only person I ever loved. For a short time, you brought a little happiness to this painful existence called life. I hope we can be together again one day. In the meantime, I'll keep looking for that other someone who can be the ray of light in my life that you turned out to be. February 19th, 2023. I didn't make this area of the map. I'm sure of it. It's still the house that Thomas started all those years ago, but different. It's changed. The map I've been detailing and cleaning up for release is still here, but it's now intertwined with too many tags and sector references to separate it from the new areas. I'd be more disturbed if it wasn't so beautiful. February 20th, 2023. I took more time off work to finish the map. After 13 years, I've got the hours, but more important, the map needs me. Without my guiding hand, the map doesn't know what to build. But I can help it. I can guide it. It seems to respond to my designs, changing them to match my emotional state. It knows what I'm feeling. It knows how Thomas felt. February 26, 2023. I can no longer tell what elements of this map are my friends and which are mine. And what the map's created. I'm no longer afraid that the map's creating itself. It needs me as much as I need it, which reminds me of a dream I had the other night. I'm not sleeping much, but I recall this one with surprising clarity. I was standing on a beach, staring out at the placid water, the ocean stretching out as far as the eye could see, seagulls cawing overhead, and the gentle caress of water lapped the sand in front of me. I dipped my toes in the water. At, at least I tried. There was no water. No ocean. It was an illusion. I realized everything around me was fake. The trees, the birds, the sand, it was all a one-act play, and I was Willie Loman, a damn fool who believed in something greater, but there was no happiness to be found. I wandered the set only to find myself staring into oblivion. It was the end of time itself. No joy, no misery, no sadness, only emptiness. Men of faith tell us the afterlife is for eternity. But is it possible to keep your sanity for eternity? A day passes in the void, a month, a year, two, five, ten. Is this an eternity? Twenty years, a hundred years, a thousand years. I've sat in this room for a million years now, entertaining the same thoughts, pondering the same questions, and ruminating on every mistake in my life, anguishing over them for centuries, a billion years now. Double that. Now double it again. I'm still nowhere close to the end of eternity. I pray for death, but it never comes. Just me, and my thoughts, and my mistakes, and my insecurities, and my regrets, and my loneliness. Somewhere in another dream, the version of myself that winked back is sitting on the real beach, happy and content knowing life is finite, 
There is no afterlife. And happiness is found in the small things around us that we can control. Happiness has to be fought for. March 2nd, 2023. I was wrong. The map is using me. This morning I loaded a Doom Builder backup file from late October and spent a few hours preparing the map for release. I tried to delete myhouse.pk3, but I kept getting a file and use error. I don't think the map will let me. I'm going to post it on the Doom World tonight, but I don't want anyone playing anything other than the original vanilla release. Whatever this map is doing to me, I can't let it do the same to others. March 9th, 2023. I swear I uploaded the safe copy, but my house... That PK3 was uploaded by mistake. I don't know if a lot of people were able to download the map before I fixed the link, but hopefully... Hopefully I caught it in time. Every story has to start somewhere. And this one begins with the doorbell ringing at a house party. This isn't any ordinary house party, however, not by a long shot. There's a lot of talk floating around about options, distribution rights, setups, and screenplays. Some of the guests would look very familiar to the general public. The rest of them are responsible for the rising fame of their on-screen counterparts. No, this is definitely no ordinary gathering in an ordinary home. This is a Hollywood party. Most of the attendees are notable players in the film industry. And the location is a luxury condo in an exclusive neighborhood. Although some of them came from relatively humble beginnings, all the partygoers are now quite wealthy. Most of them are notable figures in the highly competitive world of television and feature films. Their current existence is encased in a wondrous bubble of splendor and comfort. The average person could hardly imagine what it would be like to live among them to move in their circles, experience the marvelous pleasures they enjoy on a daily basis. They dwell in the upper tiers of society, far above the relative squalor of the masses below. And that crystalline bubble is about to burst with the ringing of the doorbell. Lights. Camera. Action. Seth Harwood happened to be the closest person to the door when the doorbell rang. He yelled, I'll get it, and wandered over to take a bleary glance through the window. There was a camera facing the front porch, but no one was monitoring the feed. If someone had been watching, they would have seen a figure lurking behind the man who was standing at the door. However, the host had sent all his staff home for the evening, and now it was just Carmine and his guests. Most of them had a decent buzz going on, and none of them were even remotely prepared for the events that were about to transpire. This included Seth Harwood, the actor who opened the door. He turned around and called out, Hey, Terry's here! Hey, someone tell Carmine that Terry Schultz is here! He drunkenly wobbled up the short flight of stairs to the main floor, followed closely by the new arrivals. Seth was too inebriated to notice the man who had followed Terry Schultz inside. He also failed to see the thin trickles of blood that were leaking down the side of Terry's face. There was a dazed look in Terry's eyes, and for good reason. He'd just been struck on the side of the head with a pistol shortly before the bell rang. The intruder locked the door behind him, and then he ushered Terry up the steps. Terry ascended the staircase on wobbly legs. There was a scream caught in his throat. He could feel the barrel of a pistol pressing into his back. As soon as he got to the top of the stairs, the man with the pistol shoved him aside for a clear shot at Seth. The discharge was deafeningly loud. Seth stumbled 
and collapsed onto the floor. Blood pumped out of a hole in his skull in a shuddering wave, rapidly pooling on the marble tile beneath him. The intruder fired another shot into the ceiling and bellowed, Everyone get on the floor! Now! Now! There was a moment of stunned silence. The only sounds were the ringing in their ears and the hushed murmur of music in the background. Then, the reality of their situation penetrated through their shock, and the pandemonium broke out. Some of the guests dropped to the floor where they stood, but the rest scrambled for cover. The gunman shot a woman who was trying to open a window. Then he casually put a bullet in Terry Schultz, who was trying to crawl his way down the stairs to escape through the front door. As Terry rolled the rest of the way down, the intruder pulled the trigger twice more, aiming for a woman who was running up a spiral staircase to the second floor. The young woman screeched in pain, but she continued to struggle her way up to the top. She collapsed at the top of the stairs and crawled out of sight. The intruder roared, I said get your asses on the fucking floor! The rest of them promptly complied. He pulled a handful of zip ties from the side pockets of his grimy backpack and growled, If anyone fucks around, I'll blow their brains out. I don't give a shit about any of you people, you understand? Not one single shit. So don't even think about trying me. The gunman went from person to person and tied their hands behind their back. He also emptied their pockets and confiscated all their cell phones. After he was done with this particular task, the gunman locked all the windows and closed all the blinds. When he was satisfied no one would be able to see inside, he pulled a battery-powered impact driver out of his pack, followed by a paper bag full of screws. The intruder proceeded to seal the doors shut by screwing them into their frames. When he was finished, the intruder helped himself to the bar and poured a generous amount of vodka into a crystal glass. He took a deep swallow and gasped. Even the good stuff tastes like battery acid to me. Ah, it's rough. With his drink in one hand and his gun in the other, the intruder forced the remaining party guests to shuffle over to a corner of the room that Carmine referred to as the conversation nook. It consisted of two luxurious couches placed directly across from each other. The couches were separated by a glass tabletop, and the area was tastefully illuminated by recessed light fixtures and ceilings. When all the partygoers were seated on the couches, the gunman held up his glass of vodka and said, Cheers, assholes. Are you having fun? No. Honestly, me neither. I haven't been having any fun for a very long time. The gunman smiled and dumped some more booze down his throat. He grimaced and tossed the glass onto the carpet beside him. He wheezed. Oh, harsh. Lungs and some orange juice, am I right? The gunman glared at his circle of captives as he swapped the magazine and his pistol. He pointed at himself and demanded, Does anyone know who I am? Come on, folks. Take a wild guess. Everyone looked around at each other with bright, watery eyes. No one wanted to either confirm or deny anything because either choice might result in a one-way ticket to the pearly gates. They all stayed silent and waited for whatever might come next. Okay, we'll come back to that in a bit, he grunted. See if I can name all you shit heels instead. How's that? Let's see. We got Carmine Monteo sitting beside me. You're a producer. Terry was your business partner, right? Okay, so... Beside Carmine is Elizabeth McKay. Beside her is Jeremy... Uh, Jeremy Reeves. Is that right? She's an actress. You're a screenwriter. I saw you on one of those uh, late-night talk shows. You're a funny guy, you know that? You had a real sharp sense of humor. Jerry tried his best not to cower beneath the intensity of his gaze. He whispered, Yeah, that's me, thanks. And we got the guy sitting beside Jeremy. I don't recognize him. Who are you, my man? The party guest in question shifted uncomfortably in his seat and stammered, I'm uh, not really a, a public figure. I, I'm a friend of Carmine's. I, I work in real estate. 
The gunman nodded thoughtfully and asked, What's your name, real estate guy? It's Ken Rysdale. He whimpered softly. Oh, I'm, not, I'm not a celebrity or anything. Just like I said, I sell real estate. The gunman gave him the side eye and said, Not sure if that's the whole story, but okay. Sure. Doesn't matter either way you're here, if you know what I mean. Ken shrank back into the couch and whimpered. Why are you here? Is this a robbery? None of us ever did anything to you. Oh, that's not true at all, the gunman sneered. They did plenty to me. They wrecked my fucking life. Ken blinked a little and shook his head slowly. No. Um. Uh, 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 no. He sputtered in a weak, wavery voice. That didn't happen. You, you're not in reality right now. You, you, have, you have a sickness in your mind, okay? You're sick. Please listen to me. I, the gunman was already on the move. He loomed over Ken and snarled. You know what? I actually do recognize your name. I saw it on a billboard. Ken. Ken Risedale Estate. Something like that. You're one of those greaseball developers who crank out subdivisions full of shitty McMansions. You buy a shitload of farmland, and you slap together a bunch of cookie-cutter houses, ones that'll fall apart before the mortgage gets paid off, and you get filthy fucking rich while you do it. You people are out of trash, you know that? Ken shook his head again, blubbering. I've, n I've never harmed you... Or bother you in any way, shape, or form. This is my first time I've ever laid eyes on you, for Christ's sake. You're doing a bad thing right now, Mr. Year. You're, you're sick. You, you need help. The intruder lashed out and hit Ken in the face with the barrel of the pistol. Everyone gasped at the flat, metally thud as the pistol bounced off Ken's cheekbone. His skin split open and blood ran freely over his jawline, dripping onto his shirt in drops and splatters. Ken gaped up at the intruder in shock. He stared back at his prisoner and murmured, Hurts, doesn't it? Yeah. Get 50 more lined up and ready to rock to keep your stupid mouth shut. You think I'm sick? Me? I'm the only sane person in this whole room. You people are sick, not me. The intruder moved on to the last person on the couch and regarded him with a grimace of distaste. Speaking of low-life pieces of garbage, here's a prime specimen. Corporate lawyer. How are you, Theodore? You don't look so good. Feeling a bit tight in the chest, are you? He poked the ashen-faced man in the chest with a pistol and grinned. Come on, Ted. Have yourself a heart attack. It's okay, man. Just let go. Waddle your ass over to the other side. Do the world a favor and stop breathing. Leave me alone. Ted stammered. His broad, quivering face is wet with tears. This is crazy. You're fucking crazy. And there is that C word again. The gunman interjected. Didn't we already go over this? I'm not crazy. You know exactly who the fuck I am. Hey, come on. Say my name. Say it out loud. Ted looked up at him mutely, his lips drawn together in a tight little line. The intruder chuckled. Better take your chances with a crazy guy than say it out loud. <laughs> Holy fucking shit. Okie dokie then, how about this? He pulled something out of his hip pocket and flicked it open. It was a spring-loaded knife with a five-inch blade. It looked wickedly sharp. Ted's eyes zeroed in on the glittering business end of the knife. He cowered back as far as possible on the couch and squealed, Don't stab me! The intruder crooned, Just like a little picklet. He then jabbed the tip of the blade into Ted's meaty thigh. The lawyer screamed at the top of his lungs, setting off a chorus of horrified wailing from the other hostages. One of them heaved himself to his feet, his face distorted into a mask of terrified determination. He found himself staring into the barrel of the pistol, and he froze like a statue. "'What do you think you're doing, sir?' the intruder asked calmly. "'Were you about to fuck around?' "'What did I say about fucking around?' The would-be hero took a shuffling step back and croaked. I, I wasn't doing anything. I, I just wanted you to stop, okay? Don't hurt anyone. Just, just stop it, man. Please. 
No. Now sit down and shut up. He turned his attention back to Ted, the lawyer, and snorted. Damn, that leg's bleeding like a bastard. I poke an artery? Can't remember exactly, but I think there might be an artery there. Ted looked like he was ready to faint. He whimpered. I have a wife. I, I got kids. Please don't kill me, for God's sake. Don't do it. The intruder leveled his pistol dead center in the lawyer's forehead, his eyes glinting in the muted lighting. What's my name? He whispered. Say my fucking name, Ted. Say it! The young woman who was sitting beside the would-be hero stomped her feet and shrieked, Stop it! Don't hurt him anymore! Everyone's scared to say anything, okay? He told us that we... He said, we, we, we can't. She trailed off. Her face, a crumpled Kleenex smeared with dripping makeup. She gave Carmine an uncertain look. He very slightly shook his head no in return. He said, you can't do what exactly? The gunman asked quietly. He was still staring at Ted, his finger on the trigger. The young woman cleared her throat and croaked, I, I don't know, I, I, I don't know. The intruder turned and favored her with a mummified corpse of a smile. He said, never mind what anyone else told you. They're not in charge here. I am. Me. The guy with the gun. Go ahead and finish what you were saying. Carmine glared at her and hissed. Carla, shut up. Stop talking. He gave the terrified girl a stern look and said, Go on. It's for the best. He told us never to mention your name, she wheezed. And a fresh batch of hot, salty tears started running down her face. Carmine and Ted, the lawyer, both groaned out loud at the same time. Carmine's face flushed a deep, ugly red. He uttered a guttural curse under his breath and gritted his teeth. And who said that? The intruder prodded. Who told you never to mention my name? The girl shook her head violently and started to sob. The intruder growled. Tell me who said that. And tell me why. She clenched her lips together in a tight line and shook her head again. The gunman gave her a long, considering look. Then he hit Ted with a pistol. Ted flopped back into the couch with a strangled groan. Doesn't sound like movies, does it? The intruder murmured. There's no big dramatic bang when you hit someone in real life. A good hard slap across the face. That's different. Here, I'll show you. He shoved the knife back into his pocket and held up his hand for everyone to see. He then proceeded to whirl around and deliver a resounding slap across Ted's jawline. The sound of the impact echoed off the walls. The lawyer immediately slumped over and let out a gurgling snore. The intruder turned around at his horrified audience and asked, Do you get it now? This is real, folks. No lights, no cameras, no microphones. This blood's real. I'm real. So wipe that stupid look off your faces and wake up. He looked over at Carla and gave her a sly wink, as if they were about to share some particularly juicy bit of gossip. He then said, It was Ted over here, wasn't it? I know it was Ted. I mean, yes or a no, Carla? You don't have a choice. She sniffled. Yes, it was Ted. They would come after us for breaching our non-disclosure agreement. Carmine twisted in his seat and shouted, oh, You stupid bitch! He just fucked us, you know that? The gunman barked, Stuff a sock in it! You already screwed yourselves a while ago. Just took a little time to catch up with you, that's all. Stop pointing fingers and admit you fucked up. He turned back to the young woman and gave her a puzzled look. You know, I don't recognize you either. You an actress or something? She sniffled. I'm not. Well, yes, I'm. I'm an actress, but I, I've been working as a, as a production assistant. I'm not. You know, I, I'm. I'm just an assistant. 
He raised an eyebrow and said, A production assistant got invited to a gathering like this? With these people? Why? Intuitor let the question hang in the air. He turned to the man who tried to sneak up behind him and asked, How about you, Mr. Hero? You the key grip or something? What's your story? He his lap and muttered, My name's Trent Young. I'm a cinematographer. The intruder waved a dismissive hand and said, I'm going to refer to you as Mr. Hero because I'm an asshole. Anyway, last but definitely not least, we have the esteemed director, Ron Kersey. Director, producer, visionary, all that jazz. You make good movies, sir, you really do. Kind of a dickhead, though, aren't you? I have nothing to say to you, Ron answered carefully. He was striving to look neutral, but he was sweating in the air conditioning. He hesitated and asked, What do you want from us? I want my life back, the intruder snapped. But that's not going to happen, is it? So now we're going to do this instead. He looked around with a frown of concentration and muttered, Okay, so I've got, uh, let's see, eight of you sitting here, one upstairs, there's me. It makes ten of us in total. He chuckled and mused to himself. If I could write a story about what's happening here tonight, I'd call it Ten Little Scumbags. You get it? You know, like that Agatha Christie novel with a really off-color title. Come on, nobody gets it. Yeah, guess I shouldn't be surprised. Who the hell's reading Agatha Christie these days, am I right? Ronald swallowed a lump in his throat and repeated, What do you want from us? Why are you here? The intruder stood there and looked down at him with a smooth, blank expression, not talking hardly, even blinking. He just stood there, stared at him. Then he took in a long, measured breath and leaned in close. Quietly, he said, the publisher ended up changing the name of the book to you. And then there were none. <laughs> and I guess that's your real answer, Mr. Kiersey. This is insane. Ron sputtered, come on, don't pretend this isn't completely insane. You need to stop this right now before... The director's words faltered in his mouth. The look in the intruder's eyes were murky and strange. There wasn't any light glimmering behind that flat, hopeless gaze. There was only darkness. The intruder murmured, Oh, hell no. It's too late to stop. It's way too late to stop. Ron shook his head and breathed. That's... That's not true. Listen to me, okay? You, you don't have to do this. We'll get you some help. The intruder abruptly hauled off and punched Ron in the stomach, making him double over with a strange oof. He gave the wheezing director a feral smile and said, I don't gonna listen to fucking nobody, and that's the truth. So fuck you. Fuck me. Fuck the rest of them, too. There's no stopping, my man. We're heading towards the end of the line. Ron took a tortured breath and forced himself to sit up straight. He groaned. Why are you doing this? What's the point you're trying to make here? The intruder stopped smiling. For a second, he looked like a frightened child, alone, lost in the wilderness. He took in a deep, shuddering breath and said, There is no point, Ron. The time for arguments is long gone. I'm doing this because you killed me, son of a bitch. You, you people destroyed my life. And now... I'm going to return the favor. The intruder abruptly walked away from his hostages and headed for the spiral staircase. As soon as he was gone, Carmine hissed, Carla, run to my office. Call 911. Quick, before he comes back. Go! Carla blinked back her tears and sniffed, How? My hands are tied behind my back. Carmine snarled, Grab a pencil with your teeth. Press the buttons, dumbass. Go on. Hurry up. 
Elizabeth McKay glared at him and spoke up for the first time since the beginning of their horrifying ordeal. She said, why don't you do it, Carmine? I mean, it's your house, isn't it? As far as I'm concerned, it's your fault this nutcase got inside. Where's your security team? Carmine made a rude noise with his lips and sputtered, what, my security team? I'm not Steven Spielberg over here, Liz. I don't have a security team. Couldn't afford that shit. Come, come on. Elizabeth muttered, Yeah, I think that's bullshit, but whatever. We could talk about that later. Go call the cops. The producer gave her a look of disbelief and said, Hell no. She's the idiot who couldn't keep her mouth shut, not me. Carla, why are you still sitting here? Get going, for Christ's sake. What are you waiting for? Ted opened his eyes and let out a soft groan. The side of his face was swelling up rapidly, making him look like some kind of grotesque half-man, half-chipmunk hybrid. He groaned. My jaw hurts. It hurts to talk. Carmine coldly replied, then stop talking, and turned back to Carla. He jerked his head in the direction of the office and hissed. I'm not asking over here, sweetie. I'm telling. Get up. Get moving. Two gunshots rapidly boomed out on the second floor. Everyone jumped in their seats. They were followed by a third shot. And then there was silence again. Who was that? Carla whispered. Was that Grace? I, I think she ran upstairs when he started shooting. I, I think he just killed her. Carmine snorted. Who cares? He's up there, not down here. So get off your ass. Make the fucking call. Elizabeth bumped him aggressively with her shoulder and sputtered. Eat a bag of shit, Carmine. You're an asshole, do you know that? The producer glared at her and said, You don't get ahead in business by being nice, Liz. You, of all people, should know that. Elizabeth's eyes smoldered with a deep, long-standing animosity. She purred, Let me tell you something, Carmine. If I get out of this alive, I'm going to spill the beans on you. And I'm not talking about what happened right now. I mean all of it. The whole shebang. Carmine's entire head flushed an ugly shade of crimson. He looked away from her and muttered, You better watch your mouth, Liz. Who the hell do you think you are? Hey, hey, if you're so full of piss and vinegar, maybe you should make the call. I mean, go ahead. Ken thumped his foot on the floor to get everyone's attention. He jerked his head at the stairs and whispered, He's coming back. Be quiet. They all watched with bated breath as the gunman ambled down the spiral staircase, his pistol dangling at his side. He was cradling something in his other arm. It was a gold-plated sculpture of a figure holding some kind of stringed instrument, looking at peace and smiling at nothing in particular. He stopped in their midst and announced, And then they were mine. He saw the disgusted expression on their face and added, Just some gallows humor, folks. Gotta lighten the mood every now and then, right? Carla made a soft, choking noise in her throat. She quavered, why did you kill Gracie? She was, she was one of the nicest people I'd ever known. Because she was here. The gunman said stiffly. I gotta say. You got a lot of really cool shit lying around, Carmine. How much is this thing worth? Reluctantly, Carmine answered. Maybe four grand or so? I, I don't know for sure the market value is... I don't know, on stuff like that, it goes up and down. I'm holding a $4,000 knickknack, the intruder mused. And you have it sitting on the table beside your bed, getting all dusty and shit. Is it a Hindu deity? I mean, you don't really strike me as a spiritual guy. I'm not religious, Carmine mumbled. She's the goddess of creativity, so it's, it's, it's appropriate. The gunman plunked the sculpture down on the coffee table and scornfully shook his head. So you think you're creative, do you? It's fucking funny, my man. You never, you've never created a fucking thing. You've never created a goddamn thing. That's the truth. The company's just a glorified bank. You finance other people's work in exchange for a big slice of the profits. Be able to see how that makes you an artist. Unless you were talking about being a rip-off artist, because it's exactly what you are. You ripped me off. You used my intellectual property, made tens of millions of dollars. And what did I get? Nothing. Not a, not a single dime. 
He poked himself in the chest and said, I'm the one who creates, not you. You should have this overpriced paperweight sitting on my table, not you. That's not how it works. No. People like me, we don't even have a bed, let alone a fucking nightstand. No gold statue for me. That's not how it worked out. You know what really happened? Carmine wisely kept silent. The intruder gave him a considering look and said, I'll tell you what really happened. I wake up one morning and I see a DM from someone who's a fan of my work. I mean, I don't really have a ton of fans or anything, but they do exist. Anyway, they sent me a link to a movie trailer on YouTube. I watched the trailer. And I said, what the fuck is this? The plot seems to be an awful lot like the one of my short stories, you know. And you want to guess what happened next? His hostages remained silent. The intruder smiled at all of them in turn. One by one, his nicotine-stained grin cracked with a deadly fury. First, I was in denial. As I'm sure you can imagine, I couldn't believe my own eyes. Surely, fucking surely this wasn't happening, right? How would a Hollywood movie studio ever become aware of my work in the first place? I wasn't famous. I wasn't even well known. I was just another self-published idiot who occasionally does some work online. It didn't make any sense. I couldn't wrap my head around it. He paused for a moment to stare at Carmine, who avoided his eyes and shifted nervously in his seat. The intruder shook his head at him and continued. When the shitstorm hit the fan, I was working as a janitor in a factory. I was making minimum wage, mopping floors, and scrubbing toilets. To be frank, it was a bad place to work. A lot of the folks who worked there, they... They were bad, too. Bad. Bitter. Shady fucking people. Every now and then, someone would finger paint the toilet stalls with their own shit. I wish I was making it up, but I'm not. Sometimes the shit graffiti would say something offensive about me, the janitor. Can you imagine that? No. No, I don't think you can. You don't have any imagination. You're as dull as a butter knife, Carmine. Dull, greedy, and useless. Anyway, he sighed. I was pretty fucking broke. You know, minimum wage is a fuck all. Money would have changed my life completely. Not only that, but think of doors he would open. If I had a screenwriting credit for a big budget movie, well, (laughs) the hell of a thing to have on your resume. Most writers would kill for something like that. Basically, it never happens. I mean, even if I had a really good literary agent, I would still be one in a million. The intruder fell silent. He stared at the wall for a while, and then he abruptly whirled around and headed for the bar. He poured himself another glass of vodka and called out, Oh, here's the thing, folks. I didn't have an agent. I didn't have a manager or a publicist, none of that shit. I was just floating around by myself on the fringes. Really small fish in a giant ocean. I was minding my own business like a good little fishy, scrubbing my toilet, selling maybe 15 books a month online. I'm not going to be wrong. It fucking sucked. But at least it was something. You get me? It wasn't a good life. Hell, it was hardly even adequate, to be honest. It was something. It was better than nothing at all. The intruder marched back to the conversation nook with his drink in hand, his eyes watering from the booze he poured down his throat at the bar. He raised his glass and said, Toast to our dreams. Beautiful, fragile dreams. They only become reality for the rich and powerful because those fuckers have the cash to make it happen. They also have a team of lawyers. Hear that right, Theodore. Ted made a small sound in his throat. He began to tremble all over. Everyone could feel a thundercloud of explosive tension building in the air. The other hostages looked at Ted with wide eyes and racing hearts. He was going to be next. The intruder stopped in front of him and drawled, Theodore. You're not Ted when you sign a threatening email, are you? (laughs) No, sir. You go by Theodore. 
when you're out for blood. I didn't do anything wrong, Ted whimpered. I was doing my job. It was nothing personal. Intruder threw his head back and unleashed a volley of furious laughter at the ceiling. He took another swallow of vodka and gasped. <laughs> nothing personal. <clears throat> Don't you remember sending me that email on Christmas Eve? You were pretty hot under the collar when you sent that baby along, weren't you? Christ almighty. The thing was friggin' ten pages long. He wrote an essay about how I'd regret my actions if I didn't disappear. Man, you were mad as fuck, weren't you? Now, why is that, Theodore? It's because you knew I was right. Ted stammered. I, I didn't. What did you just say to me? I mean, yes, I, I did send that email, but you threatened us first. I sent a very clear and professional response to your baseless claims. Maybe, maybe my tone was a bit uh, firm, I suppose, sure, but frankly, you're lucky I didn't launch a lawsuit of my own. You have no right to... The intruder kicked the couch between Ted's legs and screamed, You better shut the fuck up, douchebag! What did you just say to me, baseless? Where the hell have you been for the past 20 minutes? Where the hell have you been for the past 20 minutes? Cat's already out of the bag, moron. We all know what happened. For crying out loud, frickin' Jeremy over there. He didn't even bother to change the name of the antagonist. What are you, fucking robot? Now look at you. Shit's bleeding all over the place. Your hands are tied behind your back. This is where you're at right now. And you're still coughing up some pre-recorded lawyer talk? It's fucking incredible. Carmine was looking at Ted with narrowed eyes. He rumbled. What's he talking about? You didn't say anything about an email. And you responded to him without consulting me first. A slow smile sped across the intruder's face. He said, I think someone's overstepping their bounds. Well, tell him what happened, Theodore. Tell him everything. Or I'll break your fucking teeth. Ted crumpled back into the couch, looking diminished and immensely miserable. He muttered, You got an email from this guy about a year after we first heard from his lawyer. He said if he didn't get confirmation that Ron was aware of the... Uh, the incident would go after us on social media with his accusations. Carmine's face was becoming redder by the second. Through gritted teeth, he snarled, Do you know what kind of shitstorm this could have brought down on my head? Why didn't you tell me? Huh? This goes for you too, Ron. You never said a single word to me about this shit. He told me I'm a nobody. The intruder interjected. His angry smile abruptly collapsed, leaving a vacant and haunting look in his wake. He said, I'm delusional. He wrote ten pages of bullshit to explain why I was wrong, and then he threatened to fuck up whatever was left of my existence if I didn't go away. I sat there at my kitchen table on Christmas Eve, and I read this pompous horse shit while my wife tried to pretend everything was normal. You know, sort of buzzing around the house, moving the ornaments around, fucking with the tree, pretending to be busy, just trying to ignore me as I sat there getting angrier and angrier, just trying her goddamn best to make Christmas happen. And then I jumped up and I threw my phone across the room and I yelled, you're full of shit and you know it, motherfucker. The gunman paused and looked around the room with a bewildered expression. As if he wasn't sure where he was anymore. He let out a shaky breath and said, My wife. She turns to me with tears in her eyes and she yells back, Why can't you just let it go? I just can't take it anymore. Just fucking let it go and move on. The gunman took another deep drink and gasped at the burning in his throat. He motioned at Ted with a pistol and said, You were scared people would find out. The audience. People lined up to watch Carmine's crappy movies. Can you imagine the response if I went public? People love to hate the players in Hollywood. 
no matter how much they adore you. They're always secretly waiting for an excuse to shove you off your pedestal. The rest of you dumb shits might not understand this, but Ted understands it just fine. He knows the power of public opinion. He pointed the gun at Ted and asked, What's your job, Theodore? What does Carmine's company employ you to do? Ted gave the intruder an uncertain look and said, I'm the head of their legal team. Yeah, sure, the intruder agreed. But what is your specific function? What do you do? Ted blinked at him and said nothing. It was obvious he was having difficulty moving his jaw. The left side of his face looked like a Halloween mask. It was tacky with drying blood, and his cheek was swollen to balloon-like proportions. The stab wound in his inner thigh was no longer bleeding, but throbbed with a fiery heat. It made him want to pass out. He took a deep, shuddering breath and said, I don't know what you want me to say. The intruder kicked the couch again and yelled, The truth, asshole! Your job is to protect the company from losing money. That's what you do. Being called out for stealing from a working man, that, that wouldn't look very good. Something like that has the potential to hurt ticket sales, drain their bottom line. Ted licked his lips and muttered, it could be a problem, yes. But I investigated your claims that they were be They... They were untrue. I answered all of them in great detail. Theodore's eyes were wide as saucers. His breath was puffing in and out of his chest in grunts and snorts. He rasped. The intruder's eyes were wide as saucers. His breath was puffing in and out of his chest in grunts and snorts. He rasped. You stupid motherfucker. Drop the innocent act, for Christ's sake. You thought I was going to crawl into the sewer and never return, didn't you? But then I came back. And you got mad. Because I wasn't supposed to do that. Carmine interjected. I want to see this response he got from Ted. Do you have access to your email on your phone? The intruder winced at the sound of this voice. He bent down to look at Carmine directly in the eyes. And he said, I don't have to show you shit motherfucking all, my man. Time for verifying and examining the evidence. That time's long gone. Be quiet. Let me say what I have to say. He pointed at the director and ruefully shook his head. I don't think Ron ever knew. But apparently he did. He just didn't care. You're a special kind of asshole. Did you know that? Took all that shit online about how you're a regular salt of the earth kind of guy. And it's a bunch of lies. You're another pampered shit bag in the back of a limousine. You direct movies about the struggles of regular people. But I doubt you even know any regular people. You're ten times worse than Theodore over there because he doesn't try to hide his true identity. He's a vulture. He knows it. You, however, you live entirely up your own ass. We have absolutely nothing in common, you and I. You live up in the clouds. I mean, hell, you wouldn't even notice one of us regular people. Unless we took you hostage and forced you to notice. Carmine appeared to not even be aware of the exchange between the intruder and Ron Kiersey. He was too busy glaring at the head of his legal department. He suddenly yelled, God damn it, Ted! Why didn't you come to me when you got the email? I would have just cut him a deal, for Christ's sake. What, what would it cost? 20 grand? Maybe 40? Who gives a shit? Now look at us, you goddamn idiot. You son of The shot was deafening in the narrow corner of the room. A chunk of Carmine's head sprayed on the wall behind him followed immediately by a crimson gush of blood. He choked out a gurgled groan and fell sideways. His head landed in Elizabeth's lap. She screamed and jumped up from the couch, only to be immediately shoved back down by the intruder. She fell on top of Carmine and squirmed away, crowding against Jeremy with an expression of hysterical disgust. The gunman roared. Nobody gets up from the fucking couch! Don't even think about it! The actor screeched back, Fuck you! He was bleeding on me! His blood is all over my legs! The intruder spat, I don't care if you're drowning in it, lady. You keep your ass on that cushion. This isn't fair. 
Elizabeth stammered as she started to cry. I didn't do anything to you. I I started a movie. I got a paycheck. That's it. That, that's all I did. The intruder took another big gulp of vodka and wandered away into the middle of the room. He looked around at the opulence of his surroundings with a mixture of contempt and wonder. Stop whining about it, he called over his shoulder. I don't care about you. Get him off the couch, she yelled back. Get him away from me. The gunman stormed back to the conversation nook and pulled the body off the couch. He tucked his firearm in his waistband and dragged Carmine to the other side of the room. And then there were eight. He croaked. Tell me something, Ron. Why are you people gathering here tonight? Seems like a coincidence that everyone here worked on the same movie. It's a bit late for a rap party. What's the occasion? A fleeting look passed between the remaining hostages. Ron flicked his lips and answered with a question of his own. How did you find this place? Carmine's address is in public knowledge. Oh, I've been doing my research, the intruder said cryptically. And he smiled. Guess it's time for the second act of my story. It's what I do, isn't it? I tell stories. I tell them. You steal them. <laughs> Isn't that right, Mr. Kiersey? No, Ron answered calmly. That isn't right at all. Go ahead and tell your story, sir. Here goes nothing. We'll call this act two. The aftermath. Anyway, after Ted sent me that charming email on Christmas Eve... I gave up on trying to contact anyone. I was worried I'd have to defend myself against you shitty bastards in liberal suit. It was... I was terrified I'd lose. Didn't have a lawyer anymore, so I was pretty much fucked. I guess I kind of plunged into a downward spiral. I started drinking again. I couldn't sleep without it. I didn't care about anything. All I could think about was the theft of my work. Writing takes a lot of time, concentration. You don't just shit out a novel in a month and call it good. Research, edits, rewrites, more edits. Never ends. On top of all that, you gotta you gotta work to make ends meet. I kept going through the motions for a while, but it wasn't good anymore. I couldn't lose myself in the story. The magic was gone. And that really fucked me up. Losing the ability to slip away into my own imagination, that was even worse than getting ripped off. It was like losing my hands or something. I wasn't whole anymore. I got frustrated. And I got angry. I started being an asshole to everyone around me at all times. No chill, as the kids say. No chill at all. I just hated everything. But I hated myself the most. I was almost to my breaking point, and then... I quit my job. Carla softly asked, What happened? Why? The intruder ran a hand through his balding hair and murmured, Well, I used to be a nobody with a dream, and then I was just a nobody. Couldn't pretend to care anymore. I gave him my two weeks' notice, and that was that. Told the wife I'd look for another job, but I didn't. She tried her best to be understanding, but... How long is that shit supposed to go on? When she started to get on my case about it, I told her I'll devote all my time to writing and I'll make it work. I promise. The promises from me apparently didn't mean jack shit. Because that didn't happen either. I just sort of wandered around and brooded all day. He ran his hand over his thinning hair again and favored his captive audience with a crooked smile. He said, Look, I got a record, okay? Drugs, petty theft, some shit like that. Poor people's crimes. I paid my dues. It doesn't change anything. People always think that having a criminal record doesn't matter when you're looking for a job, but of course it does. Why take a risk on a guy like that if you can hire someone with a clean background? And let's face it, most people have never been arrested, let alone convicted of a crime. You got that kind of baggage? It limits your opportunities. 
It's not fair, Carlos said quietly. I'm sorry it's like that. Me too, the intruder muttered. In my experience, the best you can hope for is temp work at a factory or a warehouse. That isn't saying much. Yeah, I remember working at this one place, warehouse. I had a conveyor belt thing that was so long you couldn't even see where it started. The conveyor was jammed full of boxes at all times. Every minute of the day, there was an endless line of boxes stretching as far as the eye could see. I could stack eight of these heavy bastards in a wooden pallet. Then a guy on a forklift would take them away, and I had no idea what was inside the boxes. Neither did any of my co-workers. The intruder looked at Ron and asked, Do you know what struck me most about that place? No one ever said my name. Not once. They'd point and they'd say, Hey, you! I was on the floor day after day doing all the heavy lifting in the summer heat. No one ever came up to me and said, Thanks for getting our shipments ready on time. No. All the praise went to the area manager. Guy who never left his air-conditioned office. He literally never stepped onto the floor in the entire time I worked there. Hey, do you see my parallel here, folks? Hmm. The intruder was starting to shake like a leaf in his filthy sweatshirt. He pointed at Ted and hollered, You people somehow managed to find the one thing that was sacred to me. My stupid little ambition. My wonderful little daydream. You found it. And you took it from me. I did all the heavy lifting so you could take it and make millions. Hey, what did you say when I dared to speak of it? You told me I'm nobody. A non-entity. No one. Nothing at all. Well, look over here, you stinky little coward. Here I am. In the flesh. Ted sputtered. I didn't say that. Stop getting yourself worked up and listen to reason. Who cares if I'm getting worked up? The intruder demanded. I mean, after all, I'm nobody, right? Right? The muzzle of the pistol flashed. <laughs> and everyone screamed. Ted, of course, screamed the loudest of them all. He fell off the couch and landed on his back, still screaming. Ted began to push himself along the floor with his good leg, gibbering nonsense words of terror as he slowly wormed his way across the carpet. The intruder stood passively and watched the lawyer's futile attempt to run for his life. His lower lip started to quiver, as if he were about to burst into tears, but his eyes were dry and hot with the fires of vengeance. They had already scorched his soul, and now the flames would also consume his enemies. Tonight they would all burn together. The intruder grabbed Carmine's golden statue and followed after his hated nemesis. He stopped the lawyer's agonizing escape with a kick to the ribs, and Ted wailed like a child. The intruder pinned the weeping man with his knee and grunted, I'm real, you son of a bitch. The statue bounced off the lawyer's forehead once, twice, then a third time for good measure. The intruder rose to his feet and screamed, You see that, cocksuckers, huh? You see that shit? Ted was already finished, but it wasn't enough. It would never be enough. The intruder growled like a rabid dog and battered the dying man with primal savagery. Droplets of blood and bits of flesh spattered across the ceiling, the walls everywhere. The intruder didn't stop until the lawyer's entire head was completely destroyed. When the intruder was finally satisfied, he dropped the statue and rolled away from his victim. He lay on his back for a few moments, panting from exertion and covered in blood. He sat up and gasped. There. There's not much time left. Lady on the... That lady upstairs was on the phone with 911 when I shot her. Cops are probably have the place surrounded by now. Trent gave him a furious look and snapped. You sick, twisted piece of shit. You imagine that was somehow justified? I'll be rotten in jail forever. The intruder clambered to his feet and snorted. You haven't heard from you in a while, Mr. Hero. You're going to deliver your hero speech now. Go on. Say your piece. Make it quick. Trent grinned right back at him and said, You've already killed the people who are directly responsible. What do you want now? More attention? Is that it? He wants to say your name? You don't, you don't deserve one. Here's the big man with a gun. Keep hiding behind your gun, bastard. 
The intruder gave him an incredulous look. He spat. The gun is just a lump of metal. Can't do shit unless I squeeze the trigger. You want to see something really dangerous? He stomped over to Carmine's wall-sized TV and grabbed something off the end table. TV remote. The intruder seized up a handful of Trent's hair and waved the remote in his face. He hissed, Now this thing right here, this thing, is incredibly fucking dangerous, Mr. Hero. This thing is the motherfucking A-bomb. Couldn't possibly do more damage. Not in a thousand lifetimes. Trent opened his mouth to reply, but he couldn't think of anything to say. At that instant, a man's voice began blaring from a bullhorn outside. The voice bellowed, Attention! This is Sergeant Hernandez of the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. In approximately one minute, you'll receive a phone call on the business line. It's registered to the homeowner. Please answer this phone call. Yeah, cops are here, the intruder murmured. His face was pale and drawn. That look of being lost and afraid passed over his features again like a dark shadow. Elizabeth explained, Just give yourself up. For God's sake, it's pointless. You don't have to die tonight. And neither to the rest of us. You need help. The intruder gave her a sharp look. He said, I know why you all came here tonight. You came here to talk about a sequel. No one answered him but the guilty expression on their faces was enough. The intruder nodded to himself, a sorrowful gesture, and he shook his head. Terry Schultz spilled the beans. You know how I got to him? I catfished the dumb old bastard with some stock photos. Actually googled blonde bimbo stock photos, used them in my profile. So yeah, it was that easy. Tied him up, kept him locked in the trunk of his car for a while, and when I finally let him out, he was more than willing to cooperate. The gunman dug into his backpack and pulled out a script for the proposed sequel. He waved it in the air. Original screenplay by Jeremy Reed. Did that all by yourself, did you? Like were you just taking all the credit for someone else's work? That'd be par for the course, wouldn't it? A telephone started to ring inside Carmine's office. The intruder said, excuse me for a second, jogged over to answer it. The hostages strained to hear the side of the conversation. It was very brief. The intruder said, Hello? Yeah, that's me. He listened for a while. Then he made an impatient sound and said, Okay, be quiet for a second. I don't have a list of demands. It's not like that. I'm not going to tell you why. I'm sure you'll figure it out later. There's something I need to do, that's all. I'm sorry, can you repeat that? No, absolutely not. You're not understanding me, officer. I don't want any of that. I'm going to do what I need to do, and when it's over, you can go ahead and blow me to pieces. I honestly don't give a shit. The intruder came back to the conversation nook with an irritated expression on his face. He glared at his hostages with bloodshot eyes and croaked, Cops want to negotiate. And they don't get it. I don't want money to recognition. I don't have a noble cause or a manifesto. I just want to kill you motherfuckers. Let us go, Carla squeaked in a tiny voice. Killing us won't make the situation right. It'll just make you wrong. The intruder zeroed in on her with a shell-shocked stare and murmured, Why are you even here, lady? You never gave me an answer. Carla flushed a deep red. She muttered something inaudible and stared at the floor. The intruder nudged her leg with his foot and said, I didn't hear you. Speak up. Elizabeth interjected. She was screwing Carmine. That's why she's here. He liked him young and vulnerable. That was his thing. The intruder wrinkled his nose at Carmine's corpse. You were sleeping with this guy? Well, that had to be rough. Don't get me wrong, though. I get it. You do what you gotta do in this world. Carla narrowed her eyes and barked. I wasn't screwing him, thanks. We were seeing each other for almost six months. We were in a relationship. Elizabeth raised an eyebrow and asked, Do you really think so, hon? I mean, look, I know Carmine for many, many years. Believe me, he was going to get bored and toss you out like a bag of trash. It happened to me, too. It happened to a lot of us. And he didn't take no for an answer. 
He said no, he'd just do what he wanted anyway. Once again, it happened to a lot of us. And look where you are now, Carla shot back. I'm sorry if that happened to you, but look, I don't know what I'm trying to say here, but I do know one thing. I'm not a production assistant. I'm an actress, Liz. I belong in front of the camera, just like you. Everyone needs a break sometimes. You got yours, didn't you? I was just trying to get mine. Elizabeth gave her a pitying look. She said, I'm sure you're a damn fine actress. But here's the problem, Carla. There's a lot of damn fine actresses out there. And if you do manage to succeed, you won't belong to yourself anymore. They'll use you up, then they'll tear you down. When there's nothing left, they'll throw you away. The intruder sat down on the couch beside Ken, unmindful of the blood on the cushion. He said, There's a parasite waiting on every rung of the ladder, all the way up, all the way down. Speaking of which, I want to ask Ken the same question. Why are you here, fella? You're not a Hollywood guy. You're a real estate tycoon, correct? Or maybe that's not the full story. Caught in the spotlight, Ken's face rapidly drained of blood. He looked down and mumbled, I've known Carmine since college. I'm an investor at his production company, lending him money and hoping for a good return. That's the full extent of my involvement here. It's just business. That's a real swell thing to do, Ken. The gunman chirped in a bright, sarcastic tone. Helping your friends realize their dream is very noble. I used to have dreams, too. It was nice to have those dreams. It really was. And it would have been super helpful if I was paid for the use of those dreams. Oh, you betcha. But that's not how it played out, my man. So, now we're here. A light went on behind Ken's eyes. He said, I'll give you a million dollars if you let me walk out that door. Hell, I'll, I'll give you two million. Let me walk out of here and it's yours. The intruder looked darkly amused by the real estate mogul's offer. He cracked a grim smile and chuckled. What about these other people? That you're probably the wealthiest person here, living or dead. You're going to offer to pay them too? Ken stomped his feet on the floor and shouted, I don't care about these people. I hardly even know them, for Christ's sake. If, if they did something to you, go ahead. Deal with them. I, I don't give a shit. Just let me leave. A shadow passed behind the intruder's icy gaze. He studied Ken's battered, miserable face and said, Of course you don't care about them. They aren't fat stacks of money. They're other people. Here, come with me. The gunman grabbed Ken by the shirt and hauled him to his feet. He ushered him down the steps to the front door and said, Take a peek out this window. Tell me what you see. The intruder steered him in front of the door and pulled open the blinds. Ken gave him an uncertain look, and the intruder said, Go on. Take a look. Ken pressed his face against the glass and squinted into the night. A few seconds later, a sharpshooter put a round through his forehead. A spatter of red burst from the back of his skull as he fell in a shower of glass. He was dead before he hit the floor. The intruder quickly reached over and dropped the blinds again. A split second later, another shot blasted a hole through the slats and embedded itself in the staircase. He ejected the magazine from his own pistol as he hurried up the staircase, fishing another one from his pocket as he studied the dwindling ranks of his hostages. He vaguely motioned at the door with a bitter grin and announced, And now there's seven. Ron twisted in his seat, glared at the intruder, a look of disgust. He sputtered. You think that was funny? Huh? Is this funny to you? The intruder whispered, Nothing's funny. And he shot Ron twice in the chest. Carla screamed as the director tumbled onto the floor. The intruder grabbed him by the legs and dragged him into an open space in the living room. He bared his teeth in a furious smile and repeated, Nothing is funny, not even close. In fact, everything's fucking awful. He proceeded to punctuate his words with a series of kicks to the head and the body, 
ranting and raving his spittle went flying in all directions. He snarled, you fucked up, Ronnie. You fucked up. You all fucked up so bad. You destroyed me. You destroyed my marriage. You destroyed my life. You pissed down my neck and told me it was raining, didn't you? You fucking destroyed my life. The intruder stopped to catch his breath, panting and wheezing with a bitter grin still pasted on his face. At that moment, Carmine's business line began to ring again. The intruder jogged over to the office and answered it on the third ring. He gasped, Still me. I'm still alive. You made a mistake? Oh, hell yeah. You definitely made a mistake. You killed the real estate guy. Good job, dumbass. He paused, then quickly said, No, it's not. For Christ's sake, listen to me, man. It's not something you could ever give me. It's not yours to give. Look, I don't think we have anything to talk about. No more phone calls. Gunman hung up on the negotiator, then he shot the phone off the desk. It jumped into the air with a loud pop and a spray of plastic. He closed his eyes and took a deep breath, squeezing the pistol between his hands in a sweaty death grip as he filled his lungs to capacity. He let it out slowly, bit by bit. The trembling in his hands almost ceased. Not completely, but almost. He whispered, The fuck's going on? And a sudden curtain of tears blurred his vision. He wanted to fade away and disappear. That wasn't possible. He was doomed to finish what he started. There simply wasn't any other course of action left. The intruder wiped his eyes with his sleeve and hurried back to the conversation nook. He briskly announced, Looks like we're in the final act, everyone. No more foot dragging. The hostages looked around at each other with panicked eyes. Carla stammered, what, what does that mean? What are you saying? In response, he racked the slide and loaded around into the chamber. Carla let out a whimper and started to hyperventilate. Jeremy snorted, you understand how many lives you've completely shattered tonight? <laughs> Over what? Sixty grand, maybe? How, how long do you think that money would have lasted? The, the residuals aren't going to make you rich, believe me. It, it isn't good money. And a screenwriting credit that isn't the same kind of gold ticket to fame and fortune either. You, you threw your life away. Yet for, for what? Why? Do you really think you were robbed of your success? Because here's the harsh reality, okay? I can, I can almost guarantee you that it wouldn't have gone anywhere. One and done. Never to be repeated. How do you think you would have handled that, huh, tough guy? Would you, would you take your little gun and kill the entire industry? You're, you're a fucking idiot. The intruder gave him a bewildered look and then squawked. Oh, fuck you, jackass. You stole from me. You people made tens of millions of dollars from my fucking story. You didn't give me anything. Not one red cent. No recognition. Not even a pat on the back. How the hell are you going to make yourself look like the good guy right now? Jeremy scoffed. You think you're the only one who's been, ever been ripped off? This has happened to me, too, several times. And it sucked. Really bad each and every time. So I get it, man. I, I do. It fucking sucks. It makes you want to light the whole fucking world on fire, but it's just another harsh reality of this business. Yeah, okay. You're on a damn good story. So what? They're not going to invite you into a studio, give you a job. Are, are, are you kidding me? You're an outsider, get it? You're just another average Joe with a, a pinch of talent. You're not one of them. You never will be. You think they want someone like you hanging around the writer's room? You don't belong there. They, they probably wouldn't even let you sweep the parking lot. You just... You, you, you don't... The look on the gunman's face made Jeremy stop talking. He loomed over the screenwriter and repeated in a single strangled whisper. I'm an outsider. An interloper. An intruder, if you will. Okay. I won't argue that. You're right. I'm not one of you soulless shit heels. No. Fuck no. Before this happened, I was a decent person. I don't give a shit about money or recognition. Not anymore. I don't care about starting a career either. I don't even care about dying. Just between you and me, I'm pretty sure there's no heaven or hell. 
There's only hope on one side. Death on the other. The screenwriter opened his mouth to say something, and the intruder promptly popped him on the chin with the left hook. Jeremy's head snapped back, and he looked up at his tormentor with a dazed expression. Keep your mouth closed and listen, the intruder snapped. I'm talking here, not you. I'm talking about hope, fuckhead. Let me tell you about the nature of hope, okay? It's like a tiny little candle out there in the void. So small, you know, it's so small, and it, you know, so fucking fragile. And beyond the light of the flame, there's a darkness and sorrow and just, well, just nothing, nothing at all. Then you morally bankrupted bastards, you come along and you piss out the flame and you, you didn't have to do that, but you did. And now there's only the void. Jeremy mutely shook his head. His eyes were glimmering with tears. He whispered, I'm sorry, okay? It wasn't my fault. But I'm sorry. The intruder prodded him in the chest with a pistol. He leaned down and breathed. The light's gone. Now, it's time to go to sleep. Elizabeth twisted in her seat and screeched, Oh, get fucked! It's not our fault you just gave up and quit! It's not our fault you're a loser! Yeah, that's right, you're a loser! Do you want to hear another truth? You're a whiny little bitch! You don't have what it takes to make it in this business. You get eaten alive! You're right, the intruder agreed. I wasn't made to swim with the sharks. It's a dreamer with a silly little dream and you destroyed them. Elizabeth bellowed, Your dreams can get fucked too! and she spat in his face. The intruder wiped the frothy glob of spit off of his face with the sleeve of his hooded sweatshirt. And then he suddenly loomed over her, his hand drawn back to knock her senseless. She hissed, Don't you touch me, and lashed out with both feet, driving both of her heels into his shins. He let out a shrill cry and stumbled back. Elizabeth screeched in triumph and bicycle kicked her legs at him with desperate insanity. By sheer accident, one of her feet knocked the gun out of his hand. It spun away in the air and disappeared beneath the opposite couch. Elizabeth screamed, get him, and launched herself at the gunman like a battering ram. Her head slammed into his stomach and they both fell into the coffee table, smashing the glass on top of it into a thousand glittering shards. He threw her aside and tried to stand up, but he was booted back to the floor by Trent, who immediately lost his balance and tripped over the table. He rolled across the broken glass and flopped on top of the intruder, pinning him down with his body weight. Trent shouted, jump on him! Hold him down! Jeremy leaned forward in his seat and twisted his arms against the rigid grasp of the zip tie, fighting against it with all of his strength. There was a horrible flare of pain as his skin tore open beneath the plastic teeth. And then the zip tie snapped in half. He screamed, my hands are free! And he jumped on the intruder's back, pummeling him with his arms as they were completely numb from lack of circulation. Carla and Elizabeth were both dropping their weight across the intruder's frail legs. He roared in fury and squirmed like a snake beneath them. Elizabeth yelled, Jeremy, get the gun! The intruder managed to heave himself onto his side, and Trent squealed, He got me! He squirmed away from the brawl, with blood pouring from a deep cut across his abdomen. The intruder twisted around with a wiry strength and slashed Jeremy across the neck. The screenwriter clapped a hand across the wound and jumped to his feet. He was slashed across the leg as he tried to run for the front door and caused him to fall over the couch and execute a clumsy somersault in the process. His neck was spurting blood beneath his hands. Elizabeth and Carla rolled away from the deadly fury of his knife. They cowered against the couch and begged for mercy. The intruder gasped, You almost had me. He hauled himself to his feet. Elizabeth had given him a hairline fracture in his shin, but he could still hobble along faster than Jeremy, who was bleeding like a fountain as he drunkenly zigzagged his way to the door. The intruder caught up to him at the top of the stairs, and he shoved Jeremy headfirst down the staircase. His neck snapped like a pencil on impact. He watched his own blood flow across the marble tiles as his vision faded to black. The intruder came limping back with his mouth twisted into a horrible grin. He headed straight for Trent, who was writhing around on the floor with his guts bulging from his wound. The intruder leaned over him and grunted, End the scene. Time to shut her down. The younger man's cries for help turned to dreadful gagging sounds as the intruder pushed the knife into his neck. Trent stared up at him with unbelieving eyes. 
his blood gushing onto the carpet in the stream. Within a few seconds, his gaze turned murky and dull. And then he was staring at nothing at all. Outside the condo, the voice on the bullhorn was shouting for the intruder to reconnect the phone. It seemed strangely muted and distant, as if the world outside was no longer attached to the horrible events that were unfolding inside the condo. The intruder looked at Elizabeth and Carla and spat a wad of bloody mucus onto the floor. He wheezed. And then there were three. <laughs> Thank fuck it's almost over. Elizabeth closed her eyes tight and said, Don't give yourself up to the cops. Don't you dare. Just blow your brains out and remove yourself from the world, you piece of shit. The intruder softly answered, That's the plan. He hesitated, then turned to Carla and said, I guess this isn't worth much, but I don't think you deserve any of this. Sorry you were here. Yeah, what about me? Elizabeth demanded. I didn't know you existed until after the trailer was released. I thought what they did was really shitty. I wasn't the only one. His mouth twisted into a bitter little smirk. He said, Thoughts and prayers, huh? You're a famous celebrity, correct? You and the rest of them, you could have used your influence to pressure the studio into doing the right thing. What were they going to do, take the entire cast and crew to court? Doubt it. But you didn't stick up for me, did you? You thought to yourself, geez, that sucks. That's as far as it went. It's exactly the problem here, Liz. No one gives a shit about anyone else. Me, me, me. That's all it ever is these days. I turn on the TV, I listen to the radio, I go online, there it is. Me, me, me. That's all there is anymore. I don't want to live in a world like that. We're all looking out for number one. What's the point of civilization? Then what are you doing right now? Elizabeth demanded. You murdered all these people tonight because you didn't get what you wanted. How is that not selfish? The intruder muttered, When in Rome. And he winced as he crouched down to fish the pistol out from beneath the couch. As he dropped out of view, Elizabeth uttered an anguished scream and ran for the window. At the same time, something smashed through the window from outside and bounced off the floor. It was a flashbang grenade and it detonated directly in her screeching face. There was a tremendous boom and a brilliant flash of light. Elizabeth's brain was almost jellified by the concussive force of the blast, and her once beautiful features were scorched to the bone. She fell backwards and dropped like a brick to the floor. Carla found herself curled up on the floor with a dreadful buzz in her skull. She shouted for help, but she could barely hear her own voice. The intruder staggered into view and shouted something, but his words were lost beneath the ringing in her ears. Carla tried to get up. She was overwhelmed by a wave of nausea. Her head was aching like a rotten tooth, and her vision was scrambled from the glare of the flashbang. She squinted at the intruder's blurry form, and she saw the pistol in his hands. Carla struggled against the zip tie that bound her hands together, and she yelled, Don't do it! Just put it down and let them take you away! Both of the entrances were busted down at the same time. The SWAT team came pouring in from either side. The intruder turned to face them and raised his pistol. Carla watched as his body was riddled by a hail of bullets. When the shooting finally stopped, Carla stumbled across the gore-smeared carpet and fell to her knees beside him. The police were shouting orders at her, but she couldn't hear them. Her entire world had shrunken down to a narrow view of the intruder twitching like a fish out of water in a pool of his own blood. The intruder wasn't holding a pistol. He was still lost somewhere beneath the couch. He was holding the TV remote. He let it fall from his hand, and he mouthed a single word as the light faded from his eyes. Boom, he said. And then he was gone. Carla was abruptly dragged to her feet by a set of clutching, uncaring hands. She let out an anguished scream and fought against them, dragging her heels across the floor as they pulled her outside. She was the sole survivor. The last little scumbag. 
and she couldn't bear to leave the others behind. Carla was still screaming when they loaded her into the ambulance. She screamed until she was sedated, and then she silently screamed in her nightmares. And for the rest of her days beneath the sun, part of her would always be screaming. Because the void awaits us all. And when hope is extinguished, the shadows will consume you. It's cold in there, my friend. My friends. And it's dark. So very, very dark. For those of you guys that like getting cozy while listening to stories, I want to let you know about Etsy.com slash shop slash ivory monocle tea. That's my wife's tea shop. She sells hand blended teas. There's creepy pasta based teas if you want to get one that's a flavor that you like, or there's Mr. Kirby Pasta Tea, which happens to be a tea that I drink fairly often. Some other ones I really suggest, the Gashel Greens, which is also one that I drink, and the Hibiscus, which has helped me out a lot with my high blood pressure. Uh, if you guys also like the, if you want to see like the Hibiscus Tea, I think it's also called the Jeff the Killer Tea. So, goddamn, Jeff is constantly in my life and there's no escaping him. Once again, that's Etsy.com slash shop slash Ivory Monocle Tea. A big thank you to Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Jacob Fenske, Stephanie Butler, Jordan Humble, Chance Burnett, Dana Krause, Brimstone Pandemonium, Kyle Tuna, William Wellington, Emma, Brenna Crow, Lakeda Canizales, Smiley the Psychotic, Dante Kincaid, Simba's Bloody Mojo, Mephistopheles, Curse Pox Primark, Bastion Beefcake, M, Jesus Corneo, Yargul, Carnival, Amber Clark, Jake Kearns, Dakota Lane Whetstone, Himbo Jerry, Crusader Chocobo, Adam Arias, Estabine, Nick Cull, Our Minsect Time, Xylobones, Angelus, Seclude, Salty Surprise, Love it a Galvin, That Creepy Chick, Red Shadow Cat, Turtle Man, Carolinian, Mr. Marcus Blitz, Ica Limchok, Dirty Diver 030, Matt Bach, Voice of Sand, Ica Mount, Melted Lake, Tali Sue, William King, Dark Miver, Sashi Sasaku, Broken Up 509, Stricket, Freddy Kruger, Lisa Cottrell, Hades Nephew, Acid System, Mog, Kiri the Sloth, Bester's Lampshade, Nico Kyle, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Polson, and Corey Kenshin. To all of you guys, I cannot thank you enough. Thank you for being a huge support to me. Thank you to everybody who's in the description down below, and thank you to everyone who can even support $1 just on Patreon to help keep the content coming.